God by B.B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The English word God is derived from a root meaning to call and indicates simply the object of worship, one whom men call upon or invoke. The Greek word, which it translates in the pages of the New Testament, however, describes this object of worship as spirit, and the Old Testament Hebrew word, which this word in turn represents, conveys, as its primary meaning, the idea of power. On Christian lips, therefore, the word God designates fundamentally the Almighty Spirit who is worshipped and whose aid is invoked by men. This primary idea of God, in which is summed up what is known as theism, is the product of that general revelation which God makes of himself to all men on the plane of nature. The truths involved in it are continually reiterated, enriched, and deepened in the scriptures, but they are not so much revealed by them as presupposed at the foundation of the special revelation with which the scriptures busy themselves, the great revelation of the grace of God to sinners. On the plane of nature, men can learn only what God necessarily is and what, by virtue of his essential attributes, he must do. A special communication from him is requisite to assure us what, in his infinite love, he will do for the recovery of sinners from their guilt and misery to the bliss of communion with him. And for the full revelation of this, his grace in the redemption of sinners, there was requisite an even more profound unveiling of the mode of his existence, by which he has been ultimately disclosed as including in the unity of his being a distinction of persons, by virtue of which it is the same God, from whom, through whom, and by whom are all things, who is at once the Father who provides, the Son who accomplishes, and the Spirit who applies redemption. Only in the uncovering of this supernal mystery of the Trinity is the revelation of what God is completed. That there is no hint of the Trinity in the general revelation made on the plane of nature is due to the fact that nature has nothing to say of redemption, in the process of which alone are the depths of the divine nature made known. That it is explicitly revealed only in the New Testament is due to the fact that not until the New Testament stage of revelation was reached was the redemption, which was being prepared throughout the whole Old Testament economy, actually accomplished. That so ineffable a mystery was placed before the darkened mind of man at all is due to the necessities of the plan of redemption itself, which is rooted in the trinal distinction in the Godhead and can be apprehended only on the basis of the Trinity in unity. The nature of God has been made known to men, therefore, in three stages corresponding to the three planes of revelation, and we will naturally come to know him first as the infinite spirit or the God of nature, then as the Redeemer of sinners, or the God of grace, and lastly as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or the Triune God. 1. God the Infinite Spirit The conviction of the existence of God bears the marks of an intuitive truth insofar as it is the universal and unavoidable belief of men, and is given in the very same act with the idea of self, which is known at once as dependent and responsible, and thus implies one on whom it depends and to whom it is responsible. This immediate perception of God is confirmed, and the contents of the idea developed by a series of arguments known as the theistic proofs. These are derived from the necessity we are under of believing in the real existence of the infinitely perfect being, of a sufficient cause for the contingent universe, of an intelligent author of the order and of the manifold contrivances observable in nature, and of a lawgiver and judge for dependent moral beings endowed with the sense of duty and an ineradicable feeling of responsibility, conscious of the moral contradictions of the world, and craving a solution for them, and living under an intuitive perception of right, which they do not see realized. The cogency of these proofs is currently recognized in the scriptures, while they add to them the supernatural manifestations of God in a redemptive process, accompanied at every stage by miraculous attestation. From the theistic proofs, however, we learn not only that a God exists, 
but also necessarily on the principle of a sufficient cause very much of the nature of god which they prove to exist the idea is still further developed on the principle of interpreting by the highest category within our reach by our instinctive attribution to him in an eminent degree of all that is the source of dignity and excellence in ourselves thus we come to know god as a personal spirit infinite eternal and illimitable alike in his being and in the intelligence sensibility and will which belong to him as personal spirit the attributes which are thus ascribed to him including self-existence independence unity uniqueness unchangeableness omnipresence infinite knowledge and wisdom infinite freedom and power infinite truth righteousness holiness and goodness are not only recognized but richly illustrated in scripture which thus puts the seal of its special revelation upon all the details of the natural idea of god two god the redeemer of sinners while reiterating the teaching of nature as to the existence and character of the personal creator and lord of all the scriptures lay their stress upon the grace or the undeserved love of god as exhibited in his dealings with his sinful and wrath deserving creatures so little however is the consummate divine attribute of love advanced in the scriptural revelation at the expense of the other moral attributes of god that it is thrown into prominence only upon a background of the strongest assertion and fullest manifestation of its companion attributes especially of the divine righteousness and holiness and is exhibited as acting only along with and in entire harmony with them god is not represented in the scriptures as forgiving sin because he really cares very little about sin nor yet because he is so exclusively or predominatingly the god of love that all other attributes shrink into desuetude in the presence of his illimitable benevolence he is rather represented as moved to deliver sinful man from his guilt and pollution because he pities the creatures of his hand enmeshed in sin with an intensity which is born of the vehemence of his holy abhorrence of sin and his righteous determination to visit it with intolerable retribution and by a mode which brings as complete satisfaction to his infinite justice and holiness as to his unbounded love itself the biblical presentation of the god of grace includes thus the richest development of all his moral attributes and the god of the bible is consequently set forth in the completeness of that idea as above everything else the ethical god and that is as much as to say that there is ascribed to him a moral sense so sensitive and true that it estimates with unfailing accuracy the exact moral character of every person or deed presented for its contemplation and responds to it with the precisely appropriate degree of satisfaction or reprobation the infinitude of his love is exhibited to us precisely in that while we were yet sinners he loved us though with all the force of his infinite nature he reacted against our sin with illimitable abhorrence and indignation the mystery of grace resides just in the impulse of a sin-hating god to show mercy to such guilty wretches and the supreme revelation of god as the god of holy love is made in the disclosure of the mode of his procedure in redemption by which alone he might remain just while justifying the ungodly for in this procedure there was involved the mighty paradox of the infinitely just judge himself becoming the sinner's substitute before his own law and the infinitely blessed god receiving in his own person the penalty of sin three god the father son and holy ghost the elements of the plan of salvation are rooted in the mysterious nature of the godhead in which there coexists a trinal distinction of persons with absolute unity of essence and the revelation of the trinity was accordingly incidental to the execution of this plan of salvation in which the father sent the son to be the propitiation for sin and the son when he returned to the glory which he had with the father before the world was sent the spirit to apply his redemption to men the disclosure of this fundamental fact of the divine nature therefore lagged until the time had arrived for the actual working out of the long-promised redemption 
and it was accomplished first of all in fact rather than in word by the actual appearance of god the son on earth and the subsequent manifestations of the spirit who was sent forth to act as his representative in his absence at the very beginning of christ's ministry the three persons are dramatically exhibited to our sight in the act of his baptism and though there is no single passage in scripture in which all the details of this great mystery are gathered up and expounded they do not lack passages in which the three persons are brought together in a manner which exhibits at once their unity and distinctness the most prominent of these are perhaps the formula of baptism in the triune name put into the mouths of his followers by the resurrected lord matthew twenty eight nineteen and the apostolic benediction in which a divine blessing is invoked from each person in turn two corinthians thirteen fourteen the essential elements which enter into and together make up this great revelation of the triune god are however most commonly separately insisted upon the chief of these are the three constitutive facts one that there is but one god deuteronomy six four isaiah forty four six one corinthians eight four james two nineteen two that the father is god matthew eleven twenty five john six twenty seven eight forty one romans fifteen six one corinthians eight six galatians one one three and four ephesians four six six twenty three one thessalonians one one James one twenty seven three nine one Peter one two Jude one, the Son is God. John one one eighteen, twenty twenty eight, Acts twenty twenty eight, Romans nine five Hebrews one eight Colossians two nine Philippians two six two Peter one one, and the Spirit is God. Acts five three and four. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11, Ephesians 2, 22, and 3, that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are personally distinct from one another, distinguished by personal pronouns, able to send and be sent by one another, to love and honour each other, and the like. John fifteen twenty six sixteen fourteen seventeen one. The doctrine of the Trinity is but the synthesis of these facts, and, adding nothing to them, simply recognizes in the unity of the Godhead such a trinity of persons as is involved in the working out of the plan of redemption. In the prosecution of this work, there is implicated a certain relative subordination in the modes of operation of the several persons, by which it is the Father that sends the Son, and the Son who sends the Spirit, but the three persons are uniformly represented in Scripture as in their essential nature, each alike God over all, blessed forever. Romans 9.5 and we are, therefore, to conceive the subordination as rather economical, i.e. relative to the function of each in the work of redemption, than essential, i.e. involving a difference in nature. End of God by B.B. Warfield The Person of Christ, Part 1, by B.B. Warfield this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Method of the Article It is the purpose of this article to make as clear as possible the conception of the person of Christ in the technical sense of that term, which lies on, or if we prefer to say so, beneath the pages of the New Testament. Were it its purpose to trace out the process by which this great mystery has been revealed to men, a beginning would need to be taken from the intimations as to the nature of the person of the Messiah in Old Testament prophecy, and an attempt would require to be made to discriminate the exact contribution of each organ of revelation to our knowledge. And were there added to this a desire to ascertain the progress of the apprehension of this mystery by men, there would be demanded a further inquiry into the exact degree of understanding which was brought to the truth revealed at each stage of its revelation. The magnitudes with which such investigations deal, however, are very minute, and the profit to be derived from them is not, in a case like the present, very great. It is, of course, of importance to know how the person of the Messiah was represented in the predictions of the Old Testament, and it is a matter at least of interest to note, for example, the difficulty experienced by our Lord's immediate disciples in comprehending all that was involved in his manifestation. 
But, after all, the constitution of our Lord's person is a matter of revelation, not of human thought, and it is preeminently a revelation of the New Testament, not of the Old Testament. And the New Testament is all the product of a single movement at a single stage of its development and therefore presents in its fundamental teaching a common character. The whole of the New Testament was written within the limits of about half a century, or, if we accept the writings of John, within the narrow bounds of a couple of decades, and the entire body of writings which enter into it are so much of a piece that it may be plausibly represented that they all bear the stamp of a single mind. In its fundamental teaching, the New Testament lends itself, therefore, more readily to what is called dogmatic than to what is called genetic treatment, and we shall penetrate most surely into its essential meaning if we take our start from its clearest and fullest statements and permit their light to be thrown upon its more incidental allusions. This is peculiarly the case with such a matter as the person of Christ, which is dealt with chiefly incidentally as a thing already understood by all and needing only to be alluded to rather than formally expounded. That we may interpret these allusions aright, it is requisite that we should recover from the first the common conception which underlies them all. The Teaching of Paul 1. General Drift of Passage We begin then with the most didactic of the New Testament writers, the Apostle Paul, and with one of the passages in which he most fully intimates his conception of the person of his Lord, Philippians 2, 5-9. Even here, however, Paul is not formally expounding the doctrine of the person of Christ. He is only alluding to certain facts concerning his person and action, perfectly well known to his readers, in order that he may give point to an adduction of Christ's example. He is exhorting his readers to unselfishness, such unselfishness as esteems others better than ourselves, and looks not only on our own things, but also on those of others. Precisely this unselfishness, he declares, was exemplified by our Lord. He did not look upon his own things, but the things of others, that is to say, he did not stand upon his rights, but was willing to forego all that he might justly have claimed for himself for the good of others. For, says Paul, though, as we all know, in his intrinsic nature he was nothing other than God, yet he did not, as we all know right well, look greedily on his condition of equality with God, but made no account of himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, humbled himself, becoming obedient up to death itself, and that the death of the cross. The statement is thrown into historical form, it tells the story of Christ's life on earth, but it presents his life on earth as a life in all its elements alien to his intrinsic nature and assumed only in the performance of an unselfish purpose. On earth, he lived as a man and subjected himself to the common lot of men, but he was not by nature a man, nor was he in his own nature subject to the fortunes of human life. By nature he was God, and he would have naturally lived as became God on an equality with God. He became man by a voluntary act, taking no account of himself, and having become man, he voluntarily lived out his human life under the conditions which the fulfilment of his unselfish purpose imposed upon him. 2. Our Lord's Intrinsic Deity The terms in which these great affirmations are made deserve the most careful attention. The language in which our Lord's intrinsic deity is expressed, for example, is probably as strong as any that could be devised. Paul does not simply say he was God. He says he was in the form of God, employing a turn of speech which throws emphasis upon our Lord's possession of the specific quality of God. Form is a term which expresses the sum of those characterizing qualities which make a thing the precise thing that it is. Thus, the form of a sword, in this case mostly matters of external configuration, is all that makes a given piece of metal specifically a sword rather than, say, a spade. And the form of God is the sum of the characteristics which make the being we call God specifically God, rather than some other being, an angel, say, or a man. When our Lord is said to be in the form of God, therefore, he is declared in the most express manner possible to be all that God is, to possess the whole fullness of attributes which make God God. Paul chooses this manner of expressing himself here instinctively, because in adducing our Lord as our example of self-abnegation, his mind is naturally resting not on the bare fact that he is God, but on the richness and fullness of his being as God. He was all this, 
yet he did not look on his own things, but on those of others. It should be carefully observed also that, in making this great affirmation concerning our Lord, Paul does not throw it distinctively into the past, as if he were describing a mode of being formerly our Lord's, indeed, but no longer his, because of the action by which he became our example of unselfishness. Our Lord, he says, being, existing, subsisting in the form of God, as it is variously rendered, the rendering proposed by revised version, margin, being originally, while right in substance, is somewhat misleading. The verb employed means strictly to be beforehand, to be already so-and-so, and intimates the existing circumstances, disposition of mind, or, as here, mode of subsistence in which the action to be described takes place. It contains no intimation, however, of the cessation of these circumstances, or disposition, or mode of subsistence, and that the less in a case like the present, where it is cast in a tense, the imperfect, which in no way suggests that the mode of subsistence intimated came to an end in the action described by the succeeding verb. Compare the parallels, Luke 16, 14, 23, 23, 50, Acts 2.30, 3, 2, 2 Corinthians 8, 17, 12, 16, Galatians 1, 14. Paul is not telling us here, then, what our Lord was once, but rather what he already was, or better, what in his intrinsic nature he is. He is not describing a past mode of existence of our Lord, before the action he is adducing as an example took place, although the mode of existence he describes was our Lord's mode of existence before this action, so much as painting in the background, upon which the action adduced may be thrown up into prominence. He is telling us who and what he is who did these things for us, that we may appreciate how great the things he did for us are. 3. No exinination. And here it is important to observe that the whole of the action adduced is thrown up thus against this background, not only its negative description to the effect that our Lord, although all that God is, did not look greedily on his consequent being on an equality with God, but its positive description as well, introduced by the but, and that in both of its elements, not merely to that effect. Verse 7, that he took no account of himself, rendered not badly by the authorized version, he made himself of no reputation, but quite misleading by the revised version, he emptied himself, but equally that to the effect, verse 8, that he humbled himself. It is the whole of what our Lord is described as doing in verses 6 to 8, that he is described as doing despite his subsistence in the form of God. So far is Paul from intimating, therefore, that our Lord laid aside his deity in entering upon his life on earth, that he rather asserts that he retained his deity throughout his life on earth, and in the whole course of his humiliation, up to death itself, was consciously ever exercising self-abnegation, living a life which did not by nature belong to him, which stood in fact in direct contradiction to the life which was naturally his. It is this underlying implication which determines the whole choice of the language in which our Lord's earthly life is described. It is because it is kept in mind that he still was in the form of God, that is, that he still had in possession all that body of characterizing qualities by which God is made God, for example, that he is said to have been made not man, but in the likeness of man, to have been found not man, but in fashion as a man, and that the wonder of his servanthood and obedience, the mark of servanthood, is thought of as so great. Though he was truly man, he was much more than man, and Paul would not have his readers imagine that he had become merely man. In other words, Paul does not teach that our Lord was once God, but had become instead man. He teaches that though he was God, he had become also man. An impression that Paul means to imply that in entering upon his earthly life our Lord had laid aside his deity may be created by a very prevalent misinterpretation of the central clause of his statement, a misinterpretation unfortunately given currency by the rendering of the ERV, counted it not a prize to be on an equality with God, but emptied himself, varied without improvement in the ARV to 
counted not the being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. The former negative member of this clause means just, he did not look greedily upon his being on an equality with God, did not set supreme store by it. See Lightfoot on the clause. The latter positive member of it, however, cannot mean in an antithesis to this that he therefore emptied himself, divested himself of this, his being on an equality with God, much less that he emptied himself, divested himself of his deity, form of God itself, of which his being on an equality with God is the manifested consequence. The verb here rendered emptied is in constant use in a metaphorical sense, so only in the New Testament, Romans 4.14, 1 Corinthians 1.17, 9.15, 2 Corinthians 9, 3, and cannot here be taken literally. This is already apparent from the definition of the manner in which the emptying is said to have been accomplished, supplied by the modal clause, which is at once attached, by taking the form of a servant. You cannot empty by taking, adding. It is equally apparent, however, from the strength of the emphasis which by its position is thrown upon the himself, we may speak of our Lord as emptying himself of something else, but scarcely with this strength of emphasis of his emptying himself of something else. This emphatic himself interposed between the preceding clause and the verb rendered emptied builds a barrier over which we cannot climb backward in search of that of which our Lord emptied himself. The whole thought is necessarily contained in the two words emptied himself, in which the word emptied must therefore be taken in a sense analogous to that which it bears in the other passages in the New Testament where it occurs. Paul, in a word, says here nothing more than that our Lord, who did not look with greedy eyes upon his estate of equality with God, emptied himself, if the language may be pardoned, of himself, that is to say, in precise accordance with the exhortation for the enhancement of which his example is adduced, that he did not look on his own things." He made no account of himself, we may fairly paraphrase the clause, and thus all question of what he emptied himself of falls away. What our Lord actually did, according to Paul, is expressed in the following clauses. Those now before us express more the moral character of his act. He took the form of a servant, and so was made in the likeness of men. But his doing this showed that he did not set overweening store by his state of equality with God, and did not account himself the sufficient object of all the efforts. He was not self-regarding, he had regards for others. Thus he becomes our supreme example of self-abnegating conduct. See also Kenosis. 4. Our Lord's Humanity the language in which the act by which our Lord showed that he was self-abnegating is described, requires to be taken in its complete meaning. He took the form of a servant being made in the likeness of men, says Paul. The term form here, of course, bears the same full meaning as in the preceding instance of its occurrence in the phrase, the form of God. It imparts the specific quality, the whole body of characteristics by which a servant is made what we know as a servant. Our Lord assumed then, according to Paul, not the mere state or condition or outward appearance of a servant, but the reality. He became an actual servant in the world. The act by which he did this is described as a taking, or as it has become customary from this description of it to phrase it, as an assumption. What is meant is that our Lord took up into his personality a human nature, and therefore it is immediately explained that he took the form of a servant by being made in the likeness of men. That the Apostle does not say, shortly, that he assumed a human nature is due to the engagement of his mind with the contrast which he wishes to bring out forcibly for the enhancement of his appeal to our Lord's example, between what our Lord is by nature and what he was willing to become, not looking on his own things but also on the things of others. This contrast is no doubt embodied in the simple opposition of God and man. It is much more pungently expressed in the qualificative terms form of God and form of a servant. The Lord of the world became a servant in the world. 
He whose right it was to rule took obedience as his life characteristic. Naturally, therefore, Paul employs a word of quality rather than a word of mere nature, and then defines his meaning in this word of quality by a further ep exegetical clause. This further clause, being made in the likeness of men, does not throw doubt on the reality of the human nature that was assumed in contradiction to the emphasis on its reality in the phrase, the form of a servant. It, along with the succeeding clause, and being found in fashion as a man, owes its peculiar form, as has already been pointed out, to the vividness of the Apostle's consciousness that he is speaking of one who, though really man, possessing all that makes a man a man, is yet at the same time infinitely more than a man, no less than God himself in possession of all that makes God God. Christ Jesus is in his view, therefore, as in the view of his readers, for he is not instructing his readers here as to the nature of Christ's person, but reminding them of certain elements in it for the purposes of his exhortation, both God and man, God who has assumed man into personal union with himself, and has in this his assumed manhood lived out a human life on earth. The elements of Paul's conception of the person of Christ are brought before us in this suggestive passage with unwanted fullness, but they all receive endless illustration from his occasional allusions to them, one or another, throughout his epistles. The leading motive of this passage, for example, reappears quite perfectly in 2 Corinthians 8-9, where we are exhorted to imitate the graciousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who became, for our sakes, emphatic, poor, he who was, again, an imperfect participle and therefore without suggestion of the cessation of the condition described, rich, that we might by his very emphatic poverty be made rich. Here the change in our Lord's condition at a point of time perfectly understood between the writer and his readers is adverted to and assigned to its motive, but no further definition is given of the nature of either condition referred to. We are brought closer to the precise nature of the act by which the change was wrought by such a passage as Galatians 4.4. 4. We read that when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem them that were under the law. The whole transaction is referred to the Father in fulfillment of his eternal plan of redemption and is described specifically as an incarnation. The Son of God is born of a woman. He who is in his own nature the Son of God, abiding with God, is sent forth from God in such a manner as to be born a human being, subject to law. The primary implications are that this was not the beginning of his being, but that before this he was neither a man nor subject to law. But there is no suggestion that on becoming man and subject to law, he ceased to be the Son of God, or lost anything intimated by that high designation. The uniqueness of his relation to God as his Son is emphasized in a kindred passage, Romans 8.3, by the heightening of the designation to that of God's own Son, and his distinction from other men is intimated in the same passage by the declaration that God sent him, not in sinful flesh, but only in the likeness of sinful flesh. The reality of our Lord's flesh is not thrown into doubt by this turn of speech, but his freedom from the sin which is associated with flesh as it exists in lost humanity is asserted. Compare 2 Corinthians 5.21. Though true man, therefore, 1 Corinthians 15.21, Romans 5.21, Acts 17.31, he is not without differences from other men, and these differences do not concern merely the condition as sinful in which men presently find themselves, but also their very origin. They are from below, he is from above. The first man is from the earth, earthly. The second man is from heaven, 1 Corinthians 15.47. This is his peculiarity. He was born of a woman like other men, yet he descended from heaven, compare Ephesians 4.9, John 3.13. It was not meant, of course, that already in heaven he was a man. What is meant is that even though man, he derives his origin in an exceptional sense from heaven. Paul describes what he was in heaven, but not alone in heaven, that is to say, before he was sent into the likeness of sinful flesh, though not alone before this, in the great terms of God's Son, God's own Son, the form of God, or yet again, in words whose import cannot be mistaken, God over all, Romans 9.5. In the last cited passage, together with its parallel earlier in the same epistle, Romans 1.3, the two sides or elements of our Lord's person are brought into collocation after a fashion that can leave no doubt of Paul's conception of his twofold nature. 
In the earlier of these passages, he tells us that Jesus Christ was born indeed of the seed of David according to the flesh, that is, so far as the human side of his being is concerned, but was powerfully marked out as the Son of God according to the spirit of holiness, that is, with respect to his higher nature, by the resurrection of the dead, which in a true sense began in his own rising from the dead. In the later of them, he tells us that Christ sprang indeed, as concerns the flesh, that is, on the human side of his being, from Israel, but that, despite this earthly origin of his human nature, he yet is and abides, present participle, nothing less than the supreme God, God over all, emphatic, blessed forever. Thus Paul teaches us that, by his coming forth from God to be born of woman, our Lord, assuming a human nature to himself, has, while remaining the supreme God, become also true and perfect man. Accordingly, in a context in which the resources of language are strained to the utmost to make the exaltation of our Lord's being clear, in which he is described as the image of the invisible God, whose being antedates all that is created, in whom, through whom, and to whom all things have been created, and in whom they all subsist, we are told not only that, naturally, in him all the fullness dwells, Colossians 1.19, but with complete explication that all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily, Colossians 2.9, that is to say, the very deity of God, that which makes God God, in all its completeness has its permanent home in our Lord, and that in a bodily fashion, that is, it is in him clothed with a body. He who looks upon Jesus Christ sees, no doubt, a body and a man, but as he sees the man clothed with the body, so he sees God himself, in all the fullness of his deity clothed with the humanity. Jesus Christ is therefore God manifested in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16, and his appearance on earth is an epiphany, 2 Timothy 1.10, which is the technical term for manifestations on earth of a god. Though truly man, he is nevertheless also our great god, Titus 2.13. Teaching of the Epistle to the Hebrews The conception of the person of Christ, which underlies and finds expression in the Epistle to the Hebrews, is indistinguishable from that which governs all the allusions to our Lord in the Epistles of Paul. To the author of this epistle, our Lord is above all else the Son of God in the most eminent sense of that word, and it is the divine dignity and majesty belonging to him from his very nature which forms the fundamental feature of the image of Christ which stands before his mind. And yet it is this author who, perhaps above all others of the New Testament writers, emphasizes the truth of the humanity of Christ and dwells with most particularity upon the elements of his human nature and experience. 1. Background of Express Deity The great Christological passage which fills chapter 2 of the Epistle to the Hebrews rivals in its richness and fullness of detail and its breadth of implication that of Philippians 2. It is thrown up against the background of the remarkable exposition of the divine dignity of the Son which occupies chapter 1. Notice the therefore of 2.1. There the Son had been declared to be the effulgence of His, God's, glory, and the very image of his substance, through whom the universe has been created, and by the word of whose power all things are held in being, and his exaltation above the angels, by means of whom the old covenant had been inaugurated, is measured by the difference between the designations ministering spirits, proper to the one, and the Son of God, nay God himself, one, eight, and nine, proper to the other. The purpose of the succeeding statement is to enhance in the thought of the Jewish readers of the epistle the value of the salvation wrought by this divine Saviour by removing from their minds the offence they were in danger of taking at his lowly life and shameful death on earth. This earthly humiliation finds its abundant justification, we are told, in the greatness of the end which it sought and attained. By it our Lord has, with his strong feet, broken out a pathway along which, in him, sinful man may at length climb up to the high destiny which was promised him when he was declared he should have dominion over all creation. Jesus Christ stooped only to conquer, and he stooped to conquer not for himself, for he was in his own person no less than God, but for us. 2. Completeness of Humanity the language in which the humiliation of the Son of God is, in the first instance, described is derived from the context. The establishment of his divine majesty in chapter 1 had taken the form of an exposition of his infinite exaltation above the angels, the highest of all creatures. His humiliation is described here, therefore, as being made a little lower than the angels, 2.9. What is meant is simply that he became man. The phraseology is derived from Psalm 8, authorized version, 
from which had just been cited the declaration that God had made man, despite his insignificance, but a little lower than the angels, thus crowning him with glory and honour. The adoption of the language of the psalm to describe our Lord's humiliation has the secondary effect, accordingly, of greatly enlarging the reader's sense of the immensity of the humiliation of the Son of God in becoming man. He descended an infinite distance to reach man's highest conceivable exaltation. As, however, the primary purpose of the adoption of the language is merely to declare that the Son of God became man, so it is shortly afterwards explained, 2.14, as an entering into participation in the blood and flesh which are common to men. Since then, the children are sharers in flesh and blood, he also himself in like manner partook of the same. The voluntariness, the reality, the completeness of the assumption of humanity by the Son of God are all here emphasized. The proximate end of our Lord's assumption of humanity is declared to be that he might die. He was made a little lower than the angels because of the suffering of death, 2.9. He took part in flesh and blood in order that through death, 2.14. The Son of God as such could not die. To him belongs by nature an indissoluble life, 7.16, margin. If he was to die, therefore, he must take to himself another nature to which the experience of death were not impossible, 2.17. Of course, it is not meant that death was desired by him for its own sake. The purpose of our passage is to save its Jewish readers from the offence of the death of Christ. What they are bidden to observe is, therefore, Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that by the grace of God the bitterness of death, which he tasted, might redound to the benefit of every man, 2.9. And the argument is immediately pressed home that it was eminently suitable for God Almighty, in bringing many sons into glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect as a saviour by means of suffering. The meaning is that it was only through suffering that these men, being sinners, could be brought into glory. And therefore, in the plainer statement of verse 14, we read that our Lord took part in flesh and blood in order that through death, he might bring to naught him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might deliver all them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, and in the still plainer statement of verse 17, that the ultimate object of his assimilation to men was that he might make propitiation for the sins of the people. It is for the salvation of sinners that our Lord has come into the world, but as that salvation can be wrought only by suffering and death, the proximate end of his assumption of humanity remains that he might die, Whatever is more than this gathers around this. The completeness of our Lord's assumption of humanity and of his identification of himself with it receives strong emphasis in this passage. He took part in the flesh and blood, which is the common heritage of men, after the same fashion that other men participate in it, 2.14, and having thus become a man among men, he shared with other men the ordinary circumstances and fortunes of life in all things, 2.17. The stress is laid on trials, sufferings, death, but this is due to the actual course in which his life ran, and that it might run in which he became man, and is not exclusively of other human experiences. What is intended is that he became truly a man, and lived a truly human life, subject to all the experiences natural to a man in the particular circumstances in which he lived. 3. Continued Possession of Deity it is not implied, however, that during this human life, the days of his flesh, 5.7, he had ceased to be God, or to have at his disposal the attributes which belonged to him as God. That is already excluded by the representations of chapter 1. The glory of this dispensation consists precisely in the bringing of its revelations directly by the divine Son, rather than by mere prophets, 1.1. 1, 1. And it was as the effulgence of God's glory and the express image of his substance, upholding the universe by the word of his power, that the Son made purification for sins, 1.3. Indeed, we are expressly told that even in the days of the flesh he continued still a son, 5.8, and that it was precisely in this that the wonder lay, that though he was and remained, imperfect participle, a son, he yet learned the obedience he had set himself to, compare Philippians 2.8, by the things which he suffered. Similarly, we are told not only that, though an Israelite of the tribe of Judah, he possessed the power of an indissoluble life, 716 margin, but describing that higher nature which gave him this power as an eternal spirit, compare spirit of holiness, Romans 1.4, 1 
that it was through this eternal spirit that he could offer himself without blemish to God, a real and sufficing sacrifice in contrast with the shadows of the old covenant, 9.14. Though a man, therefore, and truly man, sprung out of Judah, 7.14, touched with the feeling of human infirmities, 4.15, and tempted like as we are, he was not altogether like other men. For one thing, he was without sin, 4.15, 7.26, and in this characteristic, he was, in every sense of the words, separated from sinners. Despite the completeness of his identification with men, he remained, therefore, even in the days of his flesh, different from them and above them. Teaching of Other Epistles It is only as we carry this conception of the person of our Lord with us, the conception of him as at once our supreme Lord, to whom our adoration is due, and our fellow in the experiences of a human life, that unity is induced in the multiform allusions to him throughout, whether the epistles of Paul, or the epistle to the Hebrews, or indeed the other epistolary literature of the New Testament. For in this matter there is no difference between those and these. There are no doubt a few passages of these other letters, in which a plurality of the elements of the person of Christ are brought together and given detailed mention. In 1 Peter 3.18, for instance, the two constitutive elements of his person are spoken of in the contrast, familiar from Paul, of the flesh and the spirit. But ordinarily, we meet only with references to this or that element separately. Elsewhere, our Lord is spoken of as having lived out his life as a man, but everywhere also he is spoken of with the supreme reverence which is due to God alone, and the very name of God is not withheld from him. In 1 Peter 1.11, his pre-existence is taken for granted. In James 2.1, he is identified with the Shekinah, the manifested Jehovah, our Lord Jesus Christ, the glory. In Jude verse 4, he is our only master, despot, and lord. Over and over again, he is the divine Lord who is Jehovah. For example, 1 Peter 2, 3.13, 2 Peter 3, 2.18. In 2 Peter 1, 1, he is roundly called our God and Saviour. There is nowhere formal inculcation of the entire doctrine of the person of Christ, but everywhere its elements, now one and now another, are presupposed as the common property of writer and readers. It is only in the epistles of John that this easy and unstudied presupposition of them gives way to pointed insistence upon them. The Teaching of John In the circumstances in which he wrote, John found it necessary to insist upon the elements of the person of our Lord, his true deity, his true humanity, and the unity of his person, in a manner which is more didactic in form than anything we find in the other writings of the New Testament. The great depository of his teaching on the subject is, of course, the prologue to his gospel. But it is not merely in this prologue, nor in the gospel, to which it forms a fitting introduction, that these didactic statements are found. The full emphasis of John's witness to the twofold nature of the Lord is brought out, indeed, only by combining what he says in the gospel and in the epistles. In the gospel, remarks Westcott, on John 20.31, the evangelist shows step by step that the historical Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, opposed to mere flesh. In the epistle, he affirms that the Christ, the Son of God, was true man, opposed to mere spirit, 1 John 4, 2. What John is concerned to show throughout is that it was the true God, 1 John 5, 20, who was made flesh, John 1, 14, and that this only God, John 1, 18, revised version margin, God only begotten, has truly come in flesh, 1 John 4, 2. In all the universe, there is no other being of whom it can be said that he is God come in flesh, compare 2 John verse 7, he that cometh in the flesh, whose characteristic this is. And of all the marvels which have ever occurred in the marvellous history of the universe, this is the greatest, that what was from the beginning, 1 John 2, 13 and 14, has been heard and gazed upon, seen and handled by men, 1 John 1, 1. From the point of view from which we now approach it, the prologue to the Gospel of John may be said to fall into three parts. In the first of these, the nature of the being who became incarnate in the person we know as Jesus Christ is described. In the second, the general nature of the act we call the incarnation, and in the third, the nature of the incarnated person. See Johannine Theology 3, John Gospel of 4, 1, 3, 2. 1. The being who was incarnated. John here calls the person who became incarnate by a name peculiar to himself in the New Testament, the Logos or Word. According to the predicates which he here applies to him, he can mean by the Word nothing else but God himself, considered in his creative, operative, self-revealing and communicating character, the sum total of what is divine. C. F. Schmidt. 
In three crisp sentences, he declares at the outset his eternal subsistence, his eternal intercommunion with God, his eternal identity with God. In the beginning, the Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, at the point of time when things first began to be, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, the Word already was. He antedates the beginning of all things. And he not merely antedates them, but it is immediately added that he is himself the creator of all that is. All things were made by him, and apart from him was not made one thing that hath been made. One three. Thus he is taken out of the category of creatures altogether. Accordingly, what is said of him is not that he was the first of existences to come into being, that in the beginning he already had come into being, but that in the beginning, when things began to come into being, he already was. It is express eternity of being that is asserted. The imperfect tense of the original suggests in this relation, as far as human language can do so, the notion of absolute supratemporal existence, Westcott. This, his eternal subsistence, was not, however, in isolation. And the word was with God. The language is pregnant. It is not merely coexistence with God that is asserted, as of two beings standing side by side, united in a local relation, or even in a common conception. What is suggested is an active relation of intercourse. The distinct personality of the word is therefore not obscurely intimated. From all eternity the word has been with God as a fellow. He who in the very beginning already was, was also in communion with God. Though he was thus in some sense a second along with God, he was nevertheless not a separate being from God. And the word was, still the eternal was, God. In some sense distinguishable from God, he was in an equally true sense identical with God. There is but one eternal God, this eternal God the Word is, in whatever sense we may distinguish him from the God whom he is with. He is yet not another than this God, but himself is this God. The predicate God occupies the position of emphasis in this great declaration, and is so placed in the sentence as to be thrown up in sharp contrast with the phrase with God, as if to prevent inadequate inferences as to the nature of the Word being drawn even momentarily from that phrase. John would have us realize that what the word was in eternity was not merely God's co-eternal fellow, but the eternal God's self. 2. The Incarnation Now John tells us that it was this word, eternal in his subsistence, God's eternal fellow, the eternal God's self, that, as come in the flesh, was Jesus Christ. 1 John 4, 2 And the word became flesh. John 1, 14, he says, the terms he employs here are not terms of substance, but of personality. The meaning is not that the substance of God was transmuted into that substance which we call flesh. The word is a personal name of the eternal God. Flesh is an appropriate designation of humanity in its entirety, with the implications of dependence and weakness. The meaning then is simply that he who had just been described as the eternal God became, by a voluntary act in time, a man. The exact nature of the act by which he became man lies outside the statement. It was matter of common knowledge between the writer and the reader. The language employed intimates merely that it was a definite act and that it involved a change in the life history of the eternal God. He had designated the word. The whole emphasis falls on the nature of this change in his life history. He became flesh. That is to say, he entered upon a mode of existence in which the experiences that belong to human beings would also be his. The dependence, the weakness, which constitutes the very idea of flesh, in contrast with God, would now enter into his personal experience. It is precisely because there are the connotations of the term flesh that John chooses that term here, instead of the more simply denotative term man. What he means is merely that the eternal God became man, but he elects to say this in the language which throws best up to view what it is to become man. The contrast between the word as the eternal God and the human nature which he assumed as flesh is the hinge of the statement. Had the evangelist said, as he does in 1 John 4, 2, that the word came in flesh, it would have been the continuity through the change which would have been most emphasized. When he says rather that the word became flesh, while the continuity of the personal subject is, of course, intimated, it is the reality and the completeness of the humanity assumed which is made most prominent. 3. The Incarnated Person That in becoming flesh the Word did not cease to be what he was before entering upon this new sphere of experiences, the evangelist does not leave, however, to mere suggestion. 
The glory of the word was so far from quenched in his view by his becoming flesh that he gives us at once to understand that it was rather as trailing clouds of glory that he came. And the word became flesh, he says, and immediately adds, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. One fourteen. The language is coloured by reminiscences from the tabernacle, in which the glory of God, the Shekinah, dwelt. The flesh of our Lord became, on its assumption by the word, the temple of God on earth, compare John 2.19, and the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. John tells us expressly that this glory was visible, that it was precisely what was appropriate to the Son of God as such. And we beheld his glory, he says, not divined it or inferred it, but perceived it. It was open to sight, and the actual object of observation. Jesus Christ was obviously more than man. He was obviously God. His actually observed glory, John tells us further, was a glory as of the only begotten from the Father. It was unique. Nothing like it was ever seen in another. And its uniqueness consisted precisely in its consonance with what the unique Son of God, sent forth from the Father, would naturally have. Men recognized and could not but recognize in Jesus Christ the unique Son of God. When this unique Son of God is further described as full of grace and truth, the elements of his manifested glory are not to be supposed to be exhausted by this description, compared to 11. Certain items of it only are singled out for particular mention. The visible glory of the incarnated Word was such a glory as the unique Son of God, sent forth from the Father, who was full of grace and truth, would naturally manifest. That nothing should be lacking to the declaration of the continuity of all that belongs to the word as such into this new sphere of existence and its full manifestation through the veil of his flesh, John adds at the close of his exposition the remarkable sentence, As for God, no one has even yet seen him. God only begotten, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. 118 margin. It is the incarnate word which is here called only begotten God. The absence of the article with this designation is doubtless due to its parallelism with the word God, which stands at the head of the corresponding clause. The effect of its absence is to throw up into emphasis the quality rather than the mere individuality of the person so designated. The adjective only begotten conveys the idea not of derivation and subordination, but of uniqueness and consubstantiality. Jesus is all that God is, and he alone is this. Of this only begotten God, it is now declared that he is, not was. The state is not one which has been left behind at the incarnation, but one which continues uninterrupted and unmodified, into, not merely in, the bosom of the Father. That is to say, he continues in the most intimate and complete communion with the Father. Though now incarnate, he is still with God, in the full sense of the external relation intimated in one one. This being true, he has much more than seen God, and is fully able to interpret God to men. Though no one has ever yet seen God, yet he who has seen Jesus Christ, God only begotten, has seen the Father. Compare 14, 9, 12, 45. In this remarkable sentence there is asserted in the most direct manner the full deity of the incarnate word, and the continuity of his life as such, in his incarnate life. Thus he is fitted to be the absolute revelation of God to man. End of the Person of Christ, Part 1, by B.B. B. Warfield The Person of Christ, Part 2, by B.B. B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This condensed statement of the whole doctrine of the Incarnation is only the prologue to a historical treatise. The historical treatise, which it introduces, naturally is written from the point of view of its prologue. Its object is to present Jesus Christ in his historical manifestation as obviously the Son of God in flesh. These are written, the Gospel testifies, that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. 2031 that Jesus, who came as a man, 130, was thoroughly known in his human origin, 727, confessed himself man, 840, and died as a man dies, 195, was nevertheless not only the Messiah, the sent of God, the fulfiller of all the divine promises of redemption, but also the very Son of God, that God only begotten, who, abiding in the bosom of the Father, is his sole adequate interpreter. 
From the beginning of the gospel onward, this purpose is pursued. Jesus is pictured as ever, while truly man, yet manifesting himself as equally true God, until the veil which covered the eyes of his followers was wholly lifted, and he is greeted as both Lord and God. 2028. But though it is the prime purpose of this gospel to exhibit the divinity of the man Jesus, no obscuration of his manhood is involved. It is the deity of the man Jesus which is insisted on, but the true manhood of Jesus is as prominent in the representation as in any other portion of the New Testament. Nor is any effacement of the humiliation of his earthly life involved, for the Son of Man to come from heaven was a descent, 3.13, and the mission which he came to fulfil was a mission of contest and conflict, of suffering and death. He brought his glory with him, 114, but the glory that was his on earth, 1722, was not all the glory which he had had with the Father before the world was, and to which, after his work was done, he should return, 175. Here, too, the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. In any event, John has no difficulty in presenting the life of our Lord on earth as the life of God in flesh, and in insisting at once on the glory that belongs to him as God, and on the humiliation which is brought to him by the flesh. It is distinctly a duplex life which he ascribes to Christ, and he attributes to him without embarrassment all the powers and modes of activity appropriate on the one hand to deity, and on the other to sinless, John 8.46, compare 14.30, 1 John 3.5, human nature. In a true sense, his portrait of our Lord is a dramatization of the God-man which he presents to our contemplation in his prologue. Teaching of the Synoptic Gospels The same may be said of the other Gospels. They are all dramatizations of the God-man set forth in thetical exposition in the prologue to John's Gospel. The Gospel of Luke, written by a known companion of Paul, gives us in a living narrative the same Jesus who is presupposed in all Paul's allusions to him. That of Mark, who was also a companion of Paul, as also of Peter, is, as truly as the Gospel of John itself, a presentation of facts in the life of Jesus with a view to making it plain that this was the life of no mere man, human as it was, but of the Son of God himself. Matthew's Gospel differs from its fellows mainly in the greater richness of Jesus' own testimony to his deity which it records. What is characteristic of all three is the inextricable interlacing in their narratives of the human and divine traits which alike marked the life they are depicting. It is possible, by neglecting one series of their representations and attending only to the other, to sift out from them at will the portrait of either a purely divine or a purely human Jesus. It is impossible to derive from them the portrait of any other than a divine human Jesus if we surrender ourselves to their guidance and take off of their pages the portrait they have endeavoured to draw. As in their narratives they cursorily suggest now the fullness of his deity and now the completeness of his humanity and everywhere the unity of his person, they present as real and as forcible a testimony to the constitution of our Lord's person as uniting in one personal life a true divine and a truly human nature, as if they announce this fact in analytical statement. Only on the assumption of this conception of our Lord's person as underlying and determining their presentation can unity be given to their representations. While, on this supposition, all their representations fall into their places as elements in one consistent whole. Within the limits of their common presupposition, each gospel has no doubt its own peculiarities in the distribution of its emphasis. Mark lays particular stress on the divine power of the man Jesus as evidence of his supernatural being, and on the irresistible impression of a veritable Son of God, a divine being walking the earth as a man which he made upon all with whom he came into contact. Luke places his gospel by the side of the epistle to the Hebrews in the prominence it gives, to the human development of the divine being whose life on earth it is depicting, and to the range of temptation to which he was subjected. Matthew's Gospel is notable chiefly for the heights of the divine self-consciousness which it uncovers in its report of the words of him whom it represents as nevertheless the son of David, the son of Abraham, heights of divine self-consciousness which fall in nothing short of those attained in the great utterances preserved for us by John. 
but amid whatever variety there may exist in the aspects on which each lays his particular emphasis, it is the same Jesus Christ which all three bring before us, a Jesus Christ who is at once God and man and one individual person. If that be not recognized, the whole narrative of the synoptic gospels is thrown into confusion. Their portrait of Christ becomes an insoluble puzzle, and the mass of details which they present of his life experiences is transmuted into a mere set of crass contradictions. See also Gospels, the Synoptic. Teaching of Jesus The Gospel narratives not only present us, however, with dramatizations of the God-man according to their author's conception of his composite person, they preserve for us also a considerable body of the utterances of Jesus himself, and this enables us to observe the conception of his person which underlay and found expression in our Lord's own teaching. The discourses of our Lord, which have been selected for record by John, have been chosen, among other reasons, expressly for the reason that they bear witness to his essential deity. They are, accordingly, peculiarly rich in material for forming a judgment of our Lord's conception of his higher nature. This conception, it is needless to say, is precisely that which John, taught by it, has announced in the prologue to his gospel, and has illustrated by his gospel itself, compacted as it is of these discourses. It will not be necessary to present the evidence for this in its fullness. It will be enough to point to a few characteristic passages in which our Lord's conception of his higher nature finds especially clear expression. 1. His Higher Nature that he was of higher than earthly origin and nature, he repeatedly asserts. Ye are from beneath, he says to the Jews, 8.23, I am from above, ye are of this world, I am not of this world, compare 17.16. Therefore he taught that he, the Son of Man, had descended out of heaven, 3.13, where was his true abode. This carried with it, of course, an assertion of pre-existence, and this pre-existence is explicitly affirmed. What then, he asks, if ye should behold the Son of Man ascending where he was before? 662. It is not merely pre-existence, however, but eternal pre-existence, which he claims for himself. And now, Father, he prays, 17.5, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Compare verse 24. And again, as the most impressive language possible, he declares, 858 authorized version, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am, where he claims for himself the timeless present of eternity as his mode of existence. In the former of these two last cited passages, the character of his pre-existent life is intimated. In it he shared the Father's glory from all eternity, before the world was. He stood by the Father's side as a companion in his glory, he came forth when he descended to earth, therefore not from heaven only, but from the very side of God. 8.42, 17.8 Even this, however, does not express the whole truth. He came forth not only from the Father's side, when he had shared in the Father's glory, he came forth out of the Father's very being. I came out from the Father, and am come into the world. 16.28, compare 8.42 the connection described is inherent and essential, and not that of presence or external fellowship. Westcott. This prepares us for the great assertion, I and the Father are one, 1030, from which it is a mere corollary that, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. 14.9, compare 8.19, 12.45. 2. His Humiliation. In all these declarations, the subject of the affirmation is the actual person speaking. It is of himself, who stood before men and spoke to them, that our Lord makes these immense assertions. Accordingly, when he majestically declares, I and the Father are, plurality of persons, one, neuter singular, and accordingly singleness of being, the Jews naturally understood him to be making himself, the person then speaking to them, God, 1033, compare 518, 197. The continued sameness of the person who has been from all eternity down to this hour, one with God, is therefore fully safeguarded. His earthly life is, however, distinctly represented as a humiliation. Though even on earth he is one with the Father, yet he descended to earth. He had come out from the Father, 
and out of god a glory had been left behind which was yet to be returned to and his sojourn on earth was therefore to that extent an obscuration of his proper glory there was a sense then in which because he had descended he was no longer equal with the father it was in order to justify an assertion of equality with the father in power ten twenty five to twenty nine that he was led to declare i and my father are one ten thirty but he can also declare the father is greater than i fourteen twenty eight obviously this means that there was a sense in which he had ceased to be equal with the father because of the humiliation of his present condition and in so far as this humiliation involved entrance into a status lower than that which belonged to him by nature precisely in what this humiliation consisted can be gathered only from the general implication of many statements in it he was a man a man who hath told you the truth which i have learnt from god eight forty where the contrast with god throws the assertion of humanity into emphasis compare ten thirty three the truth of his human nature is however everywhere assumed and endlessly illustrated rather than explicitly asserted he possessed a human soul twelve twenty seven and bodily parts flesh and blood six fifty three and following hands and side twenty twenty seven and was subject alike to physical affections weariness for six and thirst nineteen twenty eight suffering and death and to all the common human emotions not merely the love of compassion thirteen thirty four fourteen twenty one fifteen eight to thirteen but the love of simple affection which we pour out on friends eleven eleven compare fifteen fourteen and fifteen indignation eleven thirty three and thirty eight and joy fifteen eleven seventeen thirteen he felt the perturbation produced by strong excitement eleven thirty three twelve twenty seven thirteen twenty one the sympathy with suffering which shows itself in tears eleven thirty five the thankfulness which fills the grateful heart six eleven twenty three eleven forty one sixteen twenty seven only one human characteristic was alien to him he was without sin the prince of the world he declared hath nothing in me fourteen thirty compare eight forty six clearly our lord as reported by john knew himself to be true god and true man in one indivisible person the common subject of the qualities which belong to each one his deity a mark thirteen thirty two the same is true of his self-consciousness as revealed in his sayings recorded by the synoptists perhaps no more striking illustration of this could be adduced than the remarkable declaration recorded in mark thirteen thirty two compare matthew twenty four thirty six but of that day or that hour knoweth no one not even the angels in heaven nor yet the son but the father here jesus places himself in an ascending scale of being above the angels in heaven that is to say the highest of all creatures significantly marked here as supramundane accordingly he presents himself elsewhere as the lord of the angels whose behests they obey the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that cause stumbling and them that do iniquity matthew thirteen forty one and he shall send forth his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other matthew twenty four thirty one compare thirteen forty nine twenty five thirty one mark eight thirty eight thus the angels of god luke twelve eight and nine fifteen ten christ designates as his angels the kingdom of god matthew twelve twenty eight nineteen twenty four twenty one thirty one to forty three mark and luke often as his kingdom the elect of god mark thirteen twenty luke eighteen seven compare romans eight thirty three colossians three twelve titus one one as his elect he is obviously speaking in mark thirteen twenty two out of a divine self-consciousness only a divine being can be exalted above angels be vice he therefore designates himself by his divine name the son that is to say the unique son of god nine seven one eleven to claim to be whom would for a man be blasphemy mark fourteen sixty one and sixty four but though he designates himself by his divine name he is not speaking of what he once was but of what at the moment of speaking he is the action of the verb is present knoweth he is claiming in other words the supreme designation of the son with all that is involved in it for his present self as he moved among men he is not merely was the son 
Nevertheless, what he affirms of himself cannot be affirmed of himself distinctly as the Son. For what he affirms of himself is ignorance. Not even the Son knows it. And ignorance does not belong to the divine nature which the term the Son connotes. An extreme appearance of contradiction accordingly arises from the use of this terminology, just as it arises when Paul says that the Jews crucified the Lord of glory, 1 Corinthians 2.8, or exhorts the Ephesian elders to feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood, Acts 20.28 margin, or John Keeble praises our Lord for the blood of souls by thee redeemed. It was not the Lord of glory as such who was nailed to the tree, nor have either God or souls blood to shed. We know how this apparently contradictory mode of speech has arisen in Keeble's case. He is speaking of men who are composite beings, consisting of souls and bodies, and these men come to be designated from one element of their composite personalities, though what is affirmed by them belongs rather to the other. We may speak, therefore, of the blood of souls, meaning that these souls, while not having blood as such, yet designate persons who have bodies and therefore blood. We know equally how to account for Paul's apparent contradictions. We know that he conceived of our Lord as a composite being, uniting in himself a divine and a human nature. In Paul's view, therefore, though God as such has no blood, yet Jesus Christ, who is God, has blood because he is also man. He can justly speak, therefore, when speaking of Jesus Christ, of his blood as the blood of God. When precisely the same phenomenon meets us in our Lord's speech of himself, we must presume that it is the outgrowth of precisely the same state of things. When he speaks of the Son, who is God, as ignorant, we must understand that he is designating himself as the Son because of his higher nature, and yet has in mind the ignorance of his lower nature. What he means is that the person properly designated the Son is ignorant, that is to say, with respect to the human nature, which is as intimate an element of his personality as is his deity. When our Lord says then that the Son knows not, he becomes as express a witness to the two natures which constitute his person as Paul is when he speaks of the blood of God, or as Keeble is a witness to the twofold constitution of a human being when he speaks of souls shedding blood. In this short sentence, thus, our Lord bears witness to his divine nature with its supremacy above all creatures, to his human nature with its creaturely limitations, and to the unity of the subject possessed of these two natures. b. Other passages. The Son of Man and Son of God. All these elements of his personality find severally repeated assertions in other utterances of our Lord recorded in the Synoptics. There is no need to insist here on the elevation of himself above the kings and prophets of the Old Covenant, Matthew 12.41 and following, above the temple itself, Matthew 12.6, and the ordinances of the divine law, Matthew 12.8, or on his accent of authority in both his teaching and action. His great I say unto you, Matthew 5.21 and 22, I will be cleansed. Mark 1, 41, 2, 5, Luke 7, 14, or on his separation of himself from men in his relation to God, never including himself with them in an Our Father, but consistently speaking distinctively of My Father, for example, Luke 24, 49, and Your Father, for example, Matthew 5, 16, or his intimation that he is not merely David's son, but David's Lord, and that a Lord sitting on the right hand of God, Matthew 22, 44, or on his parabolic discrimination of himself, a son and heir from all servants, Matthew 21, 33 and following, or even on his ascription to himself of the purely divine functions of the forgiveness of sins, Mark 2, 8, and judgment of the world, Matthew 25, 31, or of the purely divine powers of reading the heart, Mark 2, 8, Luke 9, 47, omnipotence, Matthew 24, 30, Mark 14.62, and Omnipresence, Matthew 18.20, 28.10. These things illustrate his constant assumption of the possession of divine dignity and attributes. The claim itself is more directly made in the two great designations which he currently gave himself, the Son of Man and the Son of God. The former of these is his favourite self-designation. Derived from Daniel 7.13.14, it intimates on every occasion of its employment our Lord's consciousness of being a supramundane being who has entered into a sphere of earthly life on a high mission, on the accomplishment of which he is to return to his heavenly sphere, whence he shall in due season come back to earth, now, however, in his proper majesty, to gather up the fruits of his work and consummate all things. 
It is a designation thus which implies at once a heavenly pre-existence, a present humiliation, and a future glory, and he proclaims himself in this future glory no less than the universal king seated on the throne of judgment for quick and dead. Mark 8.31, Matthew 25.31 the implication of deity embedded in the designation Son of Man is perhaps more plainly spoken out in the companion designation Son of God, which our Lord not only accepts at the hands of others, accepting with it the implication of blasphemy in permitting its application to himself, Matthew 26, 63-65, Mark 14, 61-64, Luke 22, 29-30, but persistently claims for himself both, in his constant designation of God as his Father in a distinctive sense, and in his less frequent but more pregnant designation of himself as, by way of eminence, the Son. That his consciousness of a peculiar relation to God expressed by this designation was not an attainment of his mature spiritual development, but was part of his most intimate consciousness from the beginning, is suggested by the sole glimpse which is given us into his mind as a child. Luke 2.49 the high significance which the designation bore to him is revealed to us in two remarkable utterances preserved, the one by both Matthew, 11.27 and following, and Luke, 10.22 and following, and the other by Matthew, 28.19. C. Matthew 11.27, 28.19. In the former of these utterances, our Lord, speaking in the most solemn manner, not only presents himself as the Son as the sole source of knowledge of God and of blessedness for men, but places himself in a position not of equality merely, but of absolute reciprocity and interpenetration of knowledge with the Father. No one, he says, knoweth the Son save the Father, neither doth any know the Father save the Son. Varied in Luke so as to read, No one knoweth who the Son is save the Father, and who the Father is save the Son as if the being of the Son was so immense that only God could know it thoroughly, and the knowledge of the Son was so unlimited that he could know God to perfection. The peculiarly pregnant employment here of the terms Son and Father over against one another is explained to us in the other utterance, Matthew 28, 19. It is the resurrected Lord's commission to his disciples, claiming for himself all authority in heaven and on earth, which implies the possession of omnipotence and promising to be with his followers always even to the end of the world, which adds the implications of omnipresence and omniscience, he commands them to baptize their converts in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The precise form of the formula must be carefully observed. It does not read, in the names, plural, as if there were three beings enumerated, each with its distinguishing name, nor yet in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, as if there were one person going by a threefold name. It reads, in the name, singular, of the Father, and of the, article repeated, Son, and of the, article repeated, Holy Ghost, carefully distinguishing three persons, though uniting them all under one name. The name of God was to the Jews, Yeh, and to name the name of Yeh upon them was to make them his. What Jesus did in this great injunction was to command his followers to name the name of God upon their converts and to announce the name of God which is to be named on their converts in the threefold enumeration of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. As it is unquestionable that he intended himself by the Son, he here places himself by the side of the Father and the Spirit as together with them constituting the one God. It is, of course, the Trinity which he is describing, and that is as much as to say that he announces himself as one of the persons of the Trinity. This is what Jesus, as reported by the Synoptics, understood himself to be. See Trinity. 2. His Humanity. In announcing himself to be God, however, Jesus does not deny that he is man also. If all his speech of himself rests on his consciousness of a divine nature, no less does all his speech manifest his consciousness of a human nature. He easily identifies himself with men, Matthew 4.4, 4, Luke 4.4, 4, and receives without protest the imputation of humanity, Matthew 11.19, Luke 7.34. He speaks familiarly of his body, Matthew 26.12-26. Mark 14.8, 14.22, Luke 22.19, and of his bodily parts, his feet and hands, Luke 24.39, his head and feet, Luke 7.44-46, his flesh and bones, Luke 24.39, his blood, Matthew 26.28, Mark 14.24, Luke 22.20. 20. 
we chance to be given indeed a very express affirmation on his part of the reality of his bodily nature when his disciples were terrified at his appearing before them after his resurrection supposing him to be a spirit he reassures them with the direct declaration see my hands and my feet that it is i myself handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye behold me having luke twenty four thirty nine his testimony to his human soul is just as express my soul he says is exceeding sorrowful even unto death matthew twenty six thirty eight mark fourteen thirty four he speaks of the human dread with which he looked forward to his approaching death luke twelve fifty and expresses in a poignant cry his sense of desolation on the cross matthew twenty seven forty six mark fifteen thirty four he speaks also of his pity for the weary and hungering people matthew fifteen thirty two mark eight two and of a strong human desire which he felt luke twenty two fifteen nothing that is human is alien to him except sin he never ascribes imperfection to himself and never betrays consciousness of sin he recognizes the evil of those about him luke eleven thirteen matthew seven eleven twelve thirty four thirty nine luke eleven twenty nine but he never identifies himself with it it is those who do the will of god with whom he feels kinship matthew twelve fifty and he offers himself to the morally sick as a physician matthew nine twelve he proposes himself as an example of the highest virtues matthew eleven twenty eight and following and pronounces him blessed who shall find no occasion of stumbling in him matthew eleven six three unity of the person these manifestations of a human and divine consciousness simply stand side by side in the records of our lord's self-expression neither is suppressed or even qualified by the other if we attend only to the one class we might suppose him to proclaim himself wholly divine if only to the other we might equally easily imagine him to be representing himself as wholly human with both together before us we perceive him alternately speaking out of a divine and out of a human consciousness manifesting himself as all that god is and as all that man is yet with the most marked unity of consciousness he the one jesus christ was to his own apprehension true god and complete man in a unitary personal life the two natures everywhere presupposed there underlies thus the entire literature of the new testament a single unvarying conception of the constitution of our lord's person from matthew where he is presented as one of the persons of the holy trinity twenty eight nineteen or if we prefer the chronological order of books from the epistle of james where he is spoken of as the glory of god the shekinah two one to the apocalypse where he is represented as declaring that he is the alpha and the omega the first and the last the beginning and the end one eight seventeen twenty two thirteen he is consistently thought of as in his fundamental being just god at the same time from the synoptic gospels in which he is dramatized as a man walking among men his human descent carefully recorded and his sense of dependence on god so emphasized that prayer becomes almost his most characteristic action to the epistles of john in which it is made the note of a christian that he confesses that jesus christ has come in flesh one john four two and the apocalypse in which his birth in the tribe of judah and the house of david five five twenty two sixteen his exemplary life of conflict and victory three twenty one his death on the cross eleven eight are noted he is equally consistently thought of as true man nevertheless from the beginning to the end of the whole series of books while first one and then the other of his two natures comes into repeated prominence there is never a question of conflict between the two never any confusion in their relations never any schism in his unitary personal action but he is obviously considered and presented as one composite indeed but undivided personality in this state of the case not only may evidence of the constitution of our lord's person properly be drawn indifferently from every part of the new testament and passage justly be cited to support and explain passage without reference to the portion of the new testament in which it is found but we should be without justification if we did not employ this common presupposition of the whole body of this literature to illustrate and explain the varied representations which meet us cursorily in its pages representations which might easily be made to appear mutually contradictory were they not brought into harmony by their relation as natural component parts of this one unitary conception which underlies and gives consistency to them all there can scarcely be imagined a better proof of the truth of a doctrine than its power completely to harmonize a multitude of statements 
which without it would present to our view only a mass of confused inconsistencies. A key which perfectly fits a lock of very complicated wards can scarcely fail to be the true key. Formulation of the Doctrine Meanwhile, the wards remain complicated. Even in the case of our own composite structure of soul and body, familiar as we are with it from our daily experience, the mutual relations of elements so disparate in a single personality remain an unplumbed mystery and give rise to paradoxical modes of speech which would be misleading were not their source in our duplex nature well understood. We may read in careful writers of souls being left dead in battlefields and of everybody's immortality. The mysteries of the relations in which the constituent elements in the more complex personality of our Lord stand to one another are immeasurably greater than in our simpler case. We can never hope to comprehend how the infinite God and a finite humanity can be united in a single person, and it is very easy to go fatally astray in attempting to explain the intersections in the unitary person of natures so diverse from one another. It is not surprising, therefore, that so soon as serious efforts began to be made to give systematic explanations of the biblical facts as to our Lord's person, many one-sided and incomplete statements were formulated which required correction and complementing, before at length a mode of statement was devised which did full justice to the biblical data. It was accordingly only after more than a century of controversy, during which nearly every conceivable method of construing and misconstruing the biblical facts had been proposed and tested, that a formula was framed which successfully guarded the essential data supplied by the scriptures from destructive misconception. This formula, put together by the Council of Chalcedon, 451 AD, declares it to have always been the doctrine of the Church, derived from the scriptures and our Lord himself, that our Lord Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man, of a reasonable soul and body, consubstantial with the Father according to the Godhead, and consubstantial with us according to the manhood, in all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter days, for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved, and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, and only begotten, God, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing here but a careful statement in systematic form of the pure teaching of the scriptures, and therefore this statement has stood ever since as the norm of thought and teaching as to the person of the Lord. As such, it has been incorporated in one form or another into the creeds of all the great branches of the church. It underlies and gives their form to all the allusions to Christ in the great mass of preaching and song which has accumulated during the centuries, and it has supplied the background of the devotions of the untold multitudes who through the Christian ages have been worshippers of Christ. End of The Person of Christ Part 2 by B.B. B. Warfield The Christ That Paul Preached by B. B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The monumental introduction of the epistle to the Romans, it is thus that W. Busett speaks of the seven opening verses of the epistle, is, from the formal point of view, merely the address of the epistle. In primary purpose and fundamental structure, it does not differ from the addresses of Paul's other epistles. But even in the addresses of his epistles, Paul does not confine himself to the simple repetition of a formula. Here, too, he writes at his ease and shows himself very much the master of his form. It is Paul's custom to expand one or another of the essential elements of the address of his epistles, as circumstances suggested, and thus to impart to it, in each several instance, a specific character. The address of the epistle to the Romans is the extreme example of this expansion. Paul is approaching in it a church which he had not visited, and to which he apparently felt himself somewhat of a stranger. 
He naturally begins with some words adapted to justify his writing to it, especially as an authoritative teacher of Christian truth. In doing this, he is led to describe briefly the gospel which has been committed to him, and that particularly with regard to its contents. There is very strikingly illustrated here a peculiarity of Paul's style, which has been called going off at a word. His particular purpose is to represent himself as one authoritatively appointed to teach the gospel of God. But he is more interested in the gospel than he is in himself, and he no sooner mentions the gospel than off he goes on a tangent to describe it. In describing it, he naturally tells us particularly what its contents are. Its contents, however, were for him summed up in Christ. No sooner does he mention Christ than off he goes again on a tangent to describe Christ. Thus it comes about that this passage, formerly only the address of the epistle, becomes actually a great Christological deliverance, one of the chief sources of our knowledge of Paul's conception of Christ. It presents itself to our view like one of those nests of Chinese boxes. The outer encasement is the address of the epistle. Within that fits neatly Paul's justification of his addressing the Romans as an authoritative teacher of the gospel. Within that, a description of the gospel committed to him. And within that, a great declaration of who and what Jesus Christ is as the contents of this gospel. The manner in which Paul approaches this very great declaration concerning Christ lends it a very special interest. What we are given is not merely how Paul thought of Christ, but how Paul preached Christ. It is the content of the gospel of God, the gospel to which he, as a called apostle, has been separated, which he outlines in these pregnant words. This is how Paul preached Christ to the faith of men as he went up and down the world, serving God in his spirit in the gospel of his Son. We have no abstract theologumina here, categories of speculative thought appropriate only to the closet. We have the great facts about Jesus which made the gospel that Paul preached the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believed. Nowhere else do we get a more direct description of specifically the Christ that Paul preached. The direct description of the Christ that Paul preached is given us, of course, in the third and fourth verses. But the wider setting in which these verses are embedded cannot be neglected in seeking to get at their significance. In this wider setting, the particular aspect in which Christ is presented is that of Lord. It is as Lord that Paul is thinking of Jesus when he describes himself in the opening words of the address, in the very first item of his commendation of himself to the Romans, as the slave of Christ Jesus. Slave is the correlate of Lord, and the relation must be taken at its height. When Paul calls himself the slave of Christ Jesus, he is calling Christ Jesus his Lord in the most complete sense which can be ascribed to that word. Compare Romans 16.8, Colossians 3.4. He is declaring that he recognizes in Christ Jesus one over against whom he has no rights, whose property he is, body and soul, to be disposed of as he will. This is not because he abases himself, it is because he exalts Christ. It is because Christ is thought of by him as one whose right it is to rule, and to rule with no limit to his right. How Paul thought of Christ as Lord comes out, however, with most startling clearness in the closing words of the address. There he couples the Lord Jesus Christ with God our Father as the common source from which he seeks in prayer the divine gifts of grace and peace for the Romans. We must renounce innovating glossing here too. Paul is not thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ as only the channel through which grace and peace come from God our Father to men, nor is he thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ as only the channel through which his prayer finds its way to God our Father. His prayer for these blessings for the Romans is offered up to God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ together as the conjoint object addressed in his petition. So far as this, Busset's remark is just. Prayer to God in Christ is for Pauline Christianity too a false formula. Adoration of the kurios stands in the Pauline communities side by side with adoration of God in unreconciled reality. Only we must go further. Paul couples God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in his prayer on a complete equality. They are, for the purposes of the prayer, for the purposes of the bestowment of grace and peace, one to him. Christ is so highly exalted in his sight that looking up to him through the immense stretches which separate him from the plane of human life, the forms of God and Christ, as Busset puts it, are brought to the eye of faith into close conjunction. He should have said that they completely coalesce. It is only half the truth, though it is half the truth, to say that, with Paul, the object of religious faith, as of religious worship, presents itself in a singular, thoroughgoing dualism. 
The other half of the truth is that this dualism resolves itself into a complete unity. The two, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, are steadily recognized as two and are statedly spoken of by the distinguishing designations of God and Lord. But they are equally steadily envisaged as one and are statedly combined as the common object of every religious aspiration and the common source of every spiritual blessing. It is no accident that they are united in our present passage under the government of the single preposition from, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is normal with Paul. God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are not to him two objects of worship, two sources of blessing, but one object of worship, one source of blessing. Does he not tell us plainly that we who have one God the Father and one Lord Jesus Christ yet know perfectly well that there is no God but one, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 and 6. Paul is writing the address of his epistle to the Romans then, with his mind fixed on the divine dignity of Christ. It is this divine Christ who, he must be understood to be telling his readers, constitutes the substance of his gospel proclamation. He does not leave us, however, merely to infer this. He openly declares it. The gospel he preaches, he says, concerns precisely the Son of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. He expressly says then that he presents Christ in his preaching as our Lord. It was the divine Christ that he preached, the Christ that the eye of faith could not distinguish from God, who was addressed in common with God in prayer and was looked to in common with God as the source of all spiritual blessings. Paul does not speak of Christ here, however, merely as our Lord. He gives him the two designations, the Son of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. The second designation obviously is explanatory of the first not as if it were the more current or the more intelligible designation. It may or it may not have been both the one and the other, but that is not the point here. The point here is that it is the more intimate and more appealing designation. It is the designation which tells what Christ is to us. He is our Lord, he to whom we go in prayer, he to whom we look for blessings, he to whom all our religious emotions turn, on whom all our hopes are set, for this life and for that to come. Paul tells the Romans that this is the Christ that he preaches, their and his Lord, whom both they and he reverence and worship and love and trust in. This is, of course, what he mainly wishes to say to them, and it is up to this that all else that he says of the Christ that he preaches leads. The other designation, the Son of God, which Paul prefixes to this in his fundamental declaration concerning the Christ that he preached, supplies the basis for this. It does not tell us what Christ is to us, but what Christ is in himself. In himself he is the Son of God, and it is only because he is the Son of God in himself that he can be and is our Lord. The Lordship of Christ is rooted by Paul, in other words, not in any adventitious circumstances connected with his historical manifestation, not in any powers or dignities conferred on him or acquired by him, but fundamentally in his metaphysical nature. The designation Son of God is a metaphysical designation and tells us what he is in his being of being. And what it tells us that Christ is in his being of being is that he is just what God is. It is undeniable, and Bousset, for example, does not deny it, that from the earliest days of Christianity on, in Bousset's words, Son of God was equivalent simply to equal with God. Mark 4, 61-63, John 10, 31-39. That Paul meant scarcely so much as this, Bousset, to be sure, would fain have us believe. He does not dream, of course, of supposing Paul to mean nothing more than that Jesus had been elevated into the relation of sonship to God because of his moral uniqueness, or of his community of will with God. He is compelled to allow that the Son of God appears in Paul as a supramundane being standing in close metaphysical relation with God. But he would have us understand that however close he stands to God, he is not, in Paul's view, quite equal with God. Paul, he suggests, has seized on this term to help him through the frightful problem of conceiving of this second divine being consistently with his monotheism. Christ is not quite God to him, but only the Son of God. Of such refinements, however, Paul knows nothing. With him, too, the maxim rules that whatever the father is, that the son is also. Every father begets his son in his own likeness. The son of God is necessarily to him just God, and he does not scruple to declare this son of God all that God is, Philippians 2.6, Colossians 2.9, and even to give him the supreme name of God over all, Romans 9.5.
This is fundamentally then how Paul preached Christ as the Son of God in this super eminent sense and therefore our divine Lord on whom we absolutely depend and to whom we owe absolute obedience. But this was not all that he was accustomed to preach concerning Christ. Paul preached the historical Jesus as well as the eternal Son of God. And between these two designations, Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, he inserts two clauses which tell us how he preached the historical Jesus. All that he taught about Christ was thrown up against the background of his deity. He is the Son of God, our Lord. But who is this that is thus so fervently declared to be the Son of God and our Lord? It is in the two clauses which are now to occupy our attention that Paul tells us. If we reduce what he tells us to its lowest terms, it amounts just to this. Paul preached the historical Christ as the promised Messiah and as the very Son of God. But he declares Christ to be the promised Messiah and the very Son of God in language so pregnant, so packed with implications, as to carry us into the heart of the great problem of the two-natured person of Christ. The exact terms in which he describes Christ as the promised Messiah and the very Son of God are these. Who became of the seed of David according to the flesh, who was marked out as the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. This, in brief, is the account which Paul gives of the historical Christ whom he preached. Of course, there is a temporal succession suggested in the declarations of the two clauses. They so far give us not only a description of the historical Christ, but the life history of the Christ that Paul preached. Jesus Christ became of the seed of David at his birth and by his birth. He was marked out as the Son of God in power only at his resurrection and by his resurrection. But it was not to indicate this temporal succession that Paul sets the two declarations side by side. It emerges merely as the incidental, or we may say even the accidental, result of their collocation. The relation in which Paul sets the two declarations to one another is a logical rather than a temporal one. It is the relation of climax. His purpose is to exalt Jesus Christ. He wishes to say the great things about him. And the two greatest things he has to say about him in his historical manifestation are these, that he became of the seed of David according to the flesh, that he was marked out as the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Both of these declarations, we say, are made for the purpose of extolling Christ, the former just as truly as the latter. That Christ came as the Messiah belongs to his glory, and the particular terms in which his Messiahship is intimated are chosen in order to enhance his glory. The word came, became, is correlated with the promise afore of the preceding verse. This is he, Paul says, whom all the prophets did before signify, and who at length came, even as they signified, of the seed of David. There is doubtless an intimation of the pre-existence of Christ here also, as J. B. Lightfoot properly instructs us. He who was always the Son of God now became of the seed of David. But this lies somewhat apart from the main current of thought. The heart of the declaration resides in the great words, of the seed of David. For these are great words. In declaring the messiahship of Jesus, Paul adduces his royal dignity, and he adduces it because he is thinking of the majesty of the messiahship. We must beware, then, of reading this clause depreciatingly, as if Paul were making a concession in it. He came, no doubt, he came indeed, of the seed of David, but Paul never for an instant thought of the messiahship of Jesus as a thing to be apologized for. The relation of the second clause to the first is not that of opposition but of climax, and it contains only so much of contrast as is intrinsic in a climax. The connection would be better expressed by an and than by a but, or if by a but, not by an indeed but, but by a not only but. Even the messiahship, inexpressibly glorious as it is, does not exhaust the glory of Christ. He had a glory greater than even this. This was but the beginning of his glory, but it was the beginning of his glory. He came into the world as the promised Messiah, and he went out of the world as the demonstrated Son of God. In these two things is summed up the majesty of his historical manifestation. It is not intended to say that when he went out of the world he left his Messiahship behind him. The relation of the second clause to the first is not that of supersession, but that of superposition. Paul passes from one glory to another, but he is as far as possible from suggesting that the one glory extinguished the other. 
The resurrection of Christ had no tendency to abolish his messiahship, and the exalted Christ remains of the seed of David. There is no reason to doubt that Paul would have exhorted his readers when he wrote these words with all the fervor with which he did later to remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead of the seed of David, 2 Timothy 2.8. According to my gospel, he adds there, as an intimation that it was as of the seed of David that he was accustomed to preach Jesus Christ, whether as on earth as here, or as in heaven as there. It is the exalted Jesus that proclaims himself in the Apocalypse the root and the offspring of David, Revelation 22.16, 5, five, and in whose hands the key of David is found, 3.7, and as it is not intimated that Christ ceased to be of the seed of David when he rose from the dead, neither is it intimated that he then first became the Son of God. He was already the Son of God when and before he became of the seed of David, and he did not cease to be the Son of God on and by becoming of the seed of David. It was rather just because he was the Son of God that he became of the seed of David, to become which, in the great sense of the prophetic announcements and of his own accomplishment, he was qualified only by being the Son of God. Therefore, Paul does not say he was made the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. He says he was defined, marked out as the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. His resurrection from the dead was well adapted to mark him out as the Son of God, scarcely to make him the Son of God. Consider what the Son of God in Paul's usage means, and precisely what the resurrection was and did. It was a thing which was quite appropriate to happen to the Son of God, and happening could bear strong witness to him as such, but how could it make one the Son of God? We might possibly say, no doubt, with a tolerable meaning that Christ was installed, even constituted Son of God in power, by the resurrection of the dead. If we could see our way to construe the words in power thus directly with the Son of God, that too would imply that he was already the Son of God before he rose from the dead, only then in weakness. What he had been all along in weakness, he was now constituted in power. This construction, however, though not impossible, is hardly natural, and it imposes a sense on the preceding clause of which it itself gives no suggestion, and which it is reluctant to receive. To say of the seed of David is not to say weakness, it is to say majesty. It is quite certain indeed that the assertion who was made of the seed of David cannot be read concessively, preparing the way for the celebration of Christ's glory in the succeeding clause. It stands rather in parallelism with the clause that follows it, asserting with it the supreme glory of Christ. In any case, the two clauses do not express two essentially different modes of being through which Christ successively passed. We could think at most only of two successive stages of manifestation of the Son of God. At most we could see in it a declaration that he who always was and continues always to be the Son of God was manifested to men first as the Son of David, and then after his resurrection as also the exalted Lord. He always was in the essence of his being the Son of God. This Son of God became of the seed of David and was installed as what he always was, the Son of God, though now in his proper power by the resurrection of the dead. It is assuredly wrong, however, to press even so far the idea of temporal succession. Temporal succession was not what it was in Paul's mind to emphasize and is not the ruling idea of his assertion. The ruling idea of his assertion is the celebration of the glory of Christ. We think of temporal succession only because of the mention of the resurrection, which, in point of fact, cuts our Lord's life manifestation into two sections. But Paul is not adducing the resurrection because it cuts our Lord's life manifestation into two sections, but because of the demonstration it brought of the dignity of his person. It is quite indifferent to his declaration when the resurrection took place. He is not adducing it as the producing cause of a change in our Lord's mode of being. In point of fact, it did not produce a change in our Lord's mode of being, although it stood at the beginning of a new stage of his life history. What it did, and what Paul adduces it here as doing, was that it brought out into plain view who and what Christ really was. This, says Paul, is the Christ I preach, he who came of the seed of David, he who was marked out in power as the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. His thought of Christ runs in the two moulds, his messiahship, his resurrection. But he is not particularly concerned here with the temporal relations of these two facts.
Paul does not, however, say of Christ merely that he became of the seed of David and was marked out as the Son of God in power by the resurrection of the dead. He introduces a qualifying phrase into each clause. He says that he became of the seed of David according to the flesh and that he was marked out as the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. What is the nature of the qualifications made by these phrases? It is obvious at once that they are not temporal qualifications. Paul does not mean to say, in effect, that our Lord was Messiah only during his earthly manifestation and became the Son of God only on and by means of his resurrection. It has already appeared that Paul did not think of the Messiahship of our Lord only in connection with his earthly manifestation or of his sonship to God only in connection with his post-resurrection existence. And the qualifying phrases themselves are ill-adapted to express this temporal disjunction. Even if we could twist the phrase according to the flesh into meaning according to his human manifestation and violently make that do duty as a temporal definition, the parallel phrase according to the spirit of holiness utterly refuses to yield to any treatment which could make it mean according to his heavenly manifestation. And nothing could be more monstrous than to represent precisely the resurrection as in the case of Christ, the producing cause of, the source out of which proceeds, a condition of existence which could be properly characterized as distinctly spiritual. Exactly what the resurrection did was to bring it about that his subsequent mode of existence should continue to be, like the precedent, fleshly, to assimilate his post-resurrection to his pre-resurrection mode of existence in the manner of the constitution of his person. And if we fall back on the ethical contrast of the terms, that could only mean that Christ should be supposed to be represented as imperfectly holy in his earthly stage of existence, and as only on his resurrection attaining to complete holiness. Compare 1 Corinthians 15, 44 and 46. It is very certain that Paul did not mean that. 1 Corinthians 5, 21. It is clear enough, then, that Paul cannot by any possibility have intended to represent Christ as in his pre-resurrection and his post-resurrection modes of being differing in any way which can be naturally expressed by the contrasting terms flesh and spirit. Least of all, can he be supposed to have intended this distinction in the sense of the ethical contrast between these terms? But a further word may be pardoned as to this that it is precisely this ethical contrast that Paul intends has been insisted on under the cover of the adjunct of holiness attached here to spirit. The contrast, it is said, is not between flesh and spirit, but between flesh and spirit of holiness. And what is intended is to represent Christ, who on earth was merely Christ according to the flesh, the flesh of sin, of course, it is added that it is the flesh which was in the grasp of sin, to have been after and in consequence of the resurrection, set free from the likeness of weak and sinful flesh. Through the resurrection, in other words, Christ has for the first time become the Holy Son of God, free from entanglement with sin-cursed flesh, and having thus saved himself is qualified, we suppose, now to save others by bringing them through the same experience of resurrection to the same holiness. We have obviously wandered here sufficiently far from the declarations of the Apostle and we have landed in a reductio ad absurdum of this whole system of interpretation. Paul is not here distinguishing times and contrasting two successive modes of our Lord's being. He is distinguishing elements in the constitution of our Lord's person, by virtue of which he is at one and the same time both the Messiah and the Son of God. He became of the seed of David with respect to the flesh, and by the resurrection of the dead was mightily proven to be also the Son of God with respect to the spirit of holiness. It ought to go without saying that by these two elements in the constitution of our Lord's person, the flesh and the spirit of holiness, by virtue of which he is at once of the seed of David and the Son of God, are not intended the two constituent elements, flesh and spirit, which go to make up common humanity. It is impossible that Paul should have represented our Lord as the Messiah only by virtue of his bodily nature, and it is absurd to suppose him to suggest that his sonship to God was proved by his resurrection to reside in his mental nature or even in his ethical purity, to say nothing now of supposing him to assert that he was made by the resurrection into the Son of God, or into the Son of God in power with respect to his mental nature here described as holy. How the resurrection, which was in itself just the resumption of the body, of all things, could be thought of as constituting our Lord's mental nature, the Son of God, passes imagination. 
and if it be conceivable that it might at least prove that he was the Son of God, it remains hidden how it could be so emphatically asserted that it was only with reference to his mental nature, in sharp contrast with his bodily, thus recovered to him, that this was proved concerning him precisely by his resurrection. Is Paul's real purpose here to guard men from supposing that our Lord's bodily nature, though recovered to him in this great act, the resurrection, entered into his sonship to God? There is no reason discoverable in the context why this distinction between our Lord's bodily and mental natures should be so strongly stressed here. It is clearly an artificial distinction imposed on the passage. When Paul tells us of the Christ which he preached, that he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, he quite certainly has the whole of his humanity in mind. And in introducing this limitation, according to the flesh, into his declaration that Christ was made of the seed of David, he intimates not obscurely that there was another side, not aspect but element, of his being besides his humanity, in which he was not made of the seed of David, but was something other and higher. If he had said nothing more than just these words, he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, this intimation would still have been express though we might have been left to speculation to determine what other element could have entered into his being and what he must have been according to that element. He has not left us, however, to this speculation, but has plainly told us that the Christ he preached was not merely made of the seed of David according to the flesh, but was also marked out as the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Since the according to the flesh includes all his humanity, the according to the spirit of holiness, which is set in contrast with it, and according to which he is declared to be the Son of God, must be sought outside of his humanity. What the nature of this element of his being, in which he is superior to humanity is, is already clear from the fact that according to it he is the Son of God. Son of God is, as we have already seen, a metaphysical designation asserting equality with God. It is a divine name. To say that Christ is, according to the Spirit of Holiness, the Son of God, is to say that the Spirit of Holiness is a designation of his divine nature. Paul's whole assertion, therefore, amounts to saying that in one element of his being, the Christ that he preached was man, in another, God. Looked at from the point of view of his human nature, he was the Messiah, of the seed of David. Looked at from the point of view of his divine nature, he was the Son of God. Looked at in his composite personality, he was both the Messiah and the Son of God, because in him were united both he that came of the seed of David according to the flesh, and he who was marked out as the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. We may be somewhat puzzled by the designation of the divine nature of Christ as the spirit of holiness. But not only is it plain from its relation to its contrast the flesh, and to its correlate the Son of God, that it is his divine nature which is so designated, but this is made superabundantly clear from the closely parallel passage, Romans 9.5. There, in enumerating the glories of Israel, the apostle comes to his climax in this great declaration that from Israel Christ came. But there, no more than here, will he allow that it was the whole Christ who came, as said there from the stock of Israel, as said here from the seed of David. He adds there, too, at once the limitation as concerns the flesh, just as he adds it here. Thus he intimates with emphasis that something more is to be said if we are to give a complete account of Christ's being. There was something about him in which he did not come from Israel, and in which he is more than the flesh. What this something is, Paul adds in the great words, God over all. He who was from Israel according to the flesh is... On the other side of his being, in which he is not from Israel and not flesh, nothing other than God over all. In our present passage, the phrase spirit of holiness takes the place of God over all in the other. Clearly, Paul means the same thing by them both. This being very clear, what interests us most is the emphasis which Paul throws on holiness in his designation of the divine nature of Christ. The simple word spirit might have been ambiguous when the spirit of holiness is spoken of, the divine nature is expressly named. No doubt, Paul might have used the adjective holy instead of the genitive of the substantive of holiness, and have said the Holy Spirit. Had he done so, he would have as expressly intimated deity as in his actual phrase. But he would have left open the possibility of being misunderstood as speaking of that distinct Holy Spirit to which this designation is commonly applied. The relation in which the divine nature which he attributes to Christ stands to the Holy Spirit was, in Paul's mind, no doubt very close. 
as close as the relation between God and Lord, whom he constantly treats as though two, yet also one. Not only does he identify the activities of the two, for example Romans 8, 9 and following, but also in some high sense he identifies them themselves. He can make use, for example, of such a startling expression as, the Lord is the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3.17. Nevertheless, it is perfectly clear that the Lord and the Spirit are not one person to Paul, and the distinguishing employment of the designations the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is spread broadcast over his pages. Even in immediate connection with his declaration that the Lord is the Spirit, he can speak with the utmost naturalness not only of the Spirit of the Lord, but also of the Lord of the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and following. What is of a special importance to note in our present connection is that he is not speaking of an endowment of Christ either from or with the Holy Spirit, although he would be the last to doubt that he who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh was plenarily endowed both from and with the Spirit. He is speaking of that divine Spirit which is the complement in the constitution of Christ's person of the human nature according to which he was the Messiah, and by virtue of which he was not merely the Messiah but also the very Son of God. This spirit he calls distinguishingly the spirit of holiness, the spirit the very characteristic of which is holiness. He is speaking not of an acquired holiness, but of an intrinsic holiness, not then of a holiness which had been conferred at the time of, or attained by means of the resurrection from the dead, but of a holiness which had always been the very quality of Christ's being. He is not representing Christ as having first been after a fleshly fashion the son of David and afterwards becoming by or at the resurrection from the dead after a spiritual fashion the holy son of God. He is representing him as being in his very nature essentially and therefore always and in every mode of his manifestation holy. Busset is quite right when he declares that there is no reference in the phrase spirit of holiness to the preservation of his holiness by Christ in his earthly manifestation, but that it is a metaphysical designation describing according to its intrinsic quality an element in the constitution of Christ's person from the beginning. This is the characteristic of the Christ Paul preached, as truly his characteristic as that he was the Messiah. Evidently in Paul's thought of deity, holiness held a prominent place. When he wishes to distinguish spirit from spirit, it is enough for him that he may designate spirit as divine to define it as that spirit, the fundamental characteristic of which is that it is holy. It belongs to the very essence of the conception of Christ, as Paul preached him, therefore, that he was of two natures, human and divine. He could not preach him at once as of the seed of David and as the Son of God without so preaching him. It never entered Paul's mind that the Son of God could become a mere man, or that a mere man could become the Son of God. We may say that the conception of the two natures is unthinkable to us. That is our own concern. That a single nature could be at once or successively God and man, man and God, was what was unthinkable to Paul. In his view, when we say God and man, we say two natures. When we put a hyphen between them and say God-man, we do not merge them one in the other, but join the two together. That this was Paul's mode of thinking of Jesus, Busset, for example, does not dream of denying. What Busset is unwilling to admit is that the divine element in his two-natured Christ was conceived by Paul as completely divine. Two metaphysical entities, he says, combined themselves for Paul in the person of Christ. One of these was a human, the other a divine nature, and Paul, along with the whole Christian community of his day, worshipped this two-natured Christ, though he, not they, ranked him in his thought of his higher nature below the God over all. The trouble with this construction is that Paul himself gives a different account of the matter. The point of Paul's designation of Christ as the Son of God is not to subordinate him to God, as Busset affirms. He knows no difference in dignity between his God and his Lord. To both alike, or rather to both in common, he offers his prayers. From both alike and both together, he expects all spiritual blessings, Romans 1.7. He roundly calls Christ, by virtue of his higher nature, by the supreme name of God over all, Romans 9.5. These things cannot be obscured by pointing to expressions in which he ascribes to the divine human Christ a relation of subordination to God in his saving work. Paul does not fail to distinguish between what Christ is in the higher element of his being and what he became when, becoming poor that we might be made rich, he assumed for his work's sake the position of a servant in the world. Nor does he permit the one set of facts to crowd the other out of his mind. 
It is no accident that all that he says about the historical two-natured Christ in our present passage is inserted between his two divine designations of the Son of God and Lord. That the Christ that he preached he describes precisely as the Son of God, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, who was marked out as the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. He who is defined as on the human side of David, on the divine side, the Son of God. This two-natured person is declared to be, from the point of view of God, his own Son, and, as all sons are, like him in essential nature, from the point of view of man, our Supreme Lord, whose we are and whom we obey. Ascription of proper deity could not be made more complete. Whether we look at him from the point of view of God or from the point of view of man, he is God. But what Paul preached concerning this divine being belonged to his earthly manifestation. He was made of the seed of David, he was marked out as God's son. The conception of the two natures is not with Paul a negligible speculation attached to his gospel. He preached Jesus, and he preached of Jesus that he was the Messiah. But the Messiah that he preached was no merely human Messiah. He was the Son of God who was made of the seed of David and he was demonstrated to be what he really was by his resurrection from the dead. This was the Jesus that Paul preached, this and none other. End of The Christ That Paul Preached by B.B. Warfield Foresight by B.B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The interest of the student of the Gospels and of the life of Jesus which forms their substance in the topic of this article is twofold. Jesus is represented in the Gospels as at once the object and the subject of the most detailed foresight. The work which he came to do was a work ordained in the councils of eternity and in all its items prepared for beforehand with the most perfect provision. In addressing himself to the accomplishment of this work, Jesus proceeded from the beginning in the fullest knowledge of the end and with the most absolute adjustment of every step to its attainment. It is from this double viewpoint that each of the evangelists depicts the course of our Lord's life on earth. They consensually represent him as having come to perform a specific task and all the elements of which were not only determined beforehand in the plan of God, but adumbrated, if somewhat sporadically, yet with sufficient fullness for the end in view in the prophecies of the Old Testament. And they represent him as coming to perform this task with a clear consciousness of its nature and a competent control of all the means for its discharge, so that his whole life was a conscientious fulfilment of a program and moved straight to its mark. The conception of foresight thus dominates the whole evangelical narrative. It is not necessary to dwell at length upon the evangelist's conception of our Lord's life and work as the fulfilment of a plan divinely predetermined for him. It lies on the face of their narratives that the authors of the Gospels had no reservation with respect to the all-embracing predestination of God and least of all could they exclude from it this life and work which was to them the hinge upon which all history turns. To them, accordingly, our Lord is, by way of eminence, the man of destiny, and his whole life was governed by the the of the divine counsel. Every step of his pathway was a necessity to him in the fulfilment of the mission for which he had come forth, or, as St. Luke, in quite Johannine wise, expresses it, was sent especially was all that concerned his departure, the accomplishment of which was his particular task under the government of this divine necessity. His final journey to Jerusalem, his rejection by the rulers, his betrayal, arrest, sufferings and death, and death by crucifixion, his rising again on the third day, each item alike is declared to have been a matter of necessity in pursuance of the divine purpose, a necessary part of the destiny assigned our Lord. The death of our Lord thus appears not as the accidental work of hostile caprice, but the necessary result of the divine predestination, to which divine the, the personal free action of man, had to serve as an instrument. How far the several events which entered into this life had been prophetically announced is obviously, in this view of it, a mere matter of detail. 
All of them lay open before the eyes of God, and the only limit to pre-announcement was the extent to which God had chosen to reveal what was to come to pass through his servants the prophets. In some instances, however, the prophetic announcement is particularly adduced as the ground on which recognition of the necessity of occurrence rests. The fulfillment of scripture thus becomes regulative for the life of Jesus. Whatever stood written of him in the law or the prophets or the Psalms must needs be accomplished. Or in another form of statement, particularly frequent in Matthew and John, but found also in the other evangelists, the several occurrences of his life fell out as they did in order that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophets or in scripture might be fulfilled. That is to say, what was done stood in the connection of the divine necessity as an actual fact by which prophecy was destined to be fulfilled. The divine decree expressed in the latter must be accomplished, and to that end this came to pass, and that according to the whole of its contents. The meaning is not that there lies in the Old Testament scriptures a complete predictive account of all the details of the life of Jesus, which those skilled in the interpretation of scripture might read off from its pages at will. This program, in its detailed completeness, lies only in the divine purpose, and in Scripture only so far forth as God has chosen to place it there for the guidance or the assurance of his people. The meaning is rather that all that stands written of Jesus in the Old Testament Scriptures has its certain fulfillment in him, and that enough stands written of him there to assure his followers that in the course of his life, and in its, to them, strange and unexpected ending, he was not the prey of chance, or the victim of the hatred of men, to the marring of his work, or perhaps even the defeat of his mission, but was following step by step, straight to its goal, the predestined pathway marked out for him in the councils of eternity, and sufficiently revealed from of old in the scriptures, to enable all who were not foolish and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, to perceive that the Christ must needs have lived just this life, and fulfilled just this destiny. That the whole course of the life of Jesus, and especially its culmination in the death which he died, was foreseen and afore prepared by God, enters thus into the very substance of the evangelical narrative. It enters equally into its very substance that this life was from the beginning lived out by Jesus himself in full view of its drift and its issue. The evangelists are, as far from representing Jesus as blindly driven onwards by a divine destiny unknown to himself, along courses not of his own choosing, to an unanticipated end, as they are from representing him as thwarted in his purposes, or limited in his achievement, or determined or modified in his aims or methods by the conditions which from time to time emerged in his way. The very essence of their representation is that Jesus came into the world with a definite mission to execute, of the nature of which he was perfectly aware, and according to which he ordered the whole course of his life as it advanced under his competent control, unswervingly to its preconceived mark. In their view, his life was lived out not in ignorance of its issues, or in the form of a series of trials and corrections, least of all in a more or less unavailing effort to wring success out of failure, but in complete knowledge of the counsels of God for him, in perfect acquiescence in them, and in careful and voluntary fulfilment of them. The divine the which governed his life is represented as fully recognized by himself, and the fulfillment of the intimations of prophecy in his life as accepted by him as a rule for his voluntary action. Determining all things, determined by none, the life he actually lived leading up to the death he actually died, is in their view precisely the life which from the beginning he intended to live, ending in precisely the death in which from the beginning he intended this life to issue, undeflected by so much as a hair's breadth from the straight path he had from the start marked out for himself in the fullest prevision and provision of all the so-called chances and changes which might befall him. Not only were there no surprises in life for Jesus, and no compulsions, there were not even influences, as we speak of influences in a merely human career. The mark of this life, as the evangelists depict it, is its calm and quiet superiority to all circumstance and condition, and to all the varied forces which sway other lives. Its prime characteristics are voluntariness and independence. Neither his mother, nor his brethren, nor his disciples, nor the people he came to serve, nor his enemies bent upon his destruction, nor Satan himself with his temptations, could move him one step from his chosen path. 
When men seemed to prevail over him, they were but working his will. The great, no one has taken my life away from me, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again, is but the enunciation for the supreme act of the principle that governs all his movements. His own chosen pathway ever lay fully displayed before his feet. On it, his feet fell quietly, but they found the way always unblocked. What he did, he came to do, and he carried out his program with unwavering purpose and indefectible certitude. So at least the evangelists represent him. Compare the first half of a striking article on Die Selbstständigkeit Jesu by Trott in Luthards ZKWL, 1883, 4, pages 233 to 241. In its latter half, the article falls away from its idea and ends by making Jesus absolutely dependent on Scripture for his knowledge of God and divine things. Quote, we have no right whatever to maintain that Jesus received revelations from the Father otherwise than through the medium of the sacred Scriptures. That is a part of his complete humanity. Page 238, end quote. The signature of this supernatural life which the evangelists depict Jesus as living lies thus in the perfection of the foresight by which it was governed. Of the reality of this foresight they leave their readers in no doubt, nor yet of its completeness. They suggest it by the general picture they draw of the self-directed life which Jesus lived in view of his mission. They record repeated instances in which he mentions beforehand events yet to occur or foreshadows the end from the beginning. They connect these manifestations of foresight with the possession by him of knowledge in general, in comprehension and penetration alike, far beyond what is native to man. It may perhaps be natural to surmise in the first instance that they intend to convey merely the conviction that in Jesus was manifested a prophet of supreme greatness, in whom, as the culminating example of prophecy, resided beyond precedent the gifts proper to prophets. There can be no question that to the writers of the Gospels, Jesus was the incarnate ideal of the prophet who, as such, forms a class by himself and is more than a prophet. This is what Schwarzkopf thinks him, The Prophecies of Jesus Christ, page 7. They record with evident sympathy the impression made by him at the outset of his ministry that God had at last in him visited his people. They trace the ripening of this impression into a well-settled belief in his prophetic character, and they remark upon the widespread suspicion that accompanied this belief that he was something more than a prophet, possibly one of the old prophets returned, certainly a very special prophet charged with a very special mission for the introduction of the messianic times. They represent Jesus as not only calling out and accepting this estimate of him, but frankly assuming a prophet's place and title, exercising a prophet's functions and delivering prophetic discourses in which he unveils the future. Nevertheless, it is very clear that in their allusions to the supernatural knowledge of Jesus, the evangelists suppose themselves to be illustrating something very much greater than merely prophetic inspiration. The specific difference between Jesus and a prophet, in their view, was that while a prophet's human knowledge is increased by many things revealed to him by God, Jesus participated in all the fullness of the divine knowledge, so that all that is knowable lay open before him. The evangelists, in a word, obviously intend to attribute divine omniscience to Jesus and their reduction of instances of his supernatural knowledge, whether with respect to hidden things or to those yet buried in the future, are illustrating his possession of this divine omniscience. Compare Muirhead, The Eschatology of Jesus, page 119, where in partial correction of the more inadequate statement of page 48, there is recognized in the evangelists at least a tendency to attribute to our Lord divine dignity and literal omniscience. That this is the case with St. John's Gospel is very commonly recognized. For a plain statement of the evidence, see Karl Müller, Göttliches Wissen und Göttliche Macht des Johannischen Christus, 1882, section 4, pages 29 to 47. Zeugnisse des vierten Evangeliums für Jesu göttliches Wissen. It is not too much to say indeed that one of the chief objects which the author of that gospel set before himself was to make clear to its readers the superhuman knowledge of Jesus with a special reference of course to his own career. It therefore records direct descriptions of omniscience to Jesus and represents them as favorably received by him. It makes it almost the business of its opening chapters to exhibit this omniscience at work in the especially divine form of immediate, universal and complete knowledge of the thoughts and intents of the human heart. Laying down the general thesis in 224-25, to 
and illustrating it in detail in the cases of all with whom Jesus came in contact in the opening days of his ministry. Peter, Philip, Nathaniel, Mary, Nicodemus, the woman of Samaria. In the especially striking case of the choice of Judas Iscariot as one of the apostles, it expressly explains that this was due to no ignorance of Judas's character or of his future action, but was done as part of our Lord's voluntary execution of his own well-laid plans. It pictures Jesus with great explicitness as prosecuting his work in full knowledge of all things that were coming upon him, and with a view to subjecting them all to his governing hand, so that his life from the beginning should run steadily onwards on the lines of a thoroughly wrought-out plan. It is difficult to see, however, why St. John's Gospel should be separated from its companions in this matter. Schenke says frankly that it is only because there is no such passage in St. John's Gospel as Mark 13.32 on which see below. Whatever else must be said of V. Vrides das Messias Geheimnis, etc., etc., 1901, it must be admitted that it has broken down this artificial distinction between the Gospel of John and the Synoptics. If they do not, like St. John, record direct ascriptions of precise omniscience to Jesus by his followers, they do, like St. John, represent him as himself claiming to be the depository and distributor of the Father's knowledge. Nor do they lag behind St. John in attributing to Jesus the divine prerogative of reading the heart, or the manifestation in other forms of godlike omniscience. Least of all do they fall behind St. John in insisting upon the perfection of the foresight of Jesus in all matters connected with his own life and death. Nothing could exceed the detailed precision of these announcements, a characteristic which has been turned, of course, to their discredit as genuine utterances of Jesus by writers who find difficulty with detailed prediction. The form and contents of these texts, remarks Verida, speak a language which cannot be misunderstood. They are nothing but a short summary of the Passion history, cast, of course, in the future tense. The Passion history, he proceeds, quoting Eichhorn, could certainly not be more exactly related in few words. In very fact, it is perfectly clear, whether they did it by placing upon his lips predictions he never uttered, or never could have uttered, is another question, that the evangelists designed to represent Jesus as endowed with the absolute and unlimited foresight consonant with his divine nature. The force of this representation cannot be broken, of course, by raising the question afresh whether the supernatural knowledge attributed by the evangelists to our Lord may not, in many of its items at least, if not in its whole extent, find its analogues, after all, in human powers, or to be explained as not different in kind from that of the prophets. The question more immediately before us does not concern our own view of the nature and origin of this knowledge, but that of the evangelists. If we will keep these two questions separate, we shall scarcely be able to doubt that the evangelists mean to represent this knowledge as one of the marks of our Lord's divine dignity. In interpreting them, we are not entitled to parcel out the mass of the illustrations of his supernormal knowledge, which they record to differing sources, as may fall in with our own conceptions of the inherent possibilities of each case. Finding indications in some instances merely of his fine human instinct, in others of his prophetic inspiration, while reserving others, if such others are left to us in our analysis, as products of his divine intuition. The evangelists suggest no such lines of cleavage in the Mass, and they must be interpreted from their own standpoint. This finds its centre in their expressed conviction that in Jesus Christ dwelt the fullness of the knowledge of God. To them, his knowledge of God and of divine things, of himself in his person and mission, of the course of his life and the events which would befall him in the prosecution of the work whereunto he had been sent, of the men around him, his followers and friends, the people and their rulers, down to the most hidden depths of their natures and the most intimate processes of their secret thoughts, and of all the things forming the environment in which the drama he was enacting was cast, however widely that environment be conceived, or however minutely it be contemplated. It was but the manifestation, in the ever-widening circles of our human modes of conception, of the perfect apprehension and understanding that dwelt changelessly in his divine intelligence. He who knew God perfectly, it were little that he should know man and the world perfectly too, all that affected his own work and career, of course, and with it equally, of course, all that lay outside of this, in a word, unlimitedly, all things. Even if nothing but the law of parsimony stood in the way, 
It might well be understood that the evangelists would be deterred from seeking, in the case of such a being, other sources of information besides his divine intelligence to account for all his far-reaching and varied knowledge. At all events, it is clearly their conviction that all he knew, the scope of which was unbounded and its depth unfathomed, though their record suggests, rather than fully illustrates it, found its explanation in the dignity of his person as God manifest in the flesh. Nor can the effect of their representation of Jesus as the subject of this all-embracing divine knowledge be destroyed by the discovery in their narratives of another line of representation in which our Lord is set forth as living his life out under the conditions which belong naturally to the humanity he had assumed. These representations are certainly to be neglected as little as those others in which his divine omniscience is suggested. They bring to our observation another side of the complex personality that is depicted, which, if it cannot be said to be as emphatically insisted upon by the evangelists, is nevertheless perhaps equally persuasively illustrated. This is the true humanity of our Lord, within the scope of which he willed to live out his life upon earth, that he might accomplish the mission for which he had been sent. The suggestion that he might break over the bounds of his mission in order that he might escape from the ruggedness of his chosen path by the exercise whether of his almighty power or of his unerring foresight, he treated first and last as a temptation of the evil one. For how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? It is very easy, to be sure, to exaggerate the indications of the evangelists of the confinement of our Lord's activities within the limits of human powers. It is an exaggeration, for example, to speak as if the evangelists represent him as frequently surprised by the events which befell him. They never predicate surprise of him, and it is only by a very precarious inference from the events recorded that they can ever be supposed even to suggest or allow place for such an emotion in our Lord. It is an exaggeration, again, to adduce our Lord's questions as attempts to elicit information for his own guidance, his questions are often plainly dialectical or rhetorical, or, like some of his actions, solely for the benefit of those that stood around. It is once more an exaggeration to adduce the employment in many cases of the term hinosko, when the evangelists speak of our Lord's knowledge, as if it were thereby implied that his knowledge was freshly born in his mind. The assumed distinction, but faintly marked in Greek literature, cannot be traced to the usage of the terms hnoi and idene, in their application to our Lord's knowledge, these terms even replace one another in parallel accounts of the same instance. Gnoe cannot be traced to their usage of the terms gnone and idene in their application to our Lord's knowledge. These terms even replace one another in parallel accounts of the same instance. Gnone is used of the undoubted divine knowledge of our Lord and indeed of the knowledge of God himself, and in any event there is a distinction which in such nice inquiries should not be neglected between saying that the occurrence of an event being perceived was the occasion of an action, and saying that knowledge of the event perceived as occurring waited on its occurrence. Gravely vitiated by such exaggerations as most discussions of the subject are, enough remains, however, after all exaggeration is pruned away, to assure us not indeed that our Lord's life on earth was, in the view of the evangelists, an exclusively human one, or that apart from the constant exercise of his will to make it such, it was controlled by the limitations of humanity, but certainly that it was, in their view, lived out so far as was consistent with the fulfilment of the mission for which he came, and as an indispensable condition of the fulfilment of that mission, under the limitations belonging to a purely human life. The classical passages in this reference are those striking statements in the second chapter of Luke, in which is summed up our Lord's growth from infancy to manhood, including, of course, his intellectual development, and his own remarkable declaration recorded in Matthew 24.36, Mark 13.32, in which he affirms his ignorance of the day and hour of his return to earth. Supplemented by their general dramatization of his life within the range of the purely human, these passages are enough to assure us that, in the view of the evangelists, there was in our Lord a purely human soul, which bore its own proper part in his life, and which, as human souls do, grew in knowledge as it grew in wisdom and grace, and remained to the end, as human souls must, ignorant of many things. Nay, which, because human souls are finite, must ever be ignorant of much embraced in the universal vision of the divine spirit. We may wonder why the day and hour of his own return should remain among the things of which our Lord's human soul continued ignorant throughout his earthly life. 
but this is a matter about which surely we need not much concern ourselves. We can never do more than vaguely guess at the law which governs the inclusions and exclusions which characterize the knowledge contents of any human mind, limited as human minds are, not only qualitatively, but quantitatively. And least of all, could we hope to penetrate the principle of selection in the case of the perfect human intelligence of our Lord. Nor have the evangelists hinted their view of the matter. We must just be content to recognize that we are face to face here with the mystery of the two natures, which, although they do not, of course, formally enunciate the doctrine in so many words, the evangelists yet effectively teach, since by it alone can consistency be induced between the two classes of facts which they present unhesitatingly in their narratives. Only, if we would do justice to their presentation, we must take clear note of two of its characteristics. They do not simply, in separated portions of their narratives, adduce the facts which manifest our Lord's divine powers and his human characteristics, but interlace them inextricably in the same sections of the narratives. And they do not subject the divine that is in Christ to the limitations of the human, but quite decisively present the divine as dominating all, and as giving play to the human only by a constant voluntary withholding of its full manifestation in the interests of the task undertaken. Observe the story, for example, in John 11, which Dr. Mason, Conditions, etc., page 143, justly speaks of as indeed a marvellous weaving together of that which is natural and that which is above natural. Jesus learns from others that Lazarus is sick, but knows without any further message that Lazarus is dead. He weeps and groans at the sight of the sorrow which surrounds him, yet calmly gives thanks for the accomplishment of the miracle before it has been accomplished. This conjunction of the two elements is typical of the whole evangelical narrative. As portrayed in it, our Lord's life is distinctly duplex and can be consistently construed only by the help of the conception of the two natures. And just as distinctly is this life portrayed in these narratives as receiving its determination not from the human but from the divine side. If what John undertakes to depict is what was said and done by the incarnated word, no less than the synoptics essay is to present the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. Is what was said and done by the incarnated word, no less what the synoptics essay is to present the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. It is distinctly a supernatural life that he is represented by them all as living, and the human aspect of it is treated by each alike as an incident in something more exalted, by which it is permitted rather than on which it imposes itself. Though passed as far as was befitting within the limits of humanity, this life remains at all times the life of God manifest in the flesh, and as depicted by the evangelists, never escapes beyond the boundaries set by what was suitable to it as such. The actual instances of our Lord's foresight, which are recorded by the evangelists, are not very numerous outside of those which concern the establishment of the kingdom of God, with which alone, of course, their narratives are particularly engaged. Even the few instances of specific exhibitions of foreknowledge of what we may call trivial events owe their record to some connection with this great work. Examples are afforded by the foresight that the casting of the nets at the exact time and place indicated by our Lord would secure a draught of fishes that the first fish that Peter would take when he threw his hook into the sea would be one which had swallowed a stator, that on entering a given village the disciples would find an ass tied and a colt with it, whose owners would be obedient to our Lord's request, and that on entering Jerusalem to make ready for the final Passover feast, they should meet a man bearing a pitcher prepared to serve the master's needs. In instances like these, the interlacing of prevision and provision is very intimate, and doubt arises whether they illustrate most distinctively our Lord's divine foresight or his control of events. In other instances, the element of foresight comes perhaps more purely forward. Such are possibly the predictions of the offence of the disciples, the denial of Peter and the treachery of Judas. There may be added the whole series of utterances in which our Lord shows a comprehensive foresight of the career of those whom he called to his service, and also that other series in which he exhibits a like full foreknowledge of the entire history of the kingdom of God in the world. It is, however, particularly with reference to his own work in establishing the kingdom, and in regard to the nature of that work, that stress is particularly laid upon the completeness of his foreknowledge. His entire career, as we have seen, is represented by all the evangelists as lying plainly before him from the beginning, with every detail clearly marked and provided for. It is especially, however, with reference to the three great events in which his work in establishing his kingdom is summed up, his death, his resurrection, his return, 
that the predictions become numerous, if we may not even say constant. Each of the evangelists represents him, for example, as foreseeing his death from the start, and as so ordering his life as to march steadfastly forward to it as its chosen climax. Compare, for example, Vrida, page 84. It is accordingly the meaning of Mark that Jesus journeys to Jerusalem because it is his will to die there. He is represented, therefore, as avoiding all that could lead up to it for a time, and then, when he was ready for it, as setting himself steadfastly to bring it about as he would, as speaking of it only guardedly at first and afterwards, when the time was ripe for it, as setting about assiduously to prepare his disciples for it. Similarly, with respect to his resurrection, he is reported as having it in mind, indeed, from the earliest days of his ministry, but adverting to it with pedagogical care, so as to prepare rather than confuse the minds of his disciples. The same in substance may be said with reference to his return. A survey of chronological order of the passages in which he is reported as speaking of these three great events of the future cannot fail to leave a distinct impression on the mind, not only of the large space they occupy in the evangelical narrative, but of the great place they take as foreseen according to the narrative in the life and work of our Lord. In the following list, the passages in which he adverts to his death stand in the order given them in Robinson's Harmony of the Gospels. John 2.19, 3.14, Matthew 12.40, compare 16.4, Luke 11.32, Luke 12.49 and 50, Matthew 9.15, Mark 2.19, Luke 5.34, John 6.51, 76 to 78, Matthew 16.21, Mark 8.31, Luke 9.22, Luke 9.31, Matthew 17.17, 17, Mark 9.12, Matthew 17.22 and 23, Mark 9.31, Luke 9.44, Luke 9.51, John 7.34, 8.21 and 25, 9.5, 10.11 and 15, Luke 13.32, 17.25, Matthew 20.18 and 19, Mark 10.33, Luke 18.31, John 12.28, Matthew 20.26, Mark 10.38, Matthew 20.28, Mark 10.45, Matthew 21.39, Mark 12.8, Luke 20.14, John 20.23, Matthew 26.2, John 13.1, 13.23, Matthew 26.28, Mark 14.26, Luke 22.20, Matthew 26.31, Mark 14.27, John 14.25, John 15.13, 16.5, 16.16, 18.11, Matthew 26.54, John 18.11, Luke 24.26 and 46. The following allusions to his resurrection are in the same order. John 2.19, Matthew 12.40, Luke 11.30, Matthew 16.21, Mark 8.31, Luke 9.22. Matthew 17.9, Mark 9.9, 9, Matthew 17.23, Mark 9.31, John 10.18, 16.16, 16, Matthew 20.17, Mark 10.34, Luke 18.33, Matthew 26.32, Mark 14.28, Matthew 28.6, Luke 24.8, Luke 24.46. The following are, in like order, the allusions to his return. Matthew 10.23, 16.27, Mark 8, 38, 9, 1, Luke 9, 26 and 27, Luke 10, 40, 17, 22, Matthew 19, 28, 23, 38, 24, 3, Mark 13, 4, Luke 21, 6, 24, 34 to 37, Mark 13, 30, Luke 21, 32, Matthew 24, 44, 25, 31, 26, 64, Mark 14, 62, Luke 22, 69. The most cursory examination of these series of passages in their setting, and especially in their distribution through the evangelical narrative, will evince the cardinal place which the eschatological element takes in the life of the Lord as depicted in the Gospels. In particular, it will be impossible to escape the conviction that it is distinctly the teaching of the evangelists that Jesus came into the world specifically to die, and ordered his whole life wittingly to that end. As Dr. Denny puts it, Christ's death is not an incident of his life, it is the aim of it. The laying down of his life is not an accident in his career, it is his vocation. It is that in which the divine purpose of his life is revealed. 
If there was a period in his life during which he had other thoughts, it is antecedent to that at which we have any knowledge of him. Nothing could therefore be more at odds with the consentient and constant representations of the evangelists than to speak of the shadow of the cross as only somewhat late in his history beginning to fall athwart our Lord's pathway, of the idea that his earthly career should close in gloom as distinctly emerging in the teaching of Jesus only at a comparatively late period, and as therefore presumably not earlier clear in his mind, unless indeed it be the accompanying more general judgment that there was nothing extraordinary or supernatural in Jesus for knowledge of his death, and that his prophecy was but the expression of a mind which knew that it could not cease to be obedient while his enemies would not cease to be hostile. It is not less unwarranted to speak of him as bowing to his fate only as the very will of God, to which he yielded himself up at the very end, only with difficulty, and at best against his will. Such expressions as these, however, advise us that a very different conception from that presented by the evangelists has found widespread acceptance among a class of modern scholars whose efforts have been devoted to giving our Lord's life on earth a character more normally human than it seems to possess as it lies on the pages of the evangelists. The negative principle of the new constructions offered of the course and springs of our Lord's career being rejection of the account given by the evangelists, these scholars are thrown back for guidance very much upon their own subjective estimate of probabilities. The Gospels are, however, the sole sources of information for the events of our Lord's life, and it is impossible to decline their aid altogether. Few, accordingly, have been able to discard entirely the general framework of the life of Christ they present. Most have derived enough from the Gospels to assume that a crisis of some sort occurred at Caesarea Philippi, where the evangelists represent our Lord as beginning formally and frankly to prepare his disciples for his death. Great differences arise at once, however, over what this crisis was. Schenker supposes that it was only at this point in his ministry that Jesus began to think himself the Messiah. Strauss is willing to believe he suspected himself to be the Messiah earlier and supposes that he now first began to proclaim himself such. P. V. Schmidt and Lubstein imagined that on this day he both put the messianic crown upon his head and faced death looming in his path. Weizsäcker and Keim allow that he thought and proclaimed himself the Messiah from the beginning, and suppose that what is new here is that only now did he come to see with clearness that his ministry would end in his death, and as death for the Messiah means return, they add that here he begins his proclamation of his return in glory. To this Schenker and Haser find difficulty in assenting, feeling it impossible that the founder of a spiritual kingdom should look forward to its consummation in a physical one, and insisting, therefore, that though Jesus may well have predicted the destruction of his enemies, he can scarcely have foretold his own coming in glory. On the other hand, Strauss and Bauer judge that a prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem too closely resembles what actually occurred not to be a post-eventum, but see no reason why Jesus should not have dreamed of coming back on the clouds of heaven. As to his death, Strauss thinks he began to anticipate it only shortly before his last journey to Jerusalem, while Holsten cannot believe that he realized what was before him until he actually arrived at Jerusalem, and even then he did not acquiesce in it. So, Spitter. That he went to Jerusalem for the purpose of dying, neither Weissecker nor Brandt nor H. Holtzmann nor Schulzen will admit though the two last named allow that he foresaw that the journey would end in his death, or at least that it possibly would, adds Punja, since, of course, a possibility of success lay open to him. As many men, so many opinions. As the positive principle of construction in all these schemes of life for Jesus is de-supernaturalization, they differ so far as the prophetic element in his teaching, as reported by the evangelists, is concerned, chiefly in the measure in which they explain it as due more or less entirely to the evangelists carrying their own ideas, or the ideas of the community in which they lived, back into Jesus' mouth, or allow it more or less fully to Jesus indeed, but only in a form which can be thought of as not rising from the natural prognostications of a man in his position. A few deny to Jesus the entire series of predictions reported in the Gospels, and assign them in mass to the thought of the later community. A few, on the other hand, allow the whole or nearly the whole series to Jesus and explain them all naturalistically. Most take an intermediate position, determined by the principle that all which seems to each critic incapable of naturalistic explanation as utterances of Jesus shall be assigned to later origin. 
Accordingly, the concrete details in the alleged predictions are quite generally denied to Jesus and represented as easily explicable modifications in accordance with the actual course of events of what Jesus really said. The prediction of resurrection on the third day, for example, is held by many to be too precise a determination and is therefore excluded from the prophecy or explained as only a periphrasis for an indefinite short time after the analogy of Hosea 6.2. To others, a prediction of a resurrection at all seems incredible, and it is transmuted into at most a premonition of future victory. By yet others, even the anticipation of death is doubted, and nothing of forecasts is left to Jesus except possibly a vague anticipation of difficulty and suffering. While with others, even this gives way, and Jesus is represented as passing either the greater part of his life or the whole of it in joyful expectation of more or less unbroken success, or, at least, however thickly the clouds gathered over his head in inextinguishable hope in God and his interposition in his behalf. Thus, over against the dogmatic view of the life of Christ, set forth in the evangelists, according to which Jesus came into the world to die, and which is dominated therefore by foresight, is set, in polar opposition to it, a new view, calling itself historical, the principle of which is the denial to Jesus of any foresight whatever, beyond the most limited human forecast. No pretense is ordinarily made that this new view is given support by the evangelical records. It is put forward on a priori or general grounds, as, for example, the only psychologically possible view. It professes to find it incredible that Jesus entered upon his ministry with any other expectation than success. Contact with men, however, it allows, brought gradually the discovery of a hopelessness of drawing them to his spiritual ideals. The growing enmity of the rulers opened before him the prospect of disaster, and thus there came to him the slow recognition, first of the possibility and then of the certainty of failure or at least, since failure was impossible for the mission he had come to perform, of the necessity of passing through suffering to the ultimate success. So slowly was the readjustment to this new point of view made, that even at the end, as the prayer at Gethsemane shows, there remained a lingering hope that the extremity of death might be avoided. So far as a general sketch can be made of a view presented by its several adherents with great variety of detail, this is the essential fabric of the new view. Only such parts of the predictive element of the teaching attributed to Jesus in the Gospels as are thought capable of naturalistic interpretation are incorporated into this new construction. By those who wish to bring in as much as possible, it is said, for example, that our Lord was too firmly persuaded of his messianic appointment and function, and was too clear that this function centered in the establishment of the kingdom to accept death itself as failure. When he perceived death impending, that meant to him, therefore, return and return to bring in the messianic glory meant resurrection. When he thought and spoke of death, therefore, he necessarily thought and spoke also of resurrection and return. The three went inevitably together, and if he anticipated the one, he must have anticipated the others also. Under this general scheme, all sorts of opinions are held as to when, how, and under what impulses Jesus formed and taught this eschatological program. As notable a construction as any holds that he first became certain of his messiahship in an ecstatic vision which accompanied his baptism, that the messiah must suffer, was already borne in upon his conviction in the course of his temptation, but it was not until the scene at Caesarea Philippi that he attained the happy assurance that the messianic glory lay behind the dreadful death impending over him. This great conviction, attained in principle in the ecstasy of that moment, was, nevertheless, only gradually assimilated. When Jesus was laboring with his disciples, he was laboring also with himself. In this particular construction, it is or Holtzmann's, an element of ecstasy is introduced. More commonly, the advances Jesus is supposed to make in his anticipations are thought to rest on processes of formal reasoning. In either case, he is pictured as only slowly under the stress of compelling circumstances, reaching convictions of what awaited him in the future, and thus he is conceived distinctly as the victim rather than as the lord of his destiny. So far from entering the world to die and by his death to save the world, and in his own good time and way accomplishing this great mission, he enters life set upon living and only yields step by step reluctantly to the hard fate which inexorably closes upon him. 
that he clings through all to his conviction of his messiahship and adjusts his hope of accomplishing his messianic mission to the overmastering pressure of circumstances, is that not a pathetic trait of human nature? Do not all enthusiasts the like? Is it not precisely the mark of their fanaticism? The plain fact is, if we may express it in the brutal frankness of common speech, in this view of Jesus' career, he miscalculated and failed, and then naturally sought, or his followers sought for him, to save the failure, or the appearance of failure, by inventing a new denouement for the career he had hoped for in vain, a new denouement which has it failed too. Most of our modern theorizers are impelled to recognize that it too has failed, when Jesus so painfully adjusted himself to the hard destiny which more and more obtruded itself upon his recognition, he taught that death was but an incident in his career, and after death would come the victory. Can we believe that he foresaw that thousands of years would intervene between what he represented as but an apparent catastrophe and the glorious reversal to which he directed his own and his followers' eyes? On the contrary, he expected and he taught that he would come back soon, certainly before the generation which had witnessed his apparent defeat had passed away, and that he would then establish that messianic kingdom which from the beginning of his ministry he had unvaryingly taught was at hand. He did not do so. Is there any reason to believe that he ever will return? Can the foresight which has repeatedly failed so miserably be trusted still, for what we choose to separate out from the mass of his expectations as the core of the matter. On what grounds shall we adjust the discredited foresight to the course of events, obviously unforeseen by him since his death? Where is the end of these adjustments? Have we not already, with adjustment after adjustment, transformed beyond recognition the expectations of Jesus, even the latest and fullest to which he attained, and transmuted them into something fundamentally different? passed in a word so far beyond him that we retain only an artificial connection with him and his real teaching, a connection mediated by little more than a word, that in this modern construction we have the precise contradictory of the conception of Jesus and of the course of his life on earth given us by the evangelists, it needs no argument to establish. In the gospel presentation, foresight is made the principle of our Lord's career. In the modern view, he is credited with no foresight whatever. At best, he was possessed by a fixed conviction of his messianic mission, whether gained in ecstatic vision, as, for example, O. Holzmann, or acquired in deep religious experiences, as, for example, Schwarzkopf. And he felt an assurance based on this ineradicable conviction that in his own good time and way, God would work that mission out for him, and in this assurance he went faithfully onwards, fulfilling his daily task, bungling, meanwhile, egregiously in his reading of the scroll of destiny which was unrolling for him. It is an intensely, even an exaggeratedly, human Christ which is here offered us, and he stands therefore in the strongest contrast with the frankly divine Christ which the Gospels present to us. On what grounds can we be accepted to substitute this for that? Certainly not on grounds of historical record. We have no historical record of the self-consciousness of Jesus except that embodied in the gospel dramatization of his life and the gospel report of his teaching, and that record expressly contradicts at every step this modern reconstruction of its contents and development. The very principle of the modern construction is reversal of the gospel delineation. Its particularity is that, though it calls itself the historical view, it has behind it no single scrap of historical testimony. The entirety of historical evidence contradicts it flatly. Are we to accept it, then, on the general grounds of inherent probability and rational construction? It is historically impossible that the great religious movement which we call Christianity could have taken its origin and derived its inspiration, an inspiration far from spent after two thousand years, from such a figure as this Jesus. The plain fact is that in these modern reconstructions we have nothing but a sustained attempt to construct a naturalistic Jesus, and their chief interest is that they bring before us with unwanted clearness the kind of being the man must have been who at that time, and in those circumstances, could have come forward making the claims which Jesus made without supernatural nature, endowment, or aid to sustain him. The value of the speculation is that it makes superabundantly clear that no such being could have occupied the place which the historical Jesus occupied, could have made the impression on his followers which the historical Jesus made, could have become the source of the stream of religious influence which we call Christianity, 
as the historical Jesus became. The clear formulation of the naturalistic hypothesis in the construction of a naturalistic Jesus, in other words, throws us violently back upon the divine Jesus of the evangelists as the only Jesus that is historically possible. From this point of view, the labors of the scholars who have with infinite pains built up this construction of Jesus' life and development have not been in vain. What then is to be said of the predictions of Jesus and especially of the three great series of prophecies of his death, resurrection and return with respect to their contents and fulfillment? This is not the place to discuss the eschatology of Jesus, but a few general remarks seem not uncalled for. The topic has received of late much renewed attention with very varied results, the number and variety of constructions proposed having been greatly increased above what the inherent difficulty of the subject will account for by the freedom with which the scripture data have been modified or set aside on so-called critical grounds by the several investigators. Nevertheless, most of the new interpretations also may be classified under the old categories of futuristic, preteristic and spiritualistic. The spiritualistic interpretation, whose method of dealing with our Lord's predictions readily falls in with a widespread theory that it is contrary to the spirit and manner of genuine prophecy to predict actual circumstances like a soothsayer, has received a new impulse through its attractive presentation by Erich Haupt. Christ's eschatology, says Haupt, is infinitely simple, and all that he predicts is to be accomplished in a heavenly way which passes our comprehension. There is no soothsaying in his utterances, nowhere any predictions of external occurrences, everywhere only great moral religious laws which must operate everywhere and always, while nothing is said of the form in which they must act. A considerable stir has been created also by the revival, by Weifenbach, of the identification of the return of Christ with his resurrection, although this view has retained few adherents since its refutation by Schwarzkopf, whose own view is its exact contrary, viz. that by his resurrection Jesus meant just his return. The general conception, however, that for Jesus the hope of resurrection and the thought of return fell together, so that when Jesus spoke of his resurrection he was thinking of his return, and vice versa, is very widely held. The subsidiary hypothesis, first suggested by Colani, of the inclusion in the great eschatological discourse attributed by the evangelists to our Lord of a little apocalypse of Jewish or Jewish-Christian origin, by which Weifenbach eased his task, has in more or less modified form received the widest acceptance, but rests on no more solid grounds. Most adherents of the modern school are clear that Jesus expected and asserted that he would return in messianic glory for the consummation of the kingdom, and most of them are equally clear that in this expectation and assertion Jesus was mistaken. In the expectation that the kingdom was soon to come, says Oskar Holtzmann in a passage typical enough of this whole school of exposition, Jesus erred in a human way, and in such passages as Mark 9.1, 13.30, Matthew 10.23, he considers that the error is obvious. He adds that such an error on the part of Jesus concerning not a side issue but a fundamental point of his faith, his first proclamation began, according to Mark 1.15, with the peplerote o que ros que egiken e vasilia to theu. Does not facilitate faith in Jesus is self-evident, but this error of Jesus is for his church a highly instructive and therefore highly valuable warning to distinguish between the temporary and the permanent in the work of Jesus. Not everyone, even of this school, can go, however, quite this length. Even Schwarzkopf, while allowing that Jesus erred in this matter, wishes on that very account to think of the mere definition of times and seasons as belonging to the form rather than to the essence of his teaching and in that Baldensperger is in substantial agreement with him. From the other side, E. Haupt urges that Jesus must be supposed to have been able to avoid all errors, at least in the religious sphere, even if they concern nothing but the form, while Weifenbach thinks we should hesitate to suppose Jesus could have erred in too close a definition of the time of his advent, when he expressly confesses that he was ignorant of its time. Probably Fritz Barth stands alone in cutting the knot by appealing to the conditionality of all prophecy. According to him, Jesus did indeed predict his return as coincident with the destruction of Jerusalem, but all genuine prophecy is conditioned upon the conduct of the human agents involved. Between prediction and fulfillment, the conduct of man intrudes as a co-determining factor on which the fulfillment depends. 
Thus, this prediction has not failed, but its fulfilment has only been postponed. In accordance, it must be confessed, not with the will of God, but with that of man. It is difficult to see how Jesus is thus shielded from the imputation of defective foresight, but at least Barth is able on this view still to look for a return of the Lord. The difficulty which the passages in our Saviour's teaching under discussion present to the reverent expositor is, of course, not to be denied or minimized, but surely this difficulty would need to be much more hopeless than it is before it could compel or justify the assumption of error in one who has never been convicted of error in anything else. Sanday in Hastings Bible Dictionary 2, 635, the whole passage should be read. The problem that faces us in this matter, it is apparent, in the meantime, is not one which can find its solution as a corollary to a speculative general view of our Lord's self-consciousness, its contents and development. It is distinctly a problem of exegesis. We should be very sure that we know fully and precisely all that our Lord has declared about his return, its what and how and when, before we venture to suggest, even to our most intimate thought, that he has committed so gross an error as to its what and how and when, as is so often assumed, especially as he has in the most solemn manner declared concerning precisely the words under consideration that heaven and earth shall pass away, but not his words. It will be sad if the passage of time has shown this declaration also to be mistaken. Meanwhile, the perfect foresight of our Lord, asserted and illustrated by all the evangelists, certainly cannot be set aside by the facile assumption of an error on his part in a matter in which it is so difficult to demonstrate an error, and in which assumptions of all sorts are so little justified. For the detailed discussion of our Lord's eschatology, including the determination of his meaning in these utterances, reference must, however, be made to works treating expressly of this subject. End of Foresight by B.B. Warfield The Resurrection of Christ, A Fundamental Doctrine by B.B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It has been customary in the past to look upon the resurrection of Jesus as the very citadel of the Christian position. Friend and foe have been at one in so regarding it. Upon it, as his Gibraltar, the Christian man has entrenched himself. It has seemed to him to be the rock on which he could securely build the house of his faith, and upon which the rain may descend, and the floods come, and the winds blow without effect. Similarly, it has seemed to the assailants of Christianity that so long as this rock stood unconquered, all their enginery was in vain. It appears now that all this was a mistake. The importance of the resurrection of Christ, we are told, has been greatly exaggerated. It is not denied that from the beginning Christians have looked to it as their support and stay. It is not denied that it has been their enthusiastic conviction of its reality that has from the first enheartened them in their Christian living and given force to their proclamation of the gospel. Professor Hanak, for example, allows that the firm confidence of the disciples in Jesus was rooted in their belief that he did not abide in death but was raised by God, and that their conviction of his resurrection, because it was the pledge of the resurrection of all believers, became the mightiest power through which the gospel has won humanity. But he thinks it a matter of profound indifference to us whether this conviction was sound or a delusion. The conviction of having seen the Lord, he tells us, was no doubt of the greatest importance for the disciples and made them evangelists. But what they saw cannot immediately help us. To believe on the ground of appearances that others have had is a frivolity which will always revenge itself through rising doubts. It can indeed never be necessary to have faith in a fact. Religious belief must not hang on history and must be independent of all facts which would hold good apart from that belief. Whether Christ rose from the dead cannot, therefore, be of moment to the Christian. All that is of any significance is the religious conviction that he was not swallowed up in death, but passed through suffering and death to glory, that is, to life, power, and honor. Faith has nothing to do with the knowledge and the form in which Jesus lives, but only the conviction that he is the living Lord. And in the case of the resurrection of Christ, this detachment from history is especially well for Christianity. 
For there is really no sound reason for believing that Jesus rose from the dead in the literal sense which has been attached to those words. The mere fact that friends and adherents of Jesus were convinced that they had seen him gives to those who are in earnest about fixing historical facts not the least ground for the assumption that Jesus did not continue in the grave. The candid historian will indeed feel bound to surrender the fact of the bodily resurrection of Christ to the assaults of recent criticism. The effect of this new attitude toward the resurrection of Christ, if it could be justified, would obviously be to turn the flank of the Christian position. Christianity has concentrated her defence at this impregnable point and feels herself safe until it be captured. The new foeman bows politely and declares that he prefers to enter the Christian domain by some other road, the so-called Gibraltar, if it be rock at all, and not a mere stage construction of lathes and brown cloth, holds no key position and may best be simply neglected. Christianity is not built on the rock of fact in any case, he tells us. It is a castle in the air, adjusting itself readily as it floats over the rough surface and solid earth to all sorts of inequalities and changes of ground, and is best entered by disengaging ourselves from the soil and soaring lightly into its higher precincts. No doubt the professed purpose of this new determination of the relation of Christianity to fact is to render Christianity forever unassailable from the point of view of historical science. If it is independent of all details of history, it cannot be wounded through the critical reconstruction of the historical events which accompanied its origin. But the obvious actual effect of it is to destroy altogether all that has hitherto been known as Christianity. The entire detachment of Christianity from the realm of fact simply dismisses it into the realm of unreality. Men may still call it by the name of Christianity, the possibly iridescent dream which still remains to them, but a Christianity which stands out of relation to historical facts is plainly a very different thing from the old Christianity, all of whose doctrines are facts, and which was, above all things, rooted in historical occurrences. And this is particularly apparent with regard to the facts of the resurrection of Jesus. If Christianity is entirely indifferent to the reality of this fact, then Christianity is something wholly different from what it was conceived to be by its founders and from what it is still believed to be by its adherents. It is to be borne in mind that neither Professor Hanak nor the more radical members of the school he so brilliantly represents ventures to deny that the conviction of the reality of Christ's bodily resurrection formed the centre of the faith of the founders of Christianity. It would certainly be difficult for any candid mind to doubt a fact so broadly spread upon the surface of the New Testament record. Our Lord himself deliberately staked his whole claim upon his resurrection. When asked for a sign, he repeatedly pointed to this sign as his single and sufficient credential. John 2.19, Matthew 12.40 The earliest proclaimers of the gospel conceived witnessing to the resurrection of their master as their primary function. Acts 1.22, 2.32, 4.33, 10.41, 17.18 the lively hope and steadfast faith that sprang up within them, they ascribed to its power, 1 Peter 1, 3, 1, 21, 3, 21. Paul's whole gospel was the gospel of the risen Saviour. To his call he ascribes his own apostleship, and to his working all the elements of the Christian faith and life. There are, in particular, two passages in his epistles, which in an almost startling way reveal the supreme place which was then ascribed to the resurrection of Christ. In a context of very special power, he declares roundly that if Christ hath not been raised, the apostolic preaching and the Christian faith are alike vanity, and those who have believed in Christ lie yet unrelieved of their sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 14-17. His meaning is that the resurrection of Christ occupied the centre of the gospel that was preached by him and all the apostles, and that have been received by all Christians, so that if this resurrection should prove to be not a real occurrence, the preachers are convicted of being false witnesses of God, the faith founded on their preaching is proved an empty thing, and the hopes conceived on its basis are rendered void. Here Paul implicates with himself the whole Christian community, teachers and taught alike, as suspending Christianity on the resurrection of Christ as its fundamental fact. And so confident is he of universal accord on the indispensableness of this fact to the very existence of Christianity, that he uses it as his sole fulcrum for prying back the doctrine of the resurrection of believers into its proper place in the faith and hearts of his sceptical readers. 
If dead men are not raised, neither hath Christ been raised, is his one argument, and he plies it as one who knows full well that none will deny the one if it be seen to involve the denial of the other. In some respects, even more striking are the implications of such phraseology as one meets in a passage like Philippians 3.10. Here the Apostle is contrasting all the gains of the flesh with the one gain of the Spirit, Christ Jesus the Lord. As over against the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ his Lord, he declares that he esteems all things as but refuse, the heap of leavings from the feast that is swept from the table for the dogs, if only he may gain Christ and be found in him. If only, he repeats, he may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming conformed to his death, if by any means he may attain unto the resurrection from the dead. The structure of the passage represents the very essence of the saving knowledge of Christ to reside in knowing the power of his resurrection. That is to say, Paul finds the center of gravity of the Christian life, no less than of the Christian faith in the fact of the resurrection of Christ. It would seem then as if it would not be easy for Christians of today to ascribe to the resurrection of Christ a place more fundamental to Christianity than was given it by the first preachers and authoritative founders of Christianity. We are possibly more apt to fail to apprehend the variety of the aspects in which it presented itself to them as lying at the very roots of their Christian faith. It will therefore doubtless repay us to remind ourselves cursorily of some of the various ways in which the resurrection of our Lord evinces itself as fundamental to the Christian religion. It is natural to think, first of all, of the place of this great fact in Christian apologetics. It is quite obvious that it is the fundamental fact of Christianity from this point of view. Opinions may conceivably differ as to whether, as mere abstract proposition, it would have been possible to believe in Christianity as a supernaturally given religion had Christ remained holden of the grave. But it is scarcely disputable that, in the actual circumstances, his failure to rise again would have thrown the gravest doubt on the validity of his claims. And it admits of no doubt whatever that the fact that he did rise again, being once established, supplies an irrefragable demonstration of the supernatural origin of Christianity, of the validity of Christ's claim to be the Son of God, and of the trustworthiness of his teaching as a messenger from God to man. In the light of this stupendous miracle, all hesitation as to the supernatural accompaniments of the life that preceded it, or of the succeeding establishment of the religion to which its seal had been set, nay, of the whole preparation for the coming of the messenger of God, who was to live and die and rise again, becomes unreasonable and absurd. The religion of Christ is stamped at once from heaven as divine, and all marks of divinity in its preparation, accompaniments and sequence become at once congruous and natural. And as the resurrection of Christ is, despite Professor Harnack's scoffs, the most certain fact in the history of the world, attested as it is by evangelists and apostles, by Paul himself and the five hundred brethren whom he summons as co-witnesses with him, by the course of events itself which otherwise would remain inexplicable, by the monument of the Christian Sabbath persisting as its witness through all ages, by the visible power of God sealing the testimony of his servants through his efficient working in the hearts and before the eyes of many, and by the divine success and progress of the gospel and the resurrection in the first age and throughout all subsequent ages, so no fact can be conceived of more power to break down opposition to the strange doctrines of Christianity and to vanquish the world before its divine Lord. From the empty grave of Jesus the enemies of the cross turn away in unconcealable dismay. Those whom the force of no logic can convince, and whose hearts are steeled against the appeal of almighty love from the cross itself, quail before the irresistible power of this simple fact. Christ has risen from the dead. After two thousand years of the most determined assault upon the evidence which demonstrates it, the fact stands. And so long as it stands, Christianity too must stand as the one supernatural religion. But the fact of Christ's resurrection holds no more fundamental place in Christian apologetics than it does in the revelation of life and immortality which Christianity brings to a dying world. By it, the veil of sense was lifted and men were permitted to experience the reality of that other world to which we are all journeying. We cannot begin to estimate the value to those first disciples who were to live in the world as part of it while they held their real citizenship in heaven, to become fellows with Christ in his sufferings and be made conformable to his death, of the visible and tangible proof which was given them by the presence of the resurrected Lord with them for forty days, of the reality of the life beyond the grave. 
This association with one who had died and yet lived, lived not through a return to earthly life like Lazarus, but in the power of his endless life, could not but revolutionize their consciousnesses and enable them to endure as those who had actually seen the invisible. No wonder that thereafter it seemed as if death had no terrors for these men. If they had not all, like Paul, been caught up to the seventh heaven, heaven had been brought down to them, and had been made to enter into their most intimate experiences. They knew that there was life on the other side of death, that the grave was but a sojourning place, that, though their earthly dust-dwellers were dissolved, they had a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And those of us who come later may see with their eyes and handle with their hands the word of life. We can no longer speak of a bourne from which no traveller ever returns. The middle wall of partition has been broken down and the boundary become but an invisible line by the resurrection of Christ. That he who died has been raised again and ever lives in the form of a complete humanity is the fundamental fact in the revelation of the Christian doctrine of immortality. Equally fundamental is the place which Christ's resurrection occupies relatively to our confidence in his claims, his teachings, and his promises. By it the seal was set to all the instructions which he gave, and to all the hopes which he awakened. He himself staked, as we have seen, his credit on his rising again. He declared that no sign should be given that adulterous generation but the sign of Jonah, and that he would restore in three days the destroyed temple of his body. Had the sign failed, all his claims would have fallen with it. And as the sign did not fail, but after three days he returned from the bowels of the earth according to his word, he has evinced his ability to perform all his words. It is he that had power to lay down his life and take it up again, who has said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, who has promised to be with those that serve him, always even unto the end of the world, who has announced to them the forgiveness of their sins, it is another instance of the challenge whether it is easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say arise and walk. That he could not be holden of death, but arose in the power of his deathless life, gives us to know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. And the fulfilment of these explicit predictions do but point us to a deeper fact. The Lord of life could not succumb to death. Had Christ not risen, we could not believe him to be what he declared himself when he made himself equal with God but he has risen in the confirmation of all his claims. By it alone, but by it thoroughly, is he manifested as the very Son of God who has come into the world to reconcile the world to himself. It is the fundamental fact of the Christian's unwavering confidence in all the words of this life. There is even a deeper truth than this. The resurrection of Christ is fundamental to the Christian's assurance that Christ's work is complete and redemption is accomplished. Our stripes were laid upon him, and he bowed his head and died. And is that all? Is it enough to say that he was delivered up for our trespasses? Or must we not be able to add that he was raised for our justification? Else what would assure us that he was able to pay the penalty and deliver those who were bound? That he died manifests his love and his willingness to save. That he rose again manifests his power and his ability to save. We are not saved by a dead Christ who undertook but could not perform, and who lies there still under the Syrian sky, another martyr of impotent love. If we are to be saved at all, it must be by one who did not merely pass to death in our behalf, but who passed through death. If the penalty was fully paid by him, it cannot have broken him. It must needs have broken upon him. Had he not emerged from the tomb, all our hopes, all our salvation, would be lying dead with him unto this day. But as we see him issue from the grave, we see ourselves issue with him in newness of life. Now we know that his shoulders were strong enough to bear the burden that was laid upon them, and that he is able to save to the uttermost all that come unto God through him. The resurrection of Christ is thus the indispensable evidence of his completed work, his accomplished redemption. It was just because he rose again that we know that the full penalty was paid, the ransom was sufficient, the work was done, the sacrifice was accepted, and we have been bought with a price and are his purchased possession forever. Because Christ has risen, we no more judge that if one died for all, then all died, that the body of sin might be done away with, than we know that having died with him, we shall also live with him, with him who being raised from the dead dieth no more. 
In one word, the resurrection of Christ is fundamental to the Christian hope and to the Christian confidence. All our assurance of salvation is suspended on this fact. It is but to concentrate our views upon one element of this hope when we note specifically that the resurrection of Christ is fundamental to our expectation of ourselves rising from the dead. That he rose from the dead manifests the salvation which he brings to man as one who works through supernatural power and produces supernatural effects. And we have not exhausted the scriptural view of the power of his resurrection until we perceive that his resurrection drags ours in its train. When he arose, men saw the great spectacle of the conquest of death, the reversal of the curse pronounced on man's sin, the presentation to God of the first fruits from the grave. When he arose, it was not merely as an individual who had burst the bonds of death. As Paul's language suggests, the resurrection of the dead had come. Romans 1.4. It was the beginning of a great harvest. In Christ's resurrection, therefore, the Christian man sees the earnest and pledge of his own resurrection, and by it he is enheartened as he lays away the bodies of those dear to him, not sorrowing as the rest that have no hope, but with hearts swelling with glad anticipations of the day when they shall rise to meet their Lord. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also that are fallen asleep in Jesus will he bring with him. Had Christ not risen from the dead, we could nourish so great a hope that what is sown in corruption shall be raised in incorruption, what is sown in dishonor shall be raised in glory, what is sown in weakness shall be raised in power, what is sown a body under the dominance of a sinful self shall be raised a body wholly the servant of the Spirit of God. It is not evident that the resurrection of Christ is fundamental to the Christian's hope that the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. We have touched only on some of the outstanding aspects of the bearing of the resurrection of Christ on our Christian faith and life, but enough has been said to show that we have in it a decisive proof of the divine origin of Christianity, a revolutionary revelation of the reality of immortality, a demonstration of the truth of all Christ's claims and the trustworthiness of all his promises, an assurance of the perfection of his saving work, and a pledge of our own resurrection. Are these things not fundamental to Christianity? If we can be content with a Christianity without them, we may satisfy ourselves with a Christianity to which it is indifferent whether Christ actually rose from the dead. A Christianity which can dispense with the immediately supernatural to which the pre-existence and the proper deity of Christ are unknown, which discards the expiatory work of Christ and which looks for no resurrection of the body, may readily enough do without the fact of the resurrection of Christ. But when it comes to that, may we not also do very well without such a Christianity? What has it to offer to the sin-stricken human soul? What is it to him to be assured that one lived two thousand years ago, the aroma of whose holy life shines through all the rust of the ages and impresses the observer of it with the conviction that he must have found a God of love with whom he could walk in the midst of this world of thorns? Here and now, in his own heart, he finds a God of justice, where wrath is inextinguishably revealed against all unrighteousness. Enough for us that, for a Christianity which will meet the needs of sinful man, a Christianity which does not offer him merely the impression of a holy life, but provides him with salvation by a divine Redeemer, a resurrected Lord, is indispensable. The fact of the resurrection of Christ is, in a word, certainly fundamental to a Christianity that saves. End of The Resurrection of Christ, A Fundamental Doctrine by B.B. B. Warfield The Resurrection of Christ, An Historical Fact, Evinced by Eyewitnesses, by B.B. B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It is a somewhat difficult matter to distinguish between Christian doctrines and facts. The doctrines of Christianity are doctrines only because they are facts, and the facts of Christianity become its most indispensable doctrines. The incarnation of the eternal God is necessarily a dogma. No human eye could witness his stooping to man's estate. No human tongue could bear witness to it as a fact. And yet, if it be not a fact, our faith is in vain. We are yet in our sins. On the other hand, the resurrection of Christ is a fact, an external occurrence within the cognizance of men, to be established by their testimony. 
and yet it is the cardinal doctrine of our system, on it all other doctrines hang. There have been some indeed who have refused to admit the essential importance of this fact to our system, and even so considerable a critic as Keim has announced himself as occupying this standpoint. Strauss saw, however, with a more unclouded eye, truly declaring the fact of Christ's resurrection to be the centre of the centre, the real heart of Christianity, on which its truth stands or falls. To this indeed an older and deeper thinker than Strauss had long ago abundantly witnessed. The modern sceptic does but echo the words of the Apostle Paul. Come what may, therefore, modern scepticism must be rid of the resurrection of Christ. It has recognized the necessity, and has bent all its energies to the endeavor. But the early followers of the Saviour also themselves recognized the paramount importance of this fact, and the records of Christianity contain a mass of proof for it, of such cogent variety and convincing power, that Hume's famous dilemma, footnote, inquiry, section 10, no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavours to establish. End footnote. Recoils on his own head. It is more impossible that the laws of testimony should be so far set aside that such witness should be mistaken than that the laws of nature should be so far set aside that a man should rise from the dead. The opponents of revelation themselves being witnesses... The testimony of the historical books of the New Testament, if the testimony of eyewitnesses is amply sufficient to establish this, to them, absolutely crushing fact. It is admitted well nigh universally that the Gospels contain testimony for the resurrection of Christ, which, if it stand, proves that fact, and that if Christ rose from the dead, all motive for and all possibility of denial of any supernatural fact of Christianity is forever removed. Of course, it has become necessary then for the deniers of a supernatural origin to Christianity to impeach the credibility of these witnesses. It is admitted that if the gospel account be truly the testimony of eyewitnesses, then Christ did rise from the dead. But it is immediately added that the gospels are late compositions which first saw the light in the second century, that they represent not the testimony of eyewitnesses, but the wild dreams of a mythological fancy or the wilder inventions of unscrupulous forgery, and that therefore they are untrustworthy of credit and valueless as witnesses to fact. Thus, it is proclaimed, this alleged occurrence of the rising of Jesus from the dead is stripped of all the pretended testimony of eyewitnesses, and all discussion of the question whether it be fact or not is forever set aside, the only question remaining being that which concerns itself with the origin and propagation of this fanatical belief. It is in this position that we find scepticism entrenched, a strong position assuredly and chosen with consummate skill. It is not, however, impregnable. There are at least two courses open to us in attacking it. We may either directly storm the works, or, turning their flank, bring our weapons to bear on them from the rear. The authenticity of our Gospels is denied. We may either prove their authenticity and hence the autopic character of the testimony they contain, or we may waive all question of the books attacked, and, using only those which are by the sceptics themselves acknowledged to be genuine, prove from them that the resurrection of Christ actually occurred. The first course, as being the most direct, is the one usually adopted. Here the battle is intense, but the issue is not doubtful. Internally those books evince themselves as genuine. Not only do they proclaim a teaching absolutely original and patently divine, but they have presented a biography to the world such as no man or body of men could have concocted. No mythologists could have invented a divine human personality, assigned the exact proportions in which his divinity and humanity should be exhibited in his life, and then dramatized this character through so long a course of teaching and action without a single contradiction or inconsistency that simple peasants have succeeded in a task wherein a body of philosophers would have assuredly hopelessly failed, can be accounted for only on the hypothesis that they were simply detailing actual facts. Again, there are numerous evidently undesigned coincidences in minute points to be observed between the book of Acts and those epistles of Paul acknowledged to be genuine, which prove beyond a peradventure that book to be authentic history. The authenticity of Acts carries that of the Gospel of Luke with it, and the witness of these two establishes the resurrection. 
But aside from all internal evidence, the external evidence for the authenticity of the New Testament historical books is irrefragable. The immediate successors of the apostles possessed them all and esteemed them as the authoritative documents of their religion. One of the writers of this age, placed by Hilgenfeld in the first century, quotes Matthew as scripture. Another places Acts among the holy books, a collection containing on common terms the Old Testament and at least a large part of the New. All quote these historical books with respect and reverence. There is on external historical grounds no room left for denying the genuineness of the Gospels and Acts, and hence no room left for denying the fact of the resurrection. The result of a half-century's conflict on this line of attack has resulted in the triumphant vindication of the credibility of the Christian records. We do not propose, however, to fight this battle over again at this time. The second of the courses above pointed out has been less commonly adopted but leads to equally satisfactory results. To exhibit this is our present object. The most extreme schools of scepticism admit that the book of Revelation is by St. John, and that Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, and Galatians are genuine letters of St. Paul. Most leaders of anti-Christian thought admit other epistles also, but we wish to confine ourselves to the narrowest ground. Our present task, then, is waiving all reference to disputed books to show that the testimony of these confessedly genuine writings of the apostles is enough to establish the fact of the resurrection. We are even willing to assume narrower ground. The revelation is admitted to be written by an eyewitness of the death of Christ and the subsequent transactions, and the book of Revelation testifies to Christ's resurrection. In it, he is described as one who was dead and yet came to life chapter 2 verse 8, and as the first begotten of the dead, chapter 1 verse 5. Here then is one admitted to have been an eyewitness testifying of the resurrection. For the sake of simplifying our argument, however, we will omit the testimony of revelation and ask only what witness the four acknowledged epistles of Paul, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians and Galatians, bear to the fact that Christ rose from the dead. It is plain on the very first glance into these epistles that they have a great deal to say about this resurrection. Our task is to draw out the evidential value of their references. We would note then, in the first place, that Paul claims to be himself an eyewitness of a risen Christ. After stating as a fact that Christ rose from the dead and enumerating his various appearances to his followers, he adds, And last of all, as unto one born out of due time, he appeared to me also. 1 Corinthians 15.8 And again he bases his apostleship on this sight, saying, 1 Corinthians 9.1 Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? His sight of the Lord Jesus was, therefore, of such a kind that it constituted a call to the apostleship. It was not then a simple sight of Jesus before his crucifixion, as is also proved from the fact that it was after all the appearances which he vouchsafed after his resurrection to his other followers that Paul saw him. 1 Corinthians 15.8 It remains true then that Paul claims to be an eyewitness of the fact that Christ had risen. It will not do to say that Paul claims only to have had a theophany, as it were, a sight of Christ's spirit as living, which would not imply the resurrection of his body. As Beischlag has long ago pointed out, the whole argument of 1 Corinthians 15, being meant to prove the bodily resurrection of believers from the resurrection of Christ, necessitates the sense that Paul, like the other witnesses there adduced, saw Christ in the body. Nor is it difficult to determine when Paul claims to have seen Christ. It is admitted by all that it was this sight that produced his conversion and called him to the apostleship. According to Galatians 1.19, both calls were simultaneous. Tracing his conversion thus to and basing his apostleship on the resurrection of Christ, it is not strange that Paul has not been able to keep his epistles from bristling with marks of his intense conviction of the fact of the resurrection. Compare, for example, Romans 1, 1.4, 4, 4.24 and 25, 5, 10, 6, 4, 5, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, 7, 4, 8, 11 and 34, 10, 7 and 9, 14, 9. We cannot therefore without stultification deny that Paul was thoroughly convinced that he had seen the risen Jesus, and the skeptics themselves feel forced to admit this fact. What then shall we do with this claim of Paul to be an eyewitness? Shall we declare his sight to have been no true sight but a deceiving vision? 
Paul certainly thought it bodily and a sight, but we are told that Paul was given to seeing visions, that he was, in fact, of that enthusiastic spiritual temperament, like Francis of Assisi, for instance, which fails to distinguish between vivid subjective ideas and external facts. But while it must be admitted that Paul did see visions, all sober criticism must wholly deny that he was a visionary. Waving the fact that even Paul's visions were externally communicated to him and not the projections of a diseased imagination, as well as all general discussion of the elements of Paul's character, this visionary hypothesis is shattered on the simple fact that Paul knew the difference between this sight of Jesus and his visions, and draws the distinction sharply between them. This sight was, as he himself tells us, the last of all, and the only vision which on our opponent's principles can be attributed to him, that recorded in 2 Corinthians 12, is described by Paul in such a manner as to draw the contrast very strongly between his confidence in this sight and his uncertainty as to what had happened to him then. Of course, no appeal can be properly made to the false history of the Acts, but, if attempted, it is sufficient to say that according to Acts, Paul saw Jesus after this sight of 1 Corinthians 15, but that this was in a trance. Acts 22:18. And in spite of it, the sight of 1 Corinthians 15 was the last time Jesus was seen. In other words, Paul once more draws a strict distinction between his visions and this sight. It is instructive to note the methods by which it is attempted to make this visionary hypothesis more credible. A graphic picture is drawn by Bauer, Strauss and Rinan of the physical and psychological condition of St. Paul. He had been touched by the steadfastness of the Christians, he was deeply moved by the grandeur of Stephen's death, had begun to doubt within himself whether the resurrection of Christ had not really occurred, and sick in body and distracted in mind, smitten by the sun or the lightning of some sudden storm, was prostrated on his way to Damascus and saw in his delirium his awful self-imagined vision. It would be easy to show that the important points of this picture are contradicted by Paul himself. He knows nothing of distraction of mind or of opening doubts before the coming of the catastrophe. Compare Galatians 1, 13, etc. It would be easy, again, to show that, brilliant as it is, this picture fails to account for the facts, notably for the immense moral change recognized by Paul himself, by which he was transformed from the most bloodthirsty of fanatics to the tenderest of saints. But it will be sufficient for our present purpose to note only that all that renders it plausible is its connection with certain facts recorded only in that unbelievable history, the Acts. We find ourselves then in this dilemma. If Acts be no true history, then these facts cannot be so used. If Acts be true history, then Paul's conversion occurred quite otherwise. And again, if Acts be true, then so is Luke's gospel, and Acts and Luke are enough to authenticate the resurrection of Christ. In either case, our cause is one. In regard to this whole visionary scheme, we have one further remark to make. It is to be noted that even were it much more plausible than it is, it still would not be worth further consideration. For Paul believed in the fact of the resurrection of Christ not only because he had seen the Lord, but also on the testimony of others. For we would note in the second place that Paul introduces us to other eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ. He founded his gospel on this fact, and in Galatians 2.6, he tells us his gospel was the same as was preached by Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John then believed with the same intensity that Christ rose from the dead. We have already seen that this testimony, as to John at least, is supported by what he himself has written in the Apocalypse. In consistency with the inference again, Paul explicitly declares in 1 Corinthians 15.3 that the risen Christ was seen not only by himself, but by Cephas, James, and indeed all the apostles, and that more than once. Even more, he states that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, the most of whom were still living when Paul wrote this letter, and whose witness-bearing he invokes. Here Paul brings before us a cloud of witnesses. In respect to them, the following facts are worth pointing out. These witnesses were numerous. There were at least 500 of them. They were not a mere unknown mob, we know somewhat of several of them, and know them as practical men. The most of them were still living when Paul wrote, and he could appeal to them to bear testimony to the Corinthians. The result of all of which is that this notice in 1 Corinthians is equivalent to their individual testimony. 
Paul is admitted to be a sober and trustworthy writer, this epistle is admitted to be genuinely his, and he here, in a contemporary document, challenges an appeal to living eyewitnesses. He could not have made this confident appeal had not these men really professed, soberly and earnestly, to have seen the risen Christ. We have then not only Paul claiming to be an eyewitness of the resurrection, but a large number of men, over 250 of whom were known to be still living when he wrote. We have to account not for the claim of one man that he had seen Jesus alive after he had died, but for the same claim put in by a multitude. Will any arguing that Paul sometimes saw visions serve our purpose here? And there is still another point which is worth remarking. The witnesses here appeal to are the original disciples and apostles of our Lord. From this, two facts follow. The one, the original disciples believed they had seen the risen Lord, and the other, they claimed to have seen him on the third day after his burial, 1 Corinthians 15.4. This, according to Paul, is certain fact. Then note once more, in the third place, that this testimony, as already pointed out, was not only absolutely convincing to the Apostle Paul, but it was so also to the whole body of Christians. Not only did Paul base the truth of all Christianity on the truth of this testimony and found his conversion on it, but so did all Christians. He could count on all his readers being just as firmly persuaded of this fact as he was. To the Corinthians, Galatians, Romans, this is the dogma of Christianity. When Paul wishes to prove his apostleship to the Corinthians or Galatians, he is not afraid to base it on the therefore admitted fact of the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9.1, Galatians 1.1. When he wishes to make our justification seem sure to the Romans, he appeals to Christ's resurrection in its proof. Romans 4.24 and 25. These are but specimens of his practice. Both purposed and incidental allusions are made to the resurrection through all four of these epistles of such character as to prove that it was felt by Paul that he could count on it above all other facts as the starting point of Christianity in the minds of his readers. Whether he is writing to Corinthians, Galatians or Romans, this is alike true. Now consider the force of this. In some of these churches, it is to be remembered, there were dissensions, divisions, parties arrayed in bitter hostility against one another, parties with contumely denying the apostleship, or discarding the leadership of Paul, yet all these parties believe in the resurrection of Christ. Paul can appeal to all alike to accept a doctrine based on that. It is to his bitterest opponents that he will prove his apostleship by claiming to have seen the risen Lord. It is plain, then, that the resurrection of Christ was in Paul's day deemed a primordial, universal, and essential doctrine of Christianity. Again, some of Paul's readers were far removed from credulous simplicity. There was a party in the Corinthian church, for instance, who, with all the instincts of modern philosophical criticism, claimed the right to try at the bar of reason the doctrines submitted to their acceptance. They could not accept such an absurdity as the resurrection of the bodies of those who slept in the Lord. If the dead be raised, with what body do they come? Was but one of their argumentative queries. The same class of difficulties in regard to the resurrection of men, as would in modern times start up in the minds of scientific inquirers, was evidently before their minds. Yet they believed firmly in the resurrection of Christ. When Paul wishes to argue with them in regard to our resurrection, he bases his argument on the therefore common ground of the resurrection of Christ. It is plain, then, that unthinking credulity will not account for the universal acceptance of this doctrine. Men able and more than willing to apply critical tests to evidence were firm believers in it. And still again, one of these letters is addressed to a church with which Paul had no personal connection. It was not founded by him, it had never been visited by him, it had not before been addressed by him. There were those in it who were opposed to his dearest teachings. There were those in it who had been humble followers of Christ while he was still raging against his church. Yet, they all believed as firmly as he did in the resurrection of Christ. He could prove his doctrines to them best by basing on this common faith. It is plain, then, that this doctrine was not of late growth in the church, nor had its origin from Paul. It had always been the universal belief in the church. Men did not believe it because Paul preached it only, but they and Paul alike believed it from the convincing character of the evidence. When had a belief thus universally accepted as a part of Aboriginal Christianity in AD 58 had an opportunity to mythically grow into being? 
and if it grew, what of the testimony of those over 250 still living eyewitnesses to the fact? Here we may fitly pause to gather up results. It seems indisputably evident from these four epistles of Paul, first that the resurrection of Christ was universally believed in the Christian church when these epistles were written, whatever party lines there were, however near they came, yet did they not cut through this dogma. Second, that the original followers of Christ, including his apostles, claimed to be eyewitnesses of the fact of his resurrection, and therefore from the beginning, third day, the whole church had been convinced of its truth. Over 250 of these eyewitnesses were living when Paul wrote. Third, that the church believed universally that it owed its life, as it certainly owed its continued existence and growth, to its firm belief in this dogma. What has to be accounted for then is, one, not the belief of one man that he had seen the Lord, but of something over 500. Two, not the conviction of a party, and that after some time that the Lord had risen, but the universal and immediate belief of the whole church. Three, the effect of this faith in absolutely changing the characters and filling with enthusiasm its first possessors. And four, their power in propagating their faith, in building up on this strange dogma a large and fast-growing communion, all devoted to it as the first and ground element of their faith. There are only three theories which can possibly be started to account for these facts. Either the original disciples of Christ were deceivers and deliberately concocted the story of the resurrection, or they were woefully deluded, or the resurrection was a fact. 1. The first of these theories, old as it is, Matthew twenty-eight eleven, is now admitted on all sides to be ridiculous. Strauss and Volkmar, for example, both scorn it as an impossible explanation. We may therefore pass it over in a few words. The dead body of Christ, lying in his grave ready to be produced by the Jews at any moment, of itself destroys this theory. For we must remember that the belief in the resurrection dates from the third day. Or, if the body no longer lay in the grave, where was it? It must have been either removed by their enemies, in which case it would have been produced in disproof of the resurrection, or stolen by the disciples themselves. We are shut up to these two hypotheses, for the only possible third one, that the body had never been buried but thrown upon the dunghill, is out of the question, five eyewitnesses expressly witnessing, according to Paul, that it was buried, 1 Corinthians 15.4. No one will so stultify himself in this age as to seriously contend that the disciples stole the body. Not only is it certain that they could not possibly have summoned courage to make the attempt, but the very idea of Christianity owing its life to such an act is worse than absurd. Imagine, if one can, this band of disheartened disciples assembled and coolly plotting to conquer the world to themselves by proclaiming what must have been seen to be the absurd promise of everlasting life through one who had himself died, had died and had not risen again. Imagine them not expecting a resurrection nor dreaming of its possibility, determining to steal the body of their dead Lord, pretend that he had risen and then to found on their falsehood a system of the most marvellous truth, on this act of rapine a system of the most perfect morals. Imagine the body stolen and brought into their midst. Who can think they could be stirred up to noble endeavour by the sight? Can a more appalling spectacle be imagined? exclaims Dr. Knott than that of a dead Christ stolen from his sepulchre and surrounded by his hopeless heaven-deserted followers. And was it here, think you, in this cadaverous chamber, in this haunt of sin, of falsehood, of misery, and of putrefaction, that the transcendent and immortal system of Christian faith and morals was adopted? Was this stolen, mangled, lifeless corpse the only rallying point of Christians? Was it the sight of this that fortified and filled with the most daring courage, the most deathless hopes, the whole body of the disciples? Well have our opponents declared this supposition absurd. Christ rose from the dead, or else his disciples were a body of woefully deluded men. 2. Then will this second theory meet the case? Is the admitted fact that Christ's earliest followers were all convinced that he rose from the dead adequately explained by the supposition that they were the victim of a delusion? We must remember that the testimony of eyewitnesses declares that Christ rose on the third day, and that we have thus to account for immediate faith. But then there is the dead body of Jesus lying in the grave. 
How could the whole body of those men be so deceived in so momentous a matter, with the means of testing its truth ready at their hand? Hence it is commonly admitted that the grave was now empty. Strauss alone resorts to the sorry hypothesis that the appearances of the risen Christ were all in Galilee, and that before the forty days which intervened before the disciples returned to Jerusalem had passed, the sight of the grave or dunghill had been wholly forgotten by friend and foe alike. But there is that unimpeachable testimony of eyewitnesses that the appearances began on the third day, and the equally assured fact, Romans 4.4, 4, 1 Corinthians 15.4, that the body was not thrown on a dunghill, but that there was a veritable grave. So that the empty grave stares us still in the face. If Christ did not rise, how came the grave empty? Here is the crowning difficulty, which all the ingenuity of the whole modern critical school has not been able to lay aside. Was it emptied by Christ's own followers? That would have been imposture, and the skeptics scorn such a resort. Moreover, the hypothesis that the apostles were impostors has been laid aside already in the preceding paragraph. Was it then emptied by his enemies? How soon would the body have been produced then to confront and confound the so rapidly growing heresy? Or, if this were not possible, how soon would overwhelming proof of the removal of the body have been brought forward? Then how was that grave emptied? Shall we say that Jesus was not really dead and reviving from the swoon himself crept from the tomb? This was the hypothesis of Schleiermacher. But not only is it in direct contradiction with the eyewitness testimony, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 2 Corinthians 5, 15, Romans 14, 9, which is explicit that Christ died, but it has been felt by all the leaders of sceptical thought to be inadequate as an explanation. Strauss has himself executed justice on it. It not only casts a stigma on the moral character of our Lord, but it is itself laden with absurdity. It would have been impossible thus to mistake a wounded man dying from exhaustion for the Messiah of Jewish expectations, or then to magnify this into a resurrection from the dead. A dying man in hiding, the centre of Christianity's life. This fill with enthusiasm and death-defying courage, the founders of the church. Besides all which, the hypothesis makes the apostles either knaves or fools, neither of which, as the sceptics admit, is possible truth. Hence, they themselves unite with us in rejecting as wholly absurd this dream of Schleiermacher. Once more, then, how can we account for the empty grave? We hazard nothing in asserting that this one fact is destructive to all the theories of Christ's resurrection which have been started in the nervous effort to be rid of its reality. That empty grave is alone enough to found all Christianity upon. But suppose for a moment we assume the impossible and, and allow to Strauss that the sight of the grave was already lost. What then? The disciples were still convinced that Christ had risen. How shall we account for this invincible conviction? The only possible resort is to the worn-out vision hypothesis. Renan draws a beautiful picture of Mary Magdalene in her love and grief, fancying she saw her longed-for Lord, and a not-so-beautiful one of the abject and idiotic credulity of the disciples who believed her, and then, because they believed her, fancied they had seen him themselves. But will all this fine picturing of what might have been stand the test of facts? That grave stares us in the face again, if the body was still in it. There was no place left for visions of it as living and out of it. If not in it, how came it out? But laying aside this final argument as premised, even then the theory cannot stand. 1. There was no expectation of a resurrection and hence no ground for visions. So far we can go here. Could we appeal to the Gospels? We could go farther and show that the disciples had lost all heart, and so far was their imagination from creating the sensible presence of Jesus that, at the first, they did not recognize him. Renan gains all the facts on which he founds his theory from the Gospels. Let him be refuted from the same records. How could Mary Magdalene's own mind have created the vision of Jesus when she did not recognize him as Jesus when he appeared? 2. There was no time for belief in the resurrection to mythically grow. That well-established third day meets us here, and within forty days the whole Christian community, over five hundred in number, not only firmly believed in the resurrection, but believed, each man of them, that he had himself seen the Lord. We must account for this. 3. These five hundred are too many visionaries to create. 
was all Palestine inhabited by Francis's of Assisi? What might be plausibly urged of Paul or Mary loses all plausibility when urged of all their contemporaries. And thus we cannot but conclude that all attempts to explain the belief of the early followers of Christ in his resurrection as a delusion utterly fail. If it was not founded on fraud or delusion, then was it not on fact? There seems no other alternative, eyewitnesses in abundance witness to the fact. If they were neither deceivers nor deceived, then Christ did rise from the dead. We must not imagine, however, that this is all the proof we have of that great fact. We have been only very inadequately working one single vein. There is another very convincing course of argumentation which might be based on the results of the resurrection of Christ in transforming those who believed in it in founding a church. And then there is that other form of argument already pointed out which consists in the not very difficult task of vindicating the authority of our Gospels and Acts or of the account included in them. Taking all lines of proof together, it is by no means extravagant to assert that no fact in the history of the world is so well authenticated as the fact of Christ's resurrection. And that established, all Christianity is established too. Its supernatural element is vindicated, its supernatural origin evinced. Then our faith is not in vain, and we are not still in our sins. Then the world has been redeemed unto our God, and all flesh can see his salvation. Then the all-wise is the all-loving, too, and has vindicated his love forever. Then the supreme song of heaven may be fitly repeated on earth. Worthy is the Lamb that hath been slain, to receive the power and riches and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. Then we can know that nothing can separate us from his love, that even death has failed in the attempt, and that it is thus given to mortals to utter in triumph the immortal cry, Death is swallowed up in victory. End of The Resurrection of Christ and Historical Fact Evinced by Eyewitnesses by B.B. Warfield The Polemics of Infant Baptism by B.B. Warfield this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The question of the subjects of baptism is one of that class of problems the solution of which hangs upon a previous question. According as is our doctrine of the Church, so will be our doctrine of the subjects of baptism. If we believe, with the Church of Rome, that the Church is in such a sense the institute of salvation that none are united to Christ save through the instrumentality of her ordinances, then we shall inevitably determine the proper subjects of her ordinances in one way. If, on the other hand, we believe, with the Protestant bodies, that only those already united to Christ have right within his house and to its privileges, we shall inevitably determine them in another way. All Protestants should easily agree that only Christ's children have a right to the ordinance of baptism. The cleavage in their ranks enters in only when we inquire how the external church is to hold itself relatively to the recognition of the children of Christ. If we say that its attitude should be as exclusive as possible, and that it must receive as the children of Christ only those whom it is forced to recognize as such, then we shall inevitably narrow the circle of the subjects of baptism to the lowest limits. If, on the other hand, we say that its attitude should be as inclusive as possible, and that it should receive as the children of Christ all whom, in the judgment of charity, it may fairly recognize as such, then we shall naturally widen the circle of the subjects of baptism to far more ample limits. The former represents, broadly speaking, the Puritan idea of the Church, the latter the general Protestant doctrine. It is on the basis of the Puritan conception of the Church that the Baptists are led to exclude infants from baptism. For, if we are to demand anything like demonstrative evidence of actual participation in Christ before we baptize, no infant, who by reason of years is incapable of affording signs of his union with Christ, can be thought a proper subject of the right. The vice of this system, however, is that it attempts the impossible. No man can read the heart. As a consequence, it follows that no one, however rich his manifestation of Christian graces, is baptized on the basis of infallible knowledge of his relation to Christ. All baptism is inevitably administered on the basis not of knowledge but of presumption. And if we must baptize on presumption, the whole principle is yielded, and it would seem that we must baptize all whom we may fairly presume to be members of Christ's body. 
In this state of the case, it is surely impracticable to assert that there can be but one ground on which a fair presumption of inclusion in Christ's body can be erected, namely personal profession of faith. Assuredly, a human profession is no more solid basis to build upon than a divine promise. So soon, therefore, as it is fairly apprehended that we baptize on presumption and not on knowledge, it is inevitable that we shall baptize all those for whom we may, on any grounds, fairly cherish a good presumption that they belong to God's people. And this surely includes the infant children of believers, concerning the favor of God to whom there exist many precious promises on which pious parents, Baptists, as fully as others, rest in devout faith. To this solid proof of the rightful inclusion of the infant children of believers among the subjects of baptism is added the unavoidable implication of the continuity of the Church of God, as it is taught in the Scriptures from its beginning to its consummation, and of the undeniable inclusion within the bounds of this Church, in its pre-Christian form, as participants of its privileges, inclusive of the parallel rite of circumcision, of the infant children of the flock, with no subsequent hint of their exclusion. To this is added further the historical evidence of the prevalence in the Christian Church of a custom of baptizing the infant children of believers from the earliest Christian ages down to today. The manner in which it is dealt with by Augustine and the Pelagians in their controversy, by Cyprian in his letter to Fidus, by Tertullian in his treatise on baptism, leaves no room for doubt that it was, at the time when each of these writers wrote, as universal and unquestioned a practice among Christians at large as it is today, while wherever it was objected to, the objection seems to have rested on one or the other of two contrary errors, either on an overestimate of the effects of baptism or on an underestimate of the need of salvation for infants. On such lines as these, a convincing positive argument is capable of being set forth for infant baptism to the support of which whatever obscure allusions to it may be found in the New Testament itself may then be summoned. And on these lines the argument has ordinarily been very successfully conducted, as may be seen by consulting the treatment of the subject in any of our standard works on systematic theology, as for example Dr. Charles Hodges. It has occurred to me that additional support might be brought to the conclusions thus positively attained by observing the insufficiency of the case against infant baptism as argued by the best furnished opponents of that practice. There would seem no better way to exhibit this insufficiency than to subject the presentation of the arguments against infant baptism as set forth by some confessedly important representative of its opponents to a running analysis. I have selected for the purpose the statement given in Dr. A. H. Strong's Systematic Theology. What that eminently well-informed and judicious writer does not urge against infant baptism may well be believed to be confessedly of small comparative weight as an argument against the doctrine and practice, so that if we do not find the arguments he urges conclusive, we may well be content with the position we already occupy. Dr. Strong opens the topic, the subjects of baptism, with a statement that the proper subjects of baptism are those only who give credible evidence that they have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, or, in other words, have entered by faith into the communion of Christ's death and resurrection, a statement which, if like the ordinary language of the Scriptures, is intended to have reference only to the adults to whom it is addressed, would be sufficiently unexceptionable, but which the only advertises us to suspect to be more inclusive in its purpose. This statement is followed at once by the organized proof that only persons giving evidence of being regenerated are proper subjects of baptism. This proof is derived a. from the command and example of Christ and his apostles which show, first, that those only are to be baptized who have previously been made disciples, secondly, that those only are to be baptized who have previously repented and believed b. from the nature of the church as a company of regenerate persons, c. from the symbolism of the ordinance as declaring a previous spiritual change in him who submits to it. Each of these items is supported by scripture texts, though some of them are no doubt sufficiently inapposite, as, for example, when only John 3.5 and Romans 6.13, neither of which have anything to do with the visible church, are quoted to prove that the visible church, of which baptism is an ordinance, is a company of regenerate persons, or as when Matthew 28.19 is quoted to prove that baptism took place after the discipling, as if the words ran, whereas the passage actually standing, 
merely demands that the discipling shall be consummated in, shall be performed by, means of baptism, or as when Acts 10.47, where the fact that the extraordinary power of the Holy Spirit had come upon Cornelius is pleaded as a reason why baptism should not be withheld from him, and Romans 6.2-5, which only develops the spiritual implication of baptism, are made to serve as proofs that the symbolism of the ordinance declares always and constantly a previous spiritual change. Apart from the scriptural evidence actually brought forward, moreover, the propositions, in the extreme form in which they are stated, cannot be supported by scripture. The scriptures do not teach that the external church is a company of regenerate persons. The parable of the tares, for example, declares the opposite, though they represent that church as the company of those who are presumably regenerate. They do not declare that baptism demonstrates a previous change, the case of Simon Magus, Acts 8.13, is enough to exhibit the contrary, though they represent the rite as symbolical of the inner cleansing presumed to be already present, and consequently as administered only on profession of faith. The main difficulty with Dr. Strong's argument, however, is the illegitimate use it makes of the occasional character of the New Testament declarations. He is writing a systematic theology, and is therefore striving to embrace the whole truth in his statements, he says, therefore, with conscious reference to infants, whose case he is soon to treat, those only are to be baptized who have previously repented and believed, and the like. But the passages he quotes in support of this position are not drawn from a systematic theology, but from direct practical appeals to quite definite audiences, consisting only of adults, or from narratives of what took place as the result of such appeals. Because Peter told the men that stood about him at Pentecost, Repent ye and be baptized, it does not follow that baptism might not have been administered by the same Peter to the infants of those repentant sinners previous to the infants' own repentance. Because Philip baptized the converts of Samaria only after they had believed, it does not follow that he would not baptize their infants until they had grown old enough to repeat their parents' faith, that they might, like them, receive its sign. The assertion contained in the first proof is, therefore, a non sequitur from the texts offered in support of it. There is a suppressed premise necessary to be supplied before the assumed conclusion follows from them, and that premise is that the visible church consists of believers only, without inclusion of their children. That Peter meant nothing on that day of Pentecost when he added to the words which Dr. Strong quotes, Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of your sins. Those other words which Dr. Strong does not quote, for to you is the promise, and to your children. Acts 2.38. This suppressed premise Dr. Strong adjoins in the second item of proof which he adduces. But we must observe that it is not a second item, but a necessary element in the first item, which without it is invalid. In a word, when we correct the scripture he adduces, and the illegitimate use he makes of scripture, Dr. Strong's whole argument reduces to the one item of the nature of the church as a company of regenerate persons. It is only on the ground that this is the true idea of the church that the passage is quoted to prove that baptism is to be administered only to such as have previously repented and believed, and those quoted to prove that the symbolism of the ordinance declares a previous spiritual change in him who submits to it, will justify the only and previous in which lies their point. The validity of the proof he offers thus depends on the truth of the assertion that the church consists of regenerate persons, and whether this be true or not, we need not here stay to examine. Certainly the texts he adduces in proof of it, as already intimated, make no approach to establishing it. We rest securely in the result that according to Dr. Strong's argument, as well as our own conviction, the subjects of baptism are the members of the visible church, and who those are will certainly be determined by our theory of the nature of the church. A page or two further on, he takes up the question of infant baptism ex professo. This he rejects and reprehends, and that for the following reasons, viz. a. Infant baptism is without warrant, either express or implied, in the scripture. b. Infant baptism is expressly contradicted by scriptural teaching. c. The rise of infant baptism in the history of the church is due to sacramental conceptions of Christianity, so that all arguments in its favour from the writings of the first three centuries are equally arguments for baptismal regeneration. D. The reasoning by which it is supported is unscriptural, unsound, and dangerous in its tendency. E. The lack of agreement among pedobaptists as to the warrant for infant baptism and as to the relation of baptized infants to the church, together with the manifest decline of the practice itself, are arguments against it. F. The evil effects of infant baptism are a strong argument against it. 
Here is quite a list of arguments. We must look at the items one by one. A. When we ask, after direct scriptural warrant for infant baptism, in the sense which Dr. Strong has in mind, in the first of these arguments, we, of course, have the New Testament in view, seeing that it is only in the new dispensation that this rite has been ordained. In this sense of the words, we may admit his first declaration, that there is no express command that infants should be baptized, and with it also his second, that there is in Scripture no clear example of the baptism of infants, i.e., if we understand by this that there is no express record, reciting in so many words that infants were baptized. When he adds to these, however, a third contention, that the passages held to imply infant baptism contain, when fairly interpreted, no reference to such a practice, we begin to recalcitrate. If it were only asserted that these passages contain no such stringent proof that infants were baptized, as would satisfy us on the point in the absence of other evidence, we might yield this point also. But it is too much to ask us to believe that they contain no reference to the practice, if fairly interpreted. What is fair interpretation? Is it not an interpretation which takes the passages as they stand, without desire to make undue capital of them one way or the other? Well, a fair interpretation of these passages, in this sense, might prevent pedobaptists from claiming them as a demonstrative proof of infant baptism, and it would also certainly prevent anti-pedobaptists from asserting that they have no reference to such a practice. It should lead both parties to agree that the passages have a possible but not a necessary reference to infant baptism, that they are neutral passages, in a word, which apparently imply infant baptism, but which may be explained without involving that implication, if we otherwise know that infant baptism did not exist in that day. Fairly viewed, in other words, they are passages which will support any other indications of infant baptism which may be brought forward, but which will scarcely suffice to prove it against evidence to the contrary, or to do more than raise a presumption in favour in the absence of other evidence for it. For what are these passages? The important ones are Acts 16.15, which declares that Lydia was baptised and her household, and Acts 16.33, which declares that the jailer was baptised and all his, together with 1 Corinthians 1.16, and I baptised also the household of Stephanus. Certainly, at first blush, we would think that the repeated baptism of households without further description would imply the baptism of the infants connected with them. It may be a fair response to this that we do not know that there were any infants in these households, which is true enough, but not sufficient to remove the suspicion that there may have been. It may be a still fairer reply to say that whether the infants of these families, if there were infants in them, were baptized or not, would depend on the practice of the apostles, and whatever that practice was would be readily understood by the first readers of the Acts. But this would only amount to asking that infant baptism should not be founded solely on these passages alone, and this we have already granted. Neither of these lines of argument are adduced by Dr. Strong. They would not justify his position which is not that the baptism of infants cannot be proved by these passages, but much more than this, that a fair interpretation of them definitively excludes all reference to it by them. Let us see what Dr. Strong means by a fair interpretation. To the case of Lydia, he appends compare verse 40, which tells us, When Paul and Silas were loosed from prison, they entered into the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed, from which apparently he would have us make two inferences, that these brethren constituted the household of Lydia that was baptized, and two, that these brethren were all adults. In like manner, to the case of the jailer, he appends the mystic, compare verse 34, which tells us that the saved jailer brought his former prisoners up into his house, and set meat before them, and rejoiced greatly, having believed with all his house on God, from which he would apparently have us infer that, there was no member of the household baptized by Paul who was too young to exercise personal faith. So he says with reference to 1 Corinthians 1.16 that 1 Corinthians 16.15 shows that the whole family of Stephanus baptized by Paul were adults. Nevertheless, when we look at 1 Corinthians 16.15, we read merely that the house of Stephanus were the first fruits of Archaea and that they had set themselves to minister unto the saints, which leaves the question whether they are all adults or not just where it was before i.e. absolutely undetermined. Nor is this all. To these passages, Dr. Strong appends two others, one properly enough, 1 Corinthians 7.14, where Paul admonishes the Christian not to desert the unbelieving husband or wife, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified in the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified in the brother. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. 
This is doubtless a passage similar to the others, a passage certainly which does not explicitly teach infant baptism, but equally certainly which is not inconsistent with it, which would, indeed, find a ready explanation from such a custom, if such a custom existed, and therefore stands as one of the passages which raise at least a suspicion that infant baptism underlies the form of expression, since the holiness of the children is taken for granted in it, and the sanctification of the unbelieving partner inferred from it but is yet no doubt capable of an explanation on the supposition that that practice did not exist, and is therefore scarcely a sure foundation for a doctrine asserting it. Dr. Strong is, however, not satisfied with showing that no stringent inference can be drawn from it in favour of infant baptism. He claims it is a sure testimony, a plain proof against infant baptism, on the grounds that the infants and the unbelieving parent are put by it in the same category, and, quoting Jacobi, that if children had been baptised, Paul would certainly have referred to their baptism as a proof of their holiness. And this in the face of the obvious fact that the holiness of the children is assumed as beyond dispute and in no need of proof, doubt as to which would be too horrible to contemplate, and the sanctification of the husband or wife inferred from it. Of course, it is the sanctity or holiness of external connection and privilege that is referred to, both with reference to the children and the parent, but that of the one is taken for granted, that of the other is argued. Hence it lies close to infer that the one may have had churchly recognition and the other not. Whether that was true or not, however, the passage cannot positively decide for us, it only raises a suspicion. But this suspicion ought to be frankly recognised. The other passage which is adjoined to these is strangely found in their company, although it too is one of the neutral texts. It is Matthew 19.14. Suffer the little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for to such belongeth the kingdom of heaven. What has this to do with baptism? Certainly nothing directly, only if it be held indirectly to show that infants were received by Christ as members of his kingdom on earth, i.e. of his church, can it bear on the controversy. But notice Dr. Strong's comment, none would have been forbidden if Jesus and his disciples had been in the habit of baptizing infants. Does he really think this touches the matter that is raised by this quotation? Nobody supposes that Jesus and his disciples were in the habit of baptizing infants. Nobody supposes that, at the time these words were spoken, Christian baptism had been so much as yet instituted. Dr. Strong would have to show not that infant baptism was not practiced before baptism was instituted, but that the children were not designated by Christ as members of his kingdom before the presumption for infant baptism would be extruded from the text. It is his unmeasured zeal to make all texts which have been appealed to by pedobaptists not merely fail to teach pedobaptism, but teach that children were not baptized, that has led him so far astray here. We cannot profess to admire, then, the fair interpretations which Dr. Strong makes of these texts. No one starting out without a foregone conclusion could venture to say that, when fairly interpreted, they certainly make no reference to baptism of infants. Nevertheless, I freely allow that they do not suffice, taken by themselves, to prove that infants were baptized by the apostles. They only suggest this supposition and raise a presumption for it. And therefore, I am prepared to allow in general the validity of Dr. Strong's first argument, when thus softened to reasonable proportions. It is true that there is no express command to baptize infants in the New Testament, no express record of the baptism of infants, and no passages so stringently implying it that we must infer from them that infants were baptized. If such warrant as this were necessary to justify the usage, we should have to leave it incompletely justified. But the lack of this express warrant is something far short of forbidding the right, and if the continuity of the church throughout all ages can be made good, the warrant for infant baptism is not to be sought in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, where the church was instituted, and nothing short of an actual forbidding of it in the New Testament would warrant our omitting it now. As Lightfoot expressed it long ago, Hori Hebraiki on Matthew 3, six, it is not forbidden in the New Testament to baptize infants, therefore they are to be baptized. Dr. Strong commits his first logical error in demanding express warrant for the continuance of a long-settled institution instead of asking for a warrant for setting it aside. b. If thus the first argument is irrelevant as a whole, as well as not very judiciously put in its details, is not its failure well atoned for in the second one? His second argument undertakes to show that infant baptism is expressly contradicted by scriptural teaching. Here at length we have the promise of what was needed, but if we expect stringent reason here for the alteration of the children including covenant, we shall be sadly disappointed. 
Dr. Strong offers four items. First, infant baptism is contradicted by the scriptural prerequisites of faith and repentance as signs of regeneration, which is valid only on the suppressed assumption that baptism is permissible only in the case of those who prove a previous regeneration, which is the very point in dispute. Secondly, by the scriptural symbolism of the ordinance. As we should not bury a person before his death, so we should not symbolically bury a person by baptism until he has in spirit died to sin. Here, not only that the symbolism of baptism is burial is gratuitously assumed, but also that this act, whatever be its symbolism, could be the symbol only of an already completed process in the heart of the recipient, which again is the very point in dispute. Thirdly, by the scriptural constitution of the church, where again the whole validity of the argument depends on the assumption that infants are not members of the church, the very point in dispute. These three arguments must therefore be thrown at once out of court. If the scriptures teach that personal faith and repentance are prerequisites to baptism, if they teach that one must have previously died to sin before he is baptized, if they teach that the visible church consists of regenerate adults only, why on any of these three identical propositions, each of which implies all the others, of course infants may not be baptized, for this again is but an identical proposition with any of the three. But it is hardly sound argumentation simply to repeat the matter in dispute in other words and plead it as proof. The fourth item is more reasonable, by the scriptural prerequisites to participation in the Lord's Supper. Participation in the Lord's Supper is the right only of those who can discern the Lord's body, 1 Corinthians 11.29. No reason can be assigned for restricting to intelligent communicants the ordinance of the supper, which would not equally restrict to intelligent believers the ordinance of baptism. Hence, Dr. Strong thinks the Greek church more consistent in administering the Lord's Supper to infants, it seems, however, a sufficient answer to this to point to the passage quoted, the express declaration of Scripture that those who are admitted to the Lord's Supper, a declaration made to those who were already baptized Christians, should be restricted to those who discern the Lord's body, is a sufficient scriptural reason for restricting participation in the Lord's Supper to intelligent communicants, while the absence of that scriptural restriction in its case is a sufficient scriptural reason for refusing to apply it to baptism. If we must support this scriptural reason with a purely rational one, it may be enough to add that the fact that baptism is the initiatory rite of the church supplies us with such a reason. The ordinances of the church belong to the members of it, but each in its own appointed time. The initiatory ordinance belongs to the members on becoming members. Other ordinances become their right as the appointed seasons for enjoying them roll around. We might as well argue that a citizen of the United States has no right to the protection of the police until he can exercise the franchise. The rights all belong to him, but the exercise of each comes in its own season. It is easily seen by the help of such examples that the possession of a right to the initiatory ordinance of the church need not carry with it the right to the immediate enjoyment of all church privileges, and thus the challenge is answered to show cause why the right to baptism does not carry with it the right to communion in the Lord's Supper. With this challenge, the second argument of Dr. Strong is answered too. C. The third argument is really an attempt to get rid of the pressure of the historical argument for infant baptism. Is it argued that the Christian church from the earliest traceable date baptized infants? That this is possibly hinted by Justin Martyr, assumed apparently in Irenaeus and openly proclaimed as apostolical by Origen and Cyprian, while it was vainly opposed by Tertullian? In answer, it is replied that all these writers taught baptismal regeneration and that infant baptism was an invention coming in on the heels of baptismal regeneration and continued in existence by state churches. There is much that is plausible in this contention. The early church did come to believe that baptism was necessary to salvation. This doctrine forms a natural reason for the extension of baptism to infants, lest dying unbaptized they should fail of salvation. Nevertheless, the contention does not seem to be the true explanation of the line of development. First, it confuses a question of testimony to fact with a question of doctrine. The two, baptismal regeneration and infant baptism, do not stand or fall together in the testimony of the fathers. Their unconscious testimony to a current practice proves its currency in their day, but their witness to a doctrine does not prove its truth. We may or may not agree with them in their doctrine of baptismal regeneration, but we cannot doubt the truth of their testimony to the prevalence of infant baptism in their day. We admit that their day is not the Apostles' day. We could well wish that we had earlier witness. We may be sure from the witness of Origen and Cyprian 
that they were baptized in their infancy, that is, that infant baptism was the usual practice in the age of Irenaeus, a conclusion which is at once strengthened by and strengthens the witness of Irenaeus. But the practice of the latter half of the second century need not have been the practice of the apostles. A presumption is raised, however, even though so weak and one that it would not stand against adverse evidence. But where is the adverse evidence? Secondly, Dr. Strong's view reverses the historical testimony. As a matter of history, it was not the inauguration of the practice of infant baptism which the doctrine of baptismal regeneration secured, but the endangering of it. It was because baptism washed away all sin, and after that there remained no more lava for regeneration, that baptism was postponed. It is for this reason that Tertullian proposes its postponement. Lastly, though the historical argument may not be conclusive for the apostolicity of infant baptism, it is in that direction and is all that we have. There is no evidence from primitive church history against infant baptism, except the ambiguous evidence of Tertullian, so that our choice is to follow history and baptize infants, or to reconstruct by a priori methods a history for which we have no evidence. D. Dr. Strong's fourth item is intended as a refutal of the reasoning by which the advocates of pedobaptism support their contention. As such, it naturally takes up the reasoning from every kind of sources, and it is not strange that some of the reasoning adduced in it is as distasteful to us as it is to him. We should heartily unite with him in refusing to allow the existence of any power in the church to modify or abrogate any command of Christ. Nor could we find any greater acceptability than he does in the notion of an organic connection between the parent and the child, such as he quotes Dr. Bushnell as advocating. Nevertheless, we can believe in a parent acting as representative of the child in his loins, whose nurture is committed to him, and we can believe that the status of the parent determines the status of the child, in the church of the God whose promise is to you and your children, as well as, for example, in the state. And we can believe that the church includes the minor children of its members, for whom they must as parents act, without believing that it is thereby made a hereditary body, I do not purpose here to go over again the proofs which Dr. Hodge so cogently urges that go to prove the continuity of the church through the old and new dispensations, remaining under whatever change of dispensation the same church with the same laws of entrance and the same constituents. The antithesis which Dr. Strong adduces that the Christian church is either a national hereditary body or it was merely typified by the Jewish people is a false antithesis. The Christian church is not a natural hereditary body and yet it is not merely the antitype of Israel. It is, the apostles being witnesses, the veritable Israel itself. It carried over into itself all that was essentially Israelitish, all that went to make up the body of God's people. Paul's figures of the olive tree in Romans and of the breaking down of the middle wall of partition in Ephesians suffice to demonstrate this, and besides these figures, he repeatedly asserts it in the plainest language. So fully did the first Christians, the apostles, realize the continuity of the church that they were more inclined to retain parts of the outward garments of the church than to discard too much. Hence, circumcision itself was retained, and for a considerable period all initiants into the church were circumcised Jews and received baptism additionally. We do not doubt that children born into the church during this age were both circumcised and baptized. The change from baptism superinduced upon circumcision to baptism substituted for circumcision was slow, and never came until it was forced by the actual pressure of circumstances. The instrument for making this change, and so, who can doubt it, for giving the rite of baptism its right place as the substitute for circumcision, was the Apostle Paul. We see the change formally constituted at the so-called Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. Paul had preached the gospel to Gentiles and had received them into the church by baptism alone, thus recognizing it alone as the initiatory rite, in place of circumcision, instead of treating, as heretofore, the two together as the initiatory rites into the Christian church. But certain teachers from Jerusalem coming down to Antioch taught the brethren, except ye be circumcised after the custom of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Paul took the matter before the church of Jerusalem, from which these new teachers professed to emanate, and its formal decision was that to those who believed and were baptized, circumcision was not necessary. How fully Paul believed that baptism and circumcision were but two symbols of the same change of heart, and that one was instead of the other, may be gathered from Colossians 2.11, when, speaking to a Christian audience of the church, he declares that, In Christ ye were also circumcised. But how? with a circumcision not made by hands in putting off the body of the flesh, i.e. in the circumcision of Christ. But what was this Christ-ordained circumcision? 
The apostle continues, Having been buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Hence, in baptism they were buried with Christ, and this burial with Christ was the circumcision which Christ ordained, in the partaking of which they became the true circumcision. This falls little, if any, short of a direct assertion that the Christian church is Israel, and has Israel's circumcision, though now in the form of baptism. Does the view of Paul now contradict the New Testament idea of the church, or only the Baptist idea of the church? No doubt a large number of the members of the primitive church did insist, as Dr. Strong truly says, that those who were baptized should also be circumcised. And no doubt this proves that in their view baptism did not take the place of circumcision, but this was an erroneous view, is represented in the New Testament as erroneous, and it is this exact view against which Paul protested to the church of Jerusalem, and which the church of Jerusalem condemned in Acts 15. Thus the Baptist denial of the substitution of baptism for circumcision leads them into the error of this fanatical pharisaical church party. Let us take our places in opposition along with Paul and all the apostles. Whether then that the family is the unit of society is a relic of barbarism or not, it is the New Testament basis of the church of God. God does make man the head of the woman, does enjoin the wife to be in subjection to her husband, and does make the parents act on behalf of their minor children. He does indeed require individual faith for salvation, but he organizes his people in families first and then into churches, recognizing in their very warp and woof the family constitution. His promises are all the more precious that they are to us and our children, and though this may not fit in with the growing individualism of the day, it is God's ordinance. E. Dr. Strong's fifth argument is drawn from the divergent modes in which pedobaptists defend their position and from the decline among them of the practice of the right. Let us confess that we do not all argue alike or aright, but is not this a proof rather of the firm establishment in our hearts of the practice? We all practice alike, and it is the propriety of the practice, not the propriety of our defense of it, that is, after all, at stake. But the practice is declining, it is said. Perhaps this is true. Dr. Vedder's statistics seem to show it. But if so, does the decline show the practice to be wrong, or Christians to be unfaithful? It is among pedobaptists that the decline is taking place, those who still defend the practice. Perhaps it is the silent influence of Baptist neighbours, perhaps it is unfaithfulness in parents, perhaps the spread of a Quakerish sentiment of undervaluation of ordinances. Many reasons may enter into the account of it, but how does it show the practice to be wrong? According to the Baptist reconstruction of history, the church began by not baptizing infants, but this primitive and godly practice declined, rapidly declined, until in the second century all infants were baptized and Tertullian raised a solitary and ineffectual voice, crying a return to the older purity in the third. Did the decline of a prevalent usage prove it to be a wrong usage? By what logic can the decline in the second century be made an evidence in favor of an earlier usage, and that of the nineteenth an evidence against it? F. We must pass on, however, to the final string of arguments which would fain point out the evil effects of infant baptism. First, it forestalls the act of the child, and so prevents it from ever obeying Christ's command to be baptized, which is simply begging the question. We say it obeys Christ's command by giving the child early baptism, and so marking him as the Lord's. Secondly, it is said to induce superstitious confidence in an outward right, as if it possessed regenerating efficacy and we are pointed to frantic mothers seeking baptism for their dying children. Undoubtedly the evil does occur and needs careful guarding against, but it is an evil not confined to this right but apt to attach itself to all rights, which need not therefore be all abolished. We may remark in passing on the unfairness of bringing together here illustrative instances from French Catholic peasants and High Church Episcopalians as if these were of the same order with Protestants. Thirdly, it is said to tend to corrupt Christian truth as to the sufficiency of Scripture, the connection of the ordinances, and the inconsistency of an impenitent life with church membership, as if infant baptism necessarily argued sacramentarianism, or as if the churches of other Protestant bodies were, as a matter of fact, more full of impenitent members than those of the Baptists. This last remark is in place also in reply to the fourth point made, wherein it is charged that the practice of infant baptism destroys the church as a spiritual body by merging it in the nation and in the world. 
it is yet to be shown that the Baptist churches are purer than the pedobaptist. Dr. Strong seems to think that infant baptism is responsible for the Unitarian defection in New England. I am afraid the cause lay much deeper. Nor is it a valid argument against infant baptism that the churches do not always fulfill their duty to their baptized members. This, and not the practice of infant baptism, is the fertile cause of incongruities and evils innumerable. Lastly, it is urged that infant baptism puts into the place of Christ's command a commandment of men, and so admits the essential principle of all heresy, schism, and false religion, a good round railing charge to bring against one's brethren, but as an argument against infant baptism drawn from its effects somewhat of a petitio principi. If true, it is serious enough, but Dr. Strong has omitted to give the chapter and verse where Christ's command not to baptize infants is to be found. One or the other of us is wrong, no doubt, but do we not break an undoubted command of Christ when we speak thus harshly of our brethren, his children, whom we should love? Were it not better to judge each the other mistaken and recognize each the other's desire to please Christ and follow his commandments? Certainly I believe that our Baptist brethren omit to fulfill an ordinance of Christ's house, sufficiently plainly revealed as his will, when they exclude the infant children of believers from baptism. But I know they do this unwittingly in ignorance, and I cannot refuse them the right hand of fellowship on that account. But now, having run through these various arguments, to what conclusion do we come? Are they sufficient to set aside our reasoned conviction, derived from some such argument as Dr. Hodges, that infants are to be baptized? A thousand times no. So long as it remains true that Paul represents the church of the living God to be one, founded on one covenant which the law could not set aside, from Abraham to today, so long it remains true that the promise is to us and our children, and that the members of the visible church consist of believers and their children, all of whom have a right to all the ordinances of the visible church, each in its appointed season. The argument in a nutshell is simply this, God established his church in the days of Abraham and put children into it. They must remain there until he puts them out. He has nowhere put them out. They are still then members of his church, and as such entitled to its ordinances. Among these ordinances is baptism, which standing in similar place in the new dispensation to circumcision in the old, is like it to be given to children. End of The Polemics of Infant Baptism by B.B. Warfield Apologetics by B.B. Warfield this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Since Planck and Schleiermacher, apologetics has been the accepted name of one of the theological disciplines or departments of theological science. The term is derived from the Greek apologiste, which embodies as its central notion the idea of defense. In its present application, however, it has somewhat shifted its meaning, and we speak accordingly of apologetics and apologies in contrast with each other. The relation between these two is not that of theory and practice, so, for example, dustadik, nor yet that of genus and species, so, for example, kubel. That is to say, apologetics is not a formal science in which the principles exemplified in apologies are investigated, as the principles of sermonizing are investigated in homiletics. Nor is it merely the sum of all existing, or all possible apologies, or their quintessence, or their scientific exhibition, as dogmatics is the scientific statement of dogmas. Apologies are defences of Christianity in its entirety, in its essence, or in some one or other of its elements or presuppositions, as against either all assailants, actual or conceivable, or some particular form or instance of attack, though of course, as good defences, they may rise above mere defences and become vindications. Apologetics undertakes not the defence, not even the vindication, but the establishment, not strictly speaking of Christianity, but rather of that knowledge of God which Christianity professes to embody and seeks to make efficient in the world, and which it is the business of theology scientifically to explicate. 
It may, of course, enter into defense and vindication when, in the prosecution of its task, it meets with opposing points of view and requires to establish its own standpoint or conclusions. Apologies may, therefore, be embraced in apologetics and form ancillary portions of its structure, as they may also do in the case of every other theological discipline. It is, moreover, inevitable that this or that element or aspect of apologetics will be more or less emphasized and cultivated, as the need of it is from time to time more or less felt. But apologetics does not derive its contents or take its form or borrow its value from the prevailing opposition, but preserves through all varying circumstances its essential character as a positive and constructive science, which has to do with opposition only, like any other constructive science, as the refutation of opposing views becomes from time to time incident to construction. So little is defense or vindication of the essence of apologetics, that there would be the same reason for its existence and the same necessity for its work, were there no opposition in the world to be encountered, and no contradiction to be overcome. It finds its deepest ground, in other words, not in the accidents which accompany the efforts of true religion to plant, sustain, and propagate itself in this world, not even in that most pervasive and most portentous of all these accidents, the accident of sin, but in the fundamental needs of the human spirit. If it is incumbent on the believer to be able to give a reason for the faith that is in him, it is impossible for him to be a believer without a reason for the faith that is in him and it is the task of apologetics to bring this reason clearly out in his consciousness and make its validity plain. It is, in other words, the function of apologetics to investigate, explicate, and establish the grounds on which a theology, a science or systematized knowledge of God, is possible, and on the basis of which every science which has gone for its object must rest, if it be a true science with claims to a place within the circle of the sciences. It necessarily takes its place, therefore, at the head of the departments of theological science, and finds its task in the establishment of the validity of that knowledge of God, which forms the subject matter of these departments, that we may then proceed through the succeeding departments of exegetical, historical, systematic, and practical theology, to explicate, appreciate, systematize, and propagate it in the world. It must be admitted that considerable confusion has reigned with respect to the conception and function of apologetics and its place among the theological disciplines. Nearly every writer has a definition of his own and describes the task of the discipline in a fashion more or less peculiar to himself. And there is scarcely a corner in the theological encyclopedia into which it has not been thrust. Planck gave it a place among the exegetical disciplines. Others contend that its essence is historical. Most wish to assign it either to systematic or practical theology. Nusselt denies it all right of existence. Palmer confesses inability to classify it. Rebiger casts it formally out of the encyclopedia, but reintroduces it under the different name of theory of religion. Tholuck proposes that it should be apportioned through the several departments, and Cave actually distributes its material through three separate departments. Much of this confusion is due to a persistent confusion of apologetics with apologies. If apologetics is the theory of apology, and its function is to teach men how to defend Christianity, its place is, of course, alongside homiletics, catechetics, and poimenics in practical theology. If it is simply, by way of eminence, the apology of Christianity, the systematically organized vindication of Christianity in all its elements and details against all opposition, or in its essential core against the only destructive opposition, it of course presupposes the complete development of Christianity through the exegetical, historical, and systematic disciplines, and must take its place either as the culminating department of systematic theology or as the intellectualistic side of practical theology, or as an independent discipline between the two. In this case, it can be only artificially separated from polemic theology and other similar disciplines, if the analysis is pushed so far as to create these, as is done by F. Dulet de Saint-Projet, who distinguishes between apologetical, controversial, and polemic theology, directed respectively against unbelievers, heretics, and fellow believers, and by A. Kuiper, who distinguishes between polemics, elenctics, and apologetics, opposing respectively heterodoxy, paganism, and false philosophy. 
It will not be strange, then, if those separated from these kindred disciplines, it or some of it, should be again united with them, or some of them, to form a larger whole to which is given the same encyclopedic position. This is done, for example, by Kuiper, who joins polemics, elenctics, and apologetics together to form his antithetical dogmatical group of disciplines, and by F. L. Patton, who, after having distributed the material of apologetics into the two separate disciplines of rational or philosophical theology, to which as a thetic discipline a place is given at the outset of the system, and apologetics joins the latter with polemics to constitute the antithetical disciplines, while systematic theology succeeds both as part of these synthetic disciplines. Much of the diversity in question is due also, however, to varying views of the thing which apologetics undertakes to establish, whether it be, for example, the truth of the Christian religion or the validity of the knowledge of God which theology presents in systematized form. And more of it still is due to profoundly differing conceptions of the nature and subject matter of that theology, a department of which apologetics is. If we think of apologetics as undertaking the defense or the vindication or even the justification of the Christian religion, that is one thing. If we think of it as undertaking the establishment of the validity of that knowledge of God which theology systematizes, that may be a very different thing. And even if agreement exists upon the latter conception, there remains the deeply cutting divergences which beset the definition of theology itself. Shall it be defined as the science of faith, or as the science of religion, or as the science of the Christian religion, or as the science of God? In other words, shall it be regarded as a branch of psychology, or as a branch of history, or as a branch of science? Manifestly, those who differ thus widely as to what theology is cannot be expected to agree as to the nature and function of any one of its disciplines. If theology is the science of faith or of religion, its subject matter is the subjective experiences of the human heart, and the function of apologetics is to inquire whether these subjective experiences have any objective validity. Of course, therefore, it follows upon the systematic elucidation of these subjective experiences and constitutes the culminating discipline of theology. Similarly, if theology is the science of the Christian religion, it investigates the purely historical question of what those who are called Christians believe, and of course the function of apologetics is to follow this investigation with an inquiry whether Christians are justified in believing these things. But if theology is the science of God, it deals not with a mass of subjective experiences, nor with a section of the history of thought, but with a body of objective facts, and it is absurd to say that these facts must be assumed and developed unto their utmost implications before we stop to ask whether they are facts. So soon as it is agreed that theology is a scientific discipline, and has as its subject matter the knowledge of God, we must recognize that it must begin by establishing the reality as objective facts of the data upon which it is based. One may indeed call the department of theology to which the task is committed by any name which appears to him appropriate. It may be called general theology, or fundamental theology, or principial theology, or philosophical theology, or rational theology, or natural theology, or any other of the innumerable names which have been used to describe it. Apologetics is the name which most naturally suggests itself, and it is the name which with more or less accuracy of view as to the nature and compass of the discipline, has been consecrated to this purpose by a large number of writers from Schleiermacher down, for example Pelt, Twesten, Baumstark, Swetz, Ottinger, Knoll, Maisonneuve. It powerfully commends itself as plainly indicating the nature of the discipline, while equally applicable to it whatever may be the scope of the theology which it undertakes to plant on a secure basis. Whether this theology recognizes no other knowledge of God than that given in the constitution and course of nature, or derives its data from the full revelation of God as documented in the Christian scriptures, apologetics offers itself with equal readiness to designate the discipline by which the validity of the knowledge of God set forth is established. It need imply no more than natural theology requires for its basis. When the theology which it serves is, however, the complete theology of the Christian revelation, it guards its unity and protects from the fatally dualistic conception which sets natural and revealed theology over against each other as separable entities, each with its own separate presuppositions requiring establishment. 
by which apologetics would be split into two quite diverse disciplines given very different places in the theological encyclopedia. It will already have appeared how far apologetics may be defined in accordance with a very prevalent custom, for example, Sack, Lechler, Ebrard, Kübel, Lemmer, as the science which establishes the truth of Christianity as the absolute religion. Apologetics certainly does establish the truth of Christianity as the absolute religion, but the question of importance here is how it does this. It certainly is not the business of apologetics to take up each tenet of Christianity in turn and seek to establish its truth by a direct appeal to reason. Any attempt to do this, no matter on what philosophical basis the work of demonstration be begun, or by what methods it be pursued, would transfer us at once into the atmosphere and betray us into the devious devices of the old vulgar rationalism, the primary fault of which was that it asked for a direct rational demonstration of the truth of the truth of each Christian teaching in turn. The business of apologetics is to establish the truth of Christianity as the absolute religion directly only as a whole, and in its details only indirectly. That is to say, we are not to begin by developing Christianity into all its details, and only after this task has been performed, tardily ask whether there is any truth in all this. We are to begin by establishing the truth of Christianity as a whole, and only then proceed to explicate it into its details, each of which, if soundly explicated, has its truth guaranteed by its place as a detail in an entity already established in its entirety. Thus we are delivered from what is perhaps the most distracting question which has vexed the whole history of the discipline. In establishing the truth of Christianity, it has been perennially asked, are we to deal with all its details, for example H. B. Smith, or merely with the essence of Christianity, for example Kübel? The true answer is neither. Apologetics does not presuppose either the development of Christianity into its details, or the extraction from it of all its essence. The details of Christianity are all contained in Christianity, the minimum of Christianity is just Christianity itself. What apologetics undertakes to establish is just this Christianity itself, including all its details, and involving its essence, in its unexplicated and uncompressed entirety as the absolute religion. It has, for this object, the laying of the foundations on which the temple of theology is built, and by which the whole structure of theology is determined. It is the department of theology which establishes the constitutive and regulative principles of theology as a science, and in establishing these it establishes all the details which are derived from them by the succeeding departments, in their sound explication and systematization. Thus it establishes the whole, though it establishes the whole in the mass, so to speak, and not in its details. But yet in its entirety, and not in some single element deemed by us its core, its essence, or its minimum expression. The subject matter of apologetics being determined, its distribution into its parts becomes very much a matter of course. Having defined apologetics as the proof of the truth of the Christian religion, many writers naturally confine it to what is commonly known somewhat loosely as the evidences of Christianity. Others, defining it as fundamental theology, equally naturally confine it to the primary principles of religion in general. Others more justly combine the two conceptions and thus obtain at least two main divisions. Thus Hermann Schutz makes it prove the right of the religious conception of the world as over against the tendencies to the denial of religion and the right of Christianity as the absolutely perfect manifestation of religion, as over against the opponents of its permanent significance. He then divides it into two great sections, with a third interposed between them. The first, the apology of the religious conception of the world, the last, the apology of Christianity, while between the two stands the philosophy of religion, religion in its historical manifestation. Somewhat less satisfactorily, because with a less firm hold upon the idea of the discipline, Henry B. Smith, viewing apologetics as historico-philosophical dogmatics, charged with the defense of the whole contents and substance of the Christian faith, divided the material to much the same effect into what he calls fundamental, historical, and philosophical apologetics. The first of these undertakes to demonstrate the being and nature of God, the second, the divine origin and authority of Christianity, and the third, somewhat lamely as a conclusion to so high an argument, the superiority of Christianity to all other systems. 
Quite similarly, Francis R. Beatty divided into one, fundamental or philosophical apologetics, which deals with the problem of God and religion, two, Christian or historical apologetics, which deals with the problem of revelation and the scriptures, and three, applied or practical apologetics, which deals with the practical efficiency of Christianity in the world. The fundamental truth of these schematizations lie in the perception that the subject matter of apologetics embraces the two great facts of God and Christianity. There is some failure in unity of conception, however, arising apparently from a deficient grasp of the peculiarity of apologetics as a department of theological science, and a consequent inability to permit it as such to determine its own contents and the natural order of its constituent parts. If theology be a science at all, there is involved in that fact, as in the case of all other sciences, at least these three things, the reality of its subject matter, the capacity of the human mind to receive into itself and rationally to reflect this subject matter, the existence of media of communication between the subject matter and the percipient and understanding mind. There could be no psychology were there not a mind to be investigated, a mind to investigate, and a self-consciousness by means of which the mind as an object can be brought under the inspection of the mind as subject. There could be no astronomy were there no heavenly bodies to be investigated, no mind capable of comprehending the laws of their existence and movements, or no means of observing their structure and motion. Similarly, there can be no theology conceived according to its very name as the science of God, unless there is a God to form its subject matter, a capacity in the human mind to apprehend, and so far to comprehend God, and some media by which God is made known to man. That a theology as the science of God may exist, therefore, it must begin by establishing the existence of God, the capacity of the human mind to know him, and the accessibility of knowledge concerning him. In other words, the very idea of theology as the science of God gives these three great topics which must be dealt with in its fundamental department, by which the foundations for the whole structure are laid, God, religion, revelation. With these three facts established, a theology as the science of God becomes possible. With them, therefore, an apologetic might be complete, but that only provided that in these three topics are the underlying presuppositions of the science of God actually built up in our theology are established. For example, provided that all the accessible sources and means of knowing God are exhausted. No science can arbitrarily limit the data lying within its sphere to which it will attend. On pain of ceasing to be the science it professes to be, it must exhaust the means of information open to it, and reduce to a unitary system the entire body of knowledge in its sphere. No science can represent itself as astronomy, for example, which arbitrarily confines itself to the information concerning the heavenly bodies obtainable by the unaided eye, or which discards, without sound ground duly adduced, the aid of, say, the spectroscope. In the presence of Christianity in the world making claim to present a revelation of God adapted to the condition and needs of sinners and documented in scriptures, theology cannot proceed a step until it has examined this claim, and if the claim be substantiated, this substantiation must form a part of the fundamental department of theology in which are laid the foundations of the systematization of the knowledge of God. In that case, two new topics are added to the subject matter with which apologetics must constructively deal, Christianity and the Bible. It thus lies in the very nature of apologetics as the fundamental department of theology, conceived as the science of God, that it should find its task in establishing the existence of a God who is capable of being known by man, and who has made himself known, not only in nature, but in revelations of his grace to lost sinners, documented in the Christian scriptures. When apologetics has placed these great facts in our hands, God, religion, revelation, Christianity, the Bible, and not till then are we prepared to go on and explicate the knowledge of God thus brought to us, trace the history of its workings in the world, systematize it, and propagate it in the world. The primary subdivisions of apologetics are therefore five, unless for convenience of treatment it is preferred to sink the third into its most closely related fellow. One, the first which may perhaps be called philosophical apologetics, undertakes the establishment of the being God as a personal spirit, the creator, preserver, and governor of all things. To it belongs the great problem of theism, with the involved discussion of the anti-theistic theories. 
Two, the second, which may perhaps be called psychological apologetics, undertakes the establishment of the religious nature of man and the validity of his religious sense. It involves the discussion alike of the psychology, the philosophy, and the phenomenology of religion, and therefore includes what is loosely called comparative religion, or the history of religions. 3. To the third falls the establishment of the reality of the supernatural factor in history, with the involved determination of the actual relations in which God stands to his world, and the method of his government of his rational creatures, and especially his mode of making himself known to them. It issues in the establishment of the fact of revelation as the condition of all knowledge of God, who as a personal spirit can be known only so far as he expresses himself so that theology differs from all other sciences in that in it the object is not at the disposal of the subject but vice versa for the fourth which may be called historical apologetics undertakes to establish the divine origin of christianity as the religion of revelation in the special sense of that word it discusses all the topics which naturally fall under the popular caption of the evidences of christianity 5. The fifth, which may be called bibliological apologetics, undertakes to establish the trustworthiness of the Christian scriptures as the documentation of the revelation of God for the redemption of sinners. It is engaged especially with such topics as the divine origin of the scriptures, the methods of the divine operation in their origination, their place in the series of redemptive acts of God, and in the process of revelation, the nature, mode, and effect of inspiration, and the like. The estimate, which is put upon apologetics by scholars, naturally varies with the conception which is entertained of its nature and function. In the wake of the subjectivism introduced by Schleiermacher, it has become very common to speak of such an apologetic as has just been outlined with no little scorn. It is an evil inheritance, we are told, from the old supranaturalism vulgaris, which took its standpoint not from the scriptures, but above the scriptures, and imagined it could, with formal conceptions, develop a ground for the divine authority of Christianity, Heupner, and therefore offered proofs of the divine origin of Christianity, the necessity of revelation, and the credibility of the scriptures, Lemma. To recognize that we can take our standpoint in the scriptures only after we have scriptures authenticated as such to take our standpoint in is, it seems, an outworn prejudice. The subjective experience of faith is conceived to be the ultimate fact and the only legitimate apologetic, just the self-justification of this faith itself. For faith, it seems, after Kant, can no longer be looked upon as a matter of reasoning and does not rest on rational grounds but is an affair of the heart and manifests itself most powerfully when it has no reason out of itself. Brunetier. If repetition had probative force, it would long ago have established that faith, religion, theology lie wholly outside the realm of reason, proof, and demonstration. It is, however, from the point of view of rationalism and mysticism that the value of apologetics is most decried. Wherever rationalistic preconceptions have penetrated, there, of course, the validity of the apologetic proofs has been in more or less of their extent questioned. Wherever mystical sentiment has seeped in, there the validity of apologetics has been with more or less emphasis doubted. At the present moment, the rationalistic tendency is most active, perhaps, in the form given it by Albrecht Ritschl. In this form, it strikes at the very roots of apologetics by the distinction it erects between theoretical and religious knowledge. Religious knowledge is not the knowledge of fact, but a perception of utility, and therefore positive religion, while it may be historically conditioned, has no theoretical basis and is accordingly not the object of rational proof. In significant parallelism with this, the mystical tendency is manifesting itself at the present day most distinctly in a widespread inclination to set aside apologetics in favour of the witness of the spirit. The convictions of the Christian man, we are told, are not the product of reason addressed to the intellect, but the immediate creation of the Holy Spirit in the heart. Therefore, it is intimated, we may do very well without these reasons, if indeed they are not positively noxious, because tending to substitute a barren intellectualism for a vital faith. It seems to be forgotten that, though faith be a moral act and the gift of God, it is yet formally conviction passing into confidence, and that all forms of convictions must rest on evidence as their ground, and it is not faith but reason which investigates the nature and validity of this ground. He who believes, says Thomas Aquinas in words which have become current as an axiom, would not believe unless he saw 
that what he believes is worthy of belief. Though faith is the gift of God, it does not in the least follow that the faith which God gives is an irrational faith, that is, a faith without cognizable ground for right reason. We believe in Christ because it is rational to believe in him, not even though it be irrational. Of course, mere reasoning cannot make a Christian, but that is not because faith is not the result of evidence, but because a dead soul cannot respond to evidence. The action of the Holy Spirit in giving faith is not apart from evidence, but along with evidence, and in the first instance consists in preparing the soul for the reception of the evidence. This is not to argue that it is by apologetics that men are made Christians, but that apologetics supplies to Christian men the systematically organized basis on which the faith of Christian men must rest. All that apologetics explicates in the forms of systematic proof is implicit in every act of Christian faith. Whenever a sinner accepts Jesus Christ as his saviour, there is implicated in that act a living conviction that there is a God, knowable to man, who has made himself known in a revelation of himself for redemption in Jesus Christ, as is set down in the Scriptures. It is not necessary for his act of faith that all the grounds of this conviction should be drawn into full consciousness and given the explicit assent of his understanding, though it is necessary for his faith that sufficient ground for his conviction be actively present and working in his spirit. But it is necessary for the vindication of his faith to reason in the form of scientific judgment that the grounds on which it rests be explicated and established. Theology as a science, though it includes in its culminating discipline, that of practical theology, an exposition of how that knowledge of God with which it deals objectively may best be made the subjective possession of man, is not itself the instrument of propaganda. What it undertakes to do is systematically to set forth this knowledge of God as the object of rational contemplation. And as it has to set it forth as knowledge, it must of course begin by establishing its right to rank as such. Did it not do so, the whole of its work would hang in the air, and theology would present the odd spectacle among the sciences of claiming a place among a series of systems of knowledge for an elaboration of pure assumptions. Seeing that it thus supplies an insistent need of the human spirit, the world has of course never been without its apologetics. Whenever men have thought at all, they have thought about God and the supernatural order, and whenever they have thought of God and the supernatural order, there has been present to their minds a variety of more or less solid reasons for believing in their reality. The enucleation of these reasons into a systematically organized body of proofs waited, of course, upon advancing culture. But the advent of apologetics did not wait for the advent of Christianity, nor are traces of this department of thought discoverable only in the regions lit up by special revelation. The philosophical systems of antiquity, especially those which derive from Plato, are far from empty of apologetical elements. And when, in the later stages of its development, classical philosophy became peculiarly religious, express apologetical material became almost predominant. With the coming of Christianity into the world, however, as the contents of the theology to be stated became richer, so the efforts to substantiate it became more fertile in apologetical elements. We must not confuse the apologies of the early Christian ages with formal apologetics. Like the sermons of the day, they contributed to apologetics without being it. The apologetic material developed by what one may call the more philosophical of the apologists, Aristides, Athenagoras, Tatian, Theophilus, Hermias, Tertullian, was already considerable. It was largely supplanted by the theological labors of their successors. In the first instance, Christianity plunged into a polytheistic environment and called upon to contend with systems of thought grounded in pantheistic or dualistic assumptions, required to establish its theistic standpoint. And as over against the bitterness of the Jews and the mockery of the heathen, for example Tacitus, Fronto, Crescens, Lucian, to evince its own divine origin as a gift of grace to sinful man. Along with Tertullian, the great Alexandrians, Clement and Origen, are the richest depositories of the apologetic thought of the first period. The greatest apologists of the patristic age were, however, Eusebius of Caesarea and Augustine. The former was the most learned and the latter the most profound of all the defenders of Christianity among the fathers. 
and Augustine in particular not merely in his City of God, but in his controversial writings, accumulated a vast mass of apologetical material which is far from having lost its significance even yet. It was not, however, until the scholastic age that apologetics came to its rights as a constructive science. The whole theological activity of the Middle Ages was so far ancillary to apologetics that its primary effort was the justification of faith to reason. It was not only rich in apologists, Agabard, Abelard, Raymond Martini, but every theologian was, in a sense, an apologist. Anselm, at its beginning, Aquinas, at its culmination, are types of the whole series, types in which all its excellencies are summed up. The Renaissance, with its repristination of heathenism, naturally called out a series of new apologists, Savonarola, Marsilius Ficinus, Ludovicus Vives, but the Reformation forced polemics into the foreground and drove apologetics out of sight, although, of course, the great theologians of the Reformation era brought their rich contribution to the accumulating apologetical material. When, in the exhaustion of the 17th century, irreligion began to spread among the people, and indifferentism ripening into naturalism among the leaders of thought, the stream of apologetical thought was once more started flowing, to swell into a great flood as the prevalent unbelief intensified and spread. With a forerunner in Philippe de Mornay, 1581, Hugo Grotius, 1627, became the typical apologist of the earlier portion of this period, while its middle portion was illuminated by the genius of Pascal, died 1662, and the unexampled richness of apologetical labour in its later years culminated in Butler's great analogy, 1736, and Paley's plain but powerful argumentation. As the assault against Christianity shifted its basis from the English deism of the early half of the 18th century, through the German rationalism of its later half, the idealism which dominated the first half of the 19th century, and thence to the materialism of its later years, period after period, was marked in the history of apology, and the particular elements of apologetics, which were especially cultivated, changed with the changing thought. But no epoch was marked in the history of apologetics itself, until under the guidance of Schleiermacher's attempt to trace the organism of the departments of theology, K. H. Sack essayed to set forth a scientifically organized Christian apologetics. Hamburg, 1829, second edition, 1841. Since then, an unbroken series of scientific systems of apologetics has flowed from the press. These differ from one another in almost every conceivable way in their conception of the nature, task, compass, and encyclopedic place of the science, in their methods of dealing with its material, in their conception of Christianity itself, and of religion and of God, and of the nature of the evidence on which belief in one or the other must rest. But they agree in the fundamental point that apologetics is conceived by all alike as a special department of theological science, capable of and demanding separate treatment. In this sense, apologetics has come at last, in the last two-thirds of the 19th century, to its rights. The significant names in its development are such as, perhaps among the Germans, Sack, Steudel, Delitzsch, Eberhard, Baumstark, Töller, Kratz, Kübel, Steuder, Frank, Kaftan, Vogel, Schulz, Kehler, to whom may be added such Romanists as Drei, Dringer, Staudenmeier, Hetting, Schanz, and such English-speaking writers as Hetherington, H. B. Smith, Bruce, Rischel, and Beattie. End of Apologetics by B. B. Warfield Inaugural Address by B. B. Warfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fathers and Brothers It is, without doubt, a very wise provision by which, in institutions such as this, an inaugural address is made a part of the ceremony of induction into the professorship. Only by the adoption of some such method could it be possible for you, as the guardians of this institution, responsible for the principles here inculcated, to give to each newly called teacher an opportunity to publicly declare the sense in which he accepts your faith and signs your standards. 
eminently desirable at all times. This seems particularly so now, when a certain looseness of belief, inevitable parent of looseness of practice, seems to have invaded portions of the Church of Christ, not leaving even its ministry unaffected when there may be some reason to fear that enlightened clerical gentlemen may sometimes fail to look upon subscription to creeds as our covenanting forefathers looked upon the act of putting their names to theological documents and as mercantile gentlemen still look upon endorsement of bills and how much more forcibly can all this be pled when he who appears before you at your call is young untried and unknown i wish therefore to declare that i sign these standards not as a necessary form which must be submitted to but gladly and willingly as the expression of a personal and cherished conviction and further that the system taught in these symbols is the system which will be drawn out of the scriptures in the prosecution of the teaching to which you have called me not indeed because commencing with that system the scriptures can be made to teach it but because commencing with the scriptures i cannot make them teach anything else this much of personal statement I have felt it due both to you and myself to make at the outset, but having done with it, I feel free to turn from all personal concerns. In casting about for a subject on which I might address you, I have thought I could not do better than to take up one of our precious old doctrines, much attacked of late, and ask the simple question, what seems the result of the attack? the doctrine i have chosen is that of verbal inspiration but for obvious reasons i have been forced to narrow the discussion to a consideration of the inspiration of the new testament only and that solely as assaulted in the name of criticism i wish to ask your attention then to a brief attempt to supply an answer to the question is the church doctrine of the plenary inspiration of the new testament endangered by the assured results of modern biblical criticism at the very outset, that our inquiry may not be a mere beating of the air, we must briefly, indeed, but clearly, state what we mean by the church doctrine. For, unhappily, there are almost as many theories of inspiration held by individuals as there are possible stages imaginable between the slightest and the greatest influence God could exercise on man. It is with the traditional doctrine of the Reformed churches, however, that we are concerned, and that we understand to be simply this inspiration is that extraordinary supernatural influence or passively the result of it exerted by the holy ghost on the writers of our sacred books by which their words were rendered also the words of god and therefore perfectly infallible in this definition it is to be noted first that this influence is a supernatural one something different from the inspiration of the poet or man of genius Luke's accuracy is not left by it with only the safeguards which the diligent and accurate Suetonius had. Second, that it is an extraordinary influence, something different from the ordinary action of the Spirit in the conversion and sanctifying guidance of believers. Paul had some more prevalent safeguard against false teaching than Luther or even the saintly Rutherford. Third, that it is such an influence as makes the words written under its guidance the words of God, by which is meant to be affirmed an absolute infallibility as alone fitted to divine words, admitting no degrees whatever, extending to the very word and to all the words, so that every part of holy writ is thus held alike infallibly true in all its statements of whatever kind. Fencing around and explaining this definition, it is to be remarked further, first, that it purposely declares nothing as to the mode of inspiration. The Reformed churches admit that this is inscrutable. They content themselves with defining carefully and holding fast the effects of the divine influence, leaving the mode of divine action by which it is brought about, draped in mystery. Second, it is purposely so framed as to distinguish it from revelation, seeing that it has to do with the communication of truth, not its acquirement. Third, it is by no means to be imagined that it is meant to proclaim a mechanical theory of inspiration. The Reformed churches have never held such a theory, though dishonest, careless, ignorant, or over-eager controverters of its doctrine have often brought the charge. Even those special theologians, in whose teeth such an accusation has been oftenest thrown, for example Galson, are explicit in teaching that the human element is never absent. 
the Reformed churches hold, indeed, that every word of the Scriptures without exception is the word of God, but alongside of that they hold equally explicitly that every word is the word of man. And therefore, though strong and uncompromising in resisting the attribution to the Scriptures of any failure in absolute truth and infallibility, they are, before all others, in seeking and finding and gazing on in loving rapture the marks of the fervid impetuosity of a Paul, the tender saintliness of a John, the practical genius of a James, in the writings which, through them, the Holy Ghost has given for our guidance. Though strong and uncompromising, in resisting all effort to separate the human and divine, they distance all competitors in giving honour alike to both by proclaiming in one breath that all is divine and all is human. As Galson so well expresses it, we all hold that every verse without exception is from men, and every verse without exception is from God. Every word of the Bible is as really from man as it is from God. Fourth, nor is this a mysterious doctrine, except indeed in the sense in which everything supernatural is mysterious. We are not dealing in puzzles, but in the plainest facts of spiritual experience. How close indeed is the analogy here with all that we know of the Spirit's action in other spheres. Just as the first act of loving faith by which the regenerated soul flows out of itself to its Saviour is at once the consciously chosen act of that soul and the direct work of the Holy Ghost, so every word indicted under the analogous influence of inspiration was at one and the same time the consciously self-chosen word of the writer and the divinely inspired word of the Spirit. I cannot help thinking that it is through failure to note and assimilate this fact that the doctrine of verbal inspiration is so summarily set aside and so unthinkingly inveighed against by divines otherwise cautious and reverent. Once grasp this idea and how impossible is it to separate in any measure the human and divine. It is all human, every word, and all divine. The human characteristics are to be noted and exhibited, the divine perfection and infallibility no less. This, then, is what we understand by the church doctrine, a doctrine which claims that by a special, supernatural, extraordinary influence of the Holy Ghost, the sacred writers have been guided in their writing in such a way as, while their humanity was not superseded, it was yet so dominated that their words became, at the same time, the words of God, and thus, in every case and all alike, absolutely infallible. I do not purpose now to undertake the proof of this doctrine. I purpose rather to ask whether, assuming it to have been accepted by the Church as apparently the true one, modern biblical criticism has, in any of its results, reached conclusions which should shake our previously won confidence in it. It is plain, however, that biblical criticism could endanger such a doctrine only by undermining it, by shaking the foundation on which it rests, in other words, by attacking the proof which is relied on to establish it. We have then so far to deal with the proofs of the doctrine. It is evident now that such a doctrine must rest primarily on the claims of the sacred writers. In the very nature of the case, the writers themselves are the prime witnesses of the fact and nature of their inspiration. Nor does this argument run in a vicious circle. We do not assume inspiration in order to prove inspiration. We only assume honesty and sobriety. If a sober and honest writer claims to be inspired by God, then here, at least, is a phenomenon to be accounted for. It follows, however, that besides their claims, there are also secondary bases on which the doctrine of the plenary inspiration of the Scriptures rests, and by the shaking of which it can be shaken. These are, first, the allowance of their claims by the contemporaries of the writers, by those of their contemporaries, that is, who were in a position to judge of the truth of such claims. In the case of the New Testament writers, this means the contemporary church, who had the test of truth in its hands. Was God visibly with the apostles, and did he seal their claims with his blessing on their work? And secondly, the absence of all contradictory phenomena in or about the writings themselves. If the New Testament writers, being sober and honest men, claim verbal inspiration, and this claim was allowed by the contemporary church, and their writings in no respect in their character or details negative it, then it seems idle to object to the doctrine of verbal inspiration on any critical grounds. In order, therefore, to shake this doctrine, biblical criticism must show either that the New Testament writers do not claim inspiration, or that this claim was rejected by the contemporary church, 
or that it is palpably negatived by the fact that the books containing it are forgeries, or equally clearly negatived by the fact that they contain, along with the claim, errors of fact or contradictions of statement. The important question before us today, then, is, has biblical criticism proved any one of these positions? First, note then in the first place that modern biblical criticism does not in any way weaken the evidence that the New Testament writers claim full, even verbal, inspiration. Quite the contrary. The careful revision of the text of the New Testament and the application to it of scientific principles of historico-grammatical exegesis place this claim beyond the possibility of a doubt. This is so clearly the case that even those writers who cannot bring themselves to admit the truth of the doctrines yet not infrequently begin by admitting that the New Testament writers claim such an inspiration as is in it presupposed. Take, for instance, the twin statements of Richard Roth. To wish to maintain the inspiration of the subject matter without that of the words is a folly, for everywhere are thoughts and words inseparable. And it is clear that the orthodox theory of inspiration, by which he means the very strictest, is countenanced by the authors of the New Testament. If we approach the study of the New Testament under the guidance of and in the use of the methods of modern biblical science, more clearly than ever before is it seen that its authors make such a claim. Not only does our Lord promise a supernatural guidance to his apostles, both at the beginning of their ministry, Matthew 10, 19 and 20, and at the close of his life, Mark 12, 11, Luke 21, 12, compare John 14 and 16 but the New Testament writers distinctly claim divine authority. With what assurance do they speak, exhibiting the height of delirium, if not the height of authority? The historians betray no shadow of a doubt as to the exact truth of their every word, a phenomenon hard to parallel elsewhere among accurate and truth-loving historians who commonly betray less and less assurance in proportion as they exhibit more and more painstaking care. The didactic writers claim an absolute authority in their teaching and betray as little shadow of doubt as to the perfectly binding character of their words. 2 Corinthians 10, 7 and 8. If opposed by an angel from heaven, the angel is indubitably wrong and accursed. Galatians 1, 7 and 8. Therefore, how freely they deal in commands. 1 Thessalonians 4, 2, 6, 12, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to 14, 4, 2. Commands 2 which they hold to be absolutely binding on all, so binding that it is the test of a spirit-led man to recognize them as the commandments of God. 1 Corinthians 14.37 And no Christian ought to company with those who reject them. 2 Thessalonians 3.6-14 Nor is it doubtful that this authority is claimed specifically for the written word. In 1 Corinthians 14.37, it is specifically the things which I am writing that must be recognized as the commands of the Lord. And so in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, 14 it is the teaching transmitted by letter as well as by word of mouth that is to be immediately and unquestionably received. Now, on what is this immense claim of authority grounded? If a mere human claim, it is most astounding impudence. But that is... It is not a mere human claim is specifically witnessed to. Paul claims to be but the transmitter of his teaching. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 and 2, bara. It is indeed his own, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14, amon, but still the transmitted word is God's word, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. He speaks indeed and issues commands, but they are not his commands but Christ's, in virtue of the fact that they are given through him by Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4.2 The other writers exhibit the same phenomena. Peter distinctly claims that the gospel was preached in, en, the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 1.12 And John calls down a curse on those who would in any way alter his writing. Revelation 22.18 and 19 Compare 1 John 5.10 these, we submit, are strange phenomena if we are to judge that these writers professed no inspiration. But, we are asked, is this all? We answer that we have just begun. All that we have said is but a cushion for the specific proof to rest easily on. For here we wish to make two remarks. One, the inspiration which is implied in these passages is directly claimed elsewhere. We will now appeal, however, to but two passages – 
look at 1 Corinthians 7.40, where the best and most scientific modern exegesis proves that Paul claimed for his opinion expressed in this letter direct divine inspiration, saying, this is my opinion, and adding, not in modesty or doubt, but in meotic irony, and it seems to me that I have the Spirit of God. If this interpretation be correct, and with the it seems to me, and the very emphatic I staring us in the face, drawing the contrast so sharply between Paul and the impugners of his authority, it seems indubitably so. Then it is clear that Paul claims here a direct divine inspiration in the expression of even his opinion in his letters. Again, look for an instant at 1 Corinthians 2.13, which things also we utter not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, joining spiritual things with spiritual things. Where modern science, more clearly even than ancient faith, sees it stated that both the matter and the manner of his teaching are from the Holy Ghost, both the thoughts and the words, yes, the words themselves. It is not meet, says the Apostle, that the things taught by the Holy Ghost should be expressed in merely human words. They must be spirit-given words to clothe the spirit-given doctrines. Therefore I utter these things not in the words taught by human wisdom, not even in the most wisely chosen human words, but in those taught by the Spirit, joining thus with spirit-given things, as was fit, only spirit-given words. It is impossible to deny that here there is clearly taught a suggestio verborum. Nor will it do to say that this does not bear on the pointed issue, seeing that lohos and not rema is the term used. Not only is even this subterfuge useless in the face of what we have still to urge, but it is even meaningless here. No one supposes that the mere grammatical forms separately considered are inspired. The claim concerns words in their ordered sequence, in their living flow in the sentences, and this is just what is expressed by lohu. This passage thus stands before us distinctly claiming verbal inspiration. The two together seem reconcilable with nothing less far-reaching than the church doctrine. 2. But we must turn to our second remark. It is this. The New Testament writers distinctly place each other's writings in the same lofty category in which they place the writings of the Old Testament, and as they indubitably hold to the full, even verbal, inspiration of the Old Testament, it follows that they claim the same verbal inspiration for the New. Is it doubted that the New Testament writers ascribe full inspiration to the Old Testament? Modern science does not doubt it, nor can anyone doubt it who will but listen to the words of the New Testament writers in the matter. The whole New Testament is based on the divinity of the Old, and its inspiration is assumed on every page. The full strength of the case, then, cannot be exhibited. It may be called to our remembrance, however, that not only do the New Testament writers deal with the Old as divine, but that they directly quote it as divine. Those very lofty titles, Scripture, the Scriptures, the Oracles of God, which they give it, and the common formula quotation, It is written, by which they cite its words, alone imply their full belief in its inspiration. And this is the more apparent that it is evident that for them to say Scripture says is equivalent to their saying God says, Romans 9, 17, 10, 19, Galatians 3, 8. Consequently, they distinctly declare that its writers wrote in the Spirit. Matthew twenty two forty three. compare Luke twenty forty two and Acts 2, 34. The meaning of which is made clear by their further statement that God speaks by their words. Matthew 1, 22, 2, 15, etc. Even those not ascribed to God in the Old Testament itself. Acts 13, 35. Hebrews 8, 8, 1, 6, 7, and 8, 5, 5, Ephesians 4, 8, thereby evincing the fact that what the human authors speak, God speaks through their mouths, Acts 4, 25. Still more narrowly defining this doctrine, it is specifically stated that it is the Holy Ghost who speaks the written words of Scripture, Hebrews 3, 7, yea, even in the narrative parts, Hebrews 4, 4. In direct accordance with these statements, the New Testament writers use the very words of the Old Testament as authoritative and not to be broken. Christ himself so deals with a tense in Matthew 22.32, and twice elsewhere founds an argument on the words, John 10.34, Matthew 22.43, and it is in connection with one of these word arguments that his divine lips declare, the scriptures cannot be broken. His apostles follow his example, Galatians 3.16. 
Still further, we have at least two didactic statements in the New Testament directly affirming the inspiration of the Old, 2 Timothy 3.15 and 2 Peter 1.20. In one of these, it is declared that every scripture is God-inspired. In the other, that no prophecy ever came by the will of man, but borne along by the Holy Ghost it was, that holy men of God spoke. It is, following the best results of modern critical exegesis, therefore, quite certain that the New Testament writers held the full verbal inspiration of the Old Testament. Now, they plainly place the New Testament books in the same category. The same Paul who wrote in 2 Timothy, Every scripture is God-inspired, quotes in its twin letter, 1 Timothy, a passage from Luke's Gospel, calling it Scripture, 1 Timothy 5.18, nay, more, parallelizing it as equally Scripture with a passage from the Old Testament. And the same Peter, who gave us our other didactic statements, and in the same letter, does the same for Paul that Paul did for Luke, and that even more broadly, declaring, 2 Peter 3.16, that all Paul's epistles are to be considered as occupying the same level as the rest of the scriptures. It is quite indisputable, then, that the New Testament writers claim full inspiration for the New Testament books. Now, none of these points are weakened in either meaning or reference by the application of the principles of critical exegesis. In every regard, they are strengthened. We can be quite bold, therefore, in declaring that modern criticism does not set aside the fact that the New Testament writers claim the very fullest inspiration. Second, we must ask then, secondly, if modern critical investigation has shown that this claim of inspiration was disallowed by the contemporaries of the New Testament writers. Here again, our answer must be in the negative. The New Testament writings themselves bristle with the evidences that they expected and received a docile hearing. Parties may have opposed them, but only parties. And again, all the evidence that exists coming down to us from the sub-apostolic church, be it more or less voluminous, yet such as it is admitted to be by the various schools of criticism, points to a very complete reception of the New Testament claims. No church writer of the time can be pointed out who made a distinction derogatory to the New Testament between it and the Old Testament, the divine authority of which latter, it is admitted, was fully recognized in the church. On the contrary, all of them treat the New Testament with the greatest respect, holding its teachings in the highest honor, and run the statement of their theology into its forms of words as if they held even the forms of its statements authoritative. They all know the difference between the authority exercised by the New Testament writers and that which they can lawfully claim. They even call the New Testament books, and that, as is now pretty well admitted, with the fullest meaning, Scripture. Take a few examples. No result of modern criticism is more sure than that Clement of Rome, himself a pupil of apostles, wrote a letter to the Corinthians in the latter years of the first century, and that we now possess that letter, its text witnessed to by three independent authorities and therefore to be depended on. That epistle exhibits all the above-mentioned characteristics, except that it does not happen to quote any New Testament text specifically as scripture. It treats the New Testament with the greatest respect. It teaches for doctrines only for what it teaches. It runs its statements into New Testament forms, it imitates the New Testament style, it draws a broad distinction between the authority with which Paul wrote and that which it can claim. It declares distinctly that Paul wrote most certainly in a spirit-led way. Again, even the most sceptical of schools place the epistle of Barnabas in the first or at the very beginning of the second century, and it again exhibits these same phenomena, moreover quoting Matthew definitely as scripture. One of the latest triumphs of the most acute criticism has been the vindication of the genuineness of the seven short Greek letters of Ignatius, which are thus proved to belong to the very first years of the second century, and to be the production again of one who knew apostles. In them again we meet with the same phenomena. Ignatius even knows of a collected New Testament equal in authority to the divinely inspired Old Testament. But we need not multiply detailed evidence, every piece of Christian writing, which is even probably to be assigned to one who knew or might have known the apostles, bears like testimony. This is absolutely without exception. They all treat the New Testament books as differentiated from all other writings, and no single voice can be adduced as raised against them. The very heretics bear witness to the same effect. Anxious as they are to be rid of the teaching of these writings, they yet hold them authoritative, and so endeavour to twist their words into conformity with their errors. 
and if we follow the stream further down its course, the evidence becomes more and more abundant in direct proportion to the increasing abundance of the literary remains and their change from purely practical epistles or addresses to Jews and heathen to controversial treatises between Christian parties. It is exceedingly clear, then, that modern criticism has not proved that the contemporary church resisted the assumption of the New Testament writers or withstood their claim to inspiration, directly the contrary. Every particle of evidence in the case exhibits the apostolic church not as disallowing but as distinctly recognizing the absolute authority of the New Testament writings. In the brief compass of the extant fragments of the Christian literature of the first two decades of the second century, we have Matthew and Ephesians, distinctly quoted as scripture, the Acts and Pauline epistles, specifically named as part of the Holy Bible, and the New Testament, consisting of evangelic records and apostolic writings, clearly made part of one sacred collection of books with the Old Testament. Let us bear in mind that the belief of the early church in the inspiration of the Old Testament is beyond dispute, and we will see that the meaning of all this is simply this. The apostolic church certainly accepted the New Testament books as inspired by God. Such are the results of critical inquiry into the opinions on this subject of the church writers standing next to the apostles. 3. If then the New Testament writers clearly claim verbal inspiration and the apostolic church plainly allowed that claim, any objection to this doctrine must proceed by attempting to undermine the claim itself. From a critical standpoint, this can be done only in two ways. It may be shown that the books making it are not genuine and therefore not authentic, in which case they are certainly not trustworthy and their lofty claims must be set aside as part of the impudence of forgery. Or it may be shown that the books, as a matter of fact, fall into the same errors and contain examples of the same mistakes which uninspired writings are guilty of, exhibit the same phenomena of inaccuracy and contradiction as they, and therefore, of course, as being palpably fallible by their very character, disprove their claims to infallibility. It is in these two points that the main strength of the opposition to the doctrine of verbal inspiration lies, the first being urged by unbelievers who object to any doctrine of inspiration, the second by believers who object to the doctrine of plenary and universal inspiration. The question is, has either point been made good? First, in opposition to the first, then, we risk nothing in declaring that modern biblical criticism has not disproved the authenticity of a single book of our New Testament. It is a most assured result of biblical criticism that every one of the 27 books which now constitute our New Testament is assuredly genuine and authentic. There is indeed much that arrogates to itself the name of criticism and has that honourable title carelessly accorded to it which does claim to arrive at such results as set aside the authenticity of even the major part of the New Testament. One school would save five books only from the universal ruin. To this, however, true criticism opposes itself directly and boldly proclaims every New Testament book authentic. But thus two claimants to the name of criticism appear and the question arises before what court can the rival claims be adjudicated? before the court of simple common sense, it may be quickly answered. Nor is it impossible to settle once for all the whole dispute. By criticism is meant an investigation with three essential characteristics. One, a fearless, honest mental abandonment, apart from presuppositions, to the facts of the case. Two, a most careful, complete and unprejudiced collection and examination of the facts. And three, the most cautious care in founded inferences upon them. The absence of any one of these characteristics throws grave doubts on the results, while the acme of the uncritical is reached when in the place of these critical graces we find guiding the investigation that other trio, bondage to preconceived opinion, careless, incomplete or prejudiced collection and examination of the facts, and rashness of inference. Now it may well be asked... Is that true criticism, which starts with the presupposition that the supernatural is impossible, proceeds by a sustained effort to do violence to the facts, and ends by erecting a gigantic historical chimera, overturning all established history, on the appropriate basis of airy nothing? And is not this a fair picture of the negative criticism of the day? Look at its history. 
see its series of wild dreams, note how each new school has to begin by executing justice on its predecessor. So Paulus goes down before Strauss, Strauss falls before Bauer, and Bauer before the resistless logic of his own negative successes. Take the grandest of them all, the acutest critic that ever turned his learning against the Christian scriptures, and it will require but little searching to discover that Bauer has ruthlessly violated every canon of genuine criticism. And if this is true of him, what is to be said of the school of Kuhnen, which now seems to be in the ascendant? We cannot now follow theories like this into details, but on a basis of a study of those details, we can remark without fear of successful contradiction that the history of modern negative criticism is blotted all over and every page stained black with the proofs of work undertaken with its conclusion already foregone and prosecuted in a spirit that was blind to all adverse evidence. Footnote. We hear much of apologists undertaking critical study with such preconceived theories as render the conclusion foregone. Perhaps this is sometimes true, but it is not so necessarily. A theist, believing that there is a personal God, is open to the proof as to whether any particular message claiming to be a revelation is really from him or not, and according to the proof he decides. A pantheist or materialist begins by denying the existence of a personal God and hence the possibility of the supernatural. If he begins the study of an asserted revelation, his conclusion is necessarily foregone. An honest theist, thus, is open to evidence either way. An honest pantheist or materialist is not open to any evidence for the supernatural. See some fine remarks on this subject by Dr. Westcott, Contemporary Review, 30, page 1070, end footnote. Who does not know, for example, of the sustained attempts made to pack the witness box against the Christian scriptures, the wild denials of evidence the most undeniable, the wilder dragging into court of evidence the most palpably manufactured? Who does not remember the remarkable attempt to set aside the evidence arising from Barnabas's quotation of Matthew as scripture on the ground that the part of the epistle which contained it was extant only in an otherwise confessedly accurate Latin version, and when Tischendorf dragged an ancient Greek copy out of an Eastern monastery and vindicated the reading, who does not remember the astounding efforts then made to deny that the quotation was from Matthew, or to throw doubt on the early date of the epistle itself? Who does not know the disgraceful attempt made to manufacture, yes, simply to manufacture, evidence against John's gospel, persevered in in the face of all manner of refutation until it seems at last to have received its death blow through one stroke of Dr. Lightfoot's trenchant pen on the silence of Eusebius? In every way, then, this criticism evinces itself as false. But false as it is, its attacks must be tested and the opposition of true criticism to its results exhibited. The attack, then, proceeds on the double ground of internal and external evidence. It is claimed that the books exhibit such contradictions among themselves and errors in historical fact as evince that they cannot be authentic. It is claimed, moreover, that external evidence such as would prove them to have existed in the apostolic times is lacking. How does true criticism meet these attacks? Joining issue first with the latter statement, sober criticism meets it with a categorical denial. It exhibits the fact that every New Testament book, except only the mites Jude 2 and 3 John, Philemon and possibly 2 Peter, are quoted by the generation of writers immediately succeeding the apostles, and are thereby proved to have existed in the apostolic times, and that even these four brief books, which are not quoted by those earliest writers in the very few and brief writings which have come down from them to us, are so authenticated afterwards as to leave no rational ground of doubt as to their authenticity. It is admitted on all hands that there is less evidence for 2 Peter than for any other of our books. If the early date of 2 Peter then can be made good, the early date of all the rest follows a fortiori. And there can be no doubt but that sober criticism fails to find adequate grounds for rejecting 2 Peter from the circle of apostolic writings.
It is an outstanding fact that at the beginning of the 3rd century this epistle was well known. It is during the early years of that century that we meet with the first explicit mention of it, and then it is quoted in such a way as to exhibit the facts that it was believed to be Peter's, and was at that time most certainly in the canon. What has to be accounted for, then, is how came it in the canon of the early 3rd century. It was certainly not put there by those 3rd century writers. Their notices utterly forbid this. Then it must have been already in it in the 2nd century. But when in that century did it acquire this position? Can we believe that critics like Irenaeus or Melito or Dionysius would have allowed it to be foisted before their eyes into a collection they held all holy? It could not then have first attained that entrance during the latter years of the second century, and that it must have been already in the New Testament, received and used by the great writers of the fourth quarter of the second century, seems scarcely open to doubt. Apart from this reasoning, indeed, this seems established. Clement of Alexandria certainly had the book, Irenaeus also in all probability possessed it. If, now, the book formed a part of the canon current to the fourth quarter of the second century, there can be little doubt but that it came from the bosom of the apostolic circle. One has but to catch from Irenaeus, for instance, the grounds on which he received any book as scripture to be convinced of this. The one and all-important sine qua non was that it should have been handed down from the fathers, the pupils of the apostles, as the work of the apostolic circle and Irenaeus was an adequate judge as to whether this was the case. His immediate predecessor in the episcopal office at Lyons was Pothinus, whose long life spanned the whole intervening time from the apostles, and his teacher was Polycarp, who was the pupil of John. That a book formed a part of the New Testament of this period, therefore authenticates it as coming down from those elders who could bear personal witness to its authorship. This is one of the facts of criticism apart from noticing which it cannot proceed. The question, then, is not do we possess independently of this sufficient evidence of the Petrine authorship of the book to place it in the canon, but do we possess sufficient evidence against its Petrine authorship to reject it from the canon of the fourth quarter of the second century, authenticated as that canon as a whole is? The answer to the question cannot be doubtful when we remember that we have absolutely no evidence against the book, but, on the contrary, that all the evidence of whatever kind which is in existence goes to establish it. There is some slight reason to believe, for instance, that Clement of Rome had the letter, more that Hermas had it, and much that Justin had it. There is also a good probability that the early author of the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs had and used it. Any one of these references, independently of all the rest, would, if made good, throw the writing of the book back into the first century. Each supports the others, and the sum of the probabilities raised by all is all in direct support of the inference drawn from the reception of the book by later generations, so that there seems to be really no room for reasonable doubt, but that the book rightly retains its position in our New Testament. This conclusion gains greatly in strength when we compare the data on which it rests with what is deemed sufficient to authenticate any other ancient writing. We find at least two most probable allusions to 2 Peter within a hundred years after its composition, and before the next century passes away we find it possessed by the whole church, and that as a book with a secured position in a collection super-authenticated as a whole. Now, Herodotus, for instance, is but once quoted in the century which followed its composition, but once in the next, not at all in the next, only twice in the next, and not until the fifth century after its composition is it as fully quoted as to Peter during its second century. Yet who doubts the genuineness of the histories of Herodotus? Again, the first direct quotation from Thucydides does not occur until quite two centuries after its composition, while Tacitus is first cited nearly a century after his death by Tertullian. Yet no one can reasonably doubt the genuineness of the histories of either Thucydides or Tacitus. We hazard nothing, then, in declaring that no one can reasonably doubt the authenticity of the better authenticated to Peter. If now such a conclusion is critically tenable, in the case of 2 Peter, what is to be said of the rest of the canon? There are some six writings which have come down to us, which were written within twenty years after the death of John. 
These six brief pieces alone, as we have said, prove the prior existence of the whole New Testament, with the exception of Jude 2 and 3 John, Philemon, and possibly 2 Peter, and the writers of the succeeding years vouch for and multiply their evidence. In the face of such contemporary testimony as this, negative criticism cannot possibly deny the authenticity of our books. A strenuous effort has consequently been made to break the force of this testimony. The genuineness of these witnessing documents themselves has been attacked, or else an attempt has been made to deny that their quotations are from the New Testament books. Neither the one effort nor the other, however, has been or can be successful. And yet, with what energy have they been prosecuted? We have already seen what wild strivings were wasted in an attempt to get rid of Barnabas's quotation of Matthew. That whole question is now given up. It is admitted that the quotation is from Matthew, and it is admitted that Barnabas was written in the immediately sub-apostolic times. But Barnabas quotes not only Matthew, but 1 Corinthians and Ephesians, and in Chaim's opinion, witnesses also to the prior existence of John. This may be taken as a type of the whole controversy. The references to the New Testament books in the Apostolic Fathers are too plain to be disputed, and it is simply the despair of criticism that is exhibited by the invention of elaborate theories of accidental coincidences, or of endless series of hypothetical books to which to assign them. The quotations are too numerous, too close, and glide too imperceptibly and regularly from mere adoption of phrases into accurate citations of authorities to be explained away. They therefore stand and prove that the authors of these writings already knew the New Testament books and esteemed them authoritative. Nor has the attempt to deny the early date of these witnessing writers fared any better. The mere necessity of the attempt is indeed fatal to the theory it is meant to support. If to exhibit the unauthenticity of the New Testament books, we must hold all subsequent writings unauthentic too, it seems plain that we are on a false path. And what violence is done in the attempt? For instance, the epistle of Polycarp witnesses to the prior existence of Matthew, Luke, Acts, eleven epistles of Paul, one Peter and one John, and as Polycarp was a pupil of John, his testimony is very strong. It must then be got rid of at all hazards. But Irenaeus was Polycarp's pupil, and Irenaeus explicitly cites this letter, and declares it to be Polycarp's genuine production, and no one from his time to ours has found cause to dispute his statement until it has become necessary to be rid of the testimony of the letter to our canon. But if Polycarp's letter be genuine, it sets its own date and witness in turn to the letters of Ignatius, which themselves bear internal testimony to their own early date. And these letters of Ignatius testify not only to the prior individual existence of Matthew, John, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, and 1 John, but also to the prior existence of an authoritatively divinely inspired New Testament. This is but a specimen of the linked character of our testimony. Not only is it fairly abundant, but it is so connected by evidently undesigned, indeed, but yet indetachable articulations, that to set aside any one important piece of it usually necessitates such a wholesale attack on the literature of the second century as to amount to a reductio ad absurdum. We may, then, boldly formulate as our conclusion that external evidence imperiously forbids the dethronement of any New Testament book from its place in our canon. What, then, are we to do with the internal evidence that is relied upon by the negative school? What but set it summarily aside also? It amounts to a twofold claim. 1. The sacred writers are hopelessly inconsistent with one another and two, they are at variance with contemporary history. Of course, disharmony between the four Gospels and between Acts and the Epistles is what is mainly relied on under the first point, and it must be admitted that much learning and acuteness has been expended on the effort to make out this disharmony. But it is to be noted, 1 that, even were it admitted up to the full extent claimed, it would be no proof of unauthenticity, it would be no more than that found between secular historians admitted to be authentic when narrating the same actions from different points of view. And two, in no case has it been shown that disharmony must be admitted. 
No case can be adduced where a natural mode of harmonizing cannot be supplied, and it is a reasonable principle recognizing among critics of secular historians that two writers must not be held to be contradictory where any natural mode of harmonizing can be imagined. Otherwise it amounts to holding that we know fully and thoroughly all the facts of the case, better even than eyewitnesses seem ever to know them. In order to gain any force at all, therefore, for this objection, both the extent and degree of the disharmony has been grossly exaggerated. Take an example. It is asserted that the two accounts, in Matthew and Luke, of the events accompanying our Lord's birth are mutually exclusive. But even a cursory examination will show that there is not a single contradiction between them. How, then, is the charge of disharmony supported? In two ways. First, by erecting silence into contradiction. Since Matthew does not mention the visit of the shepherds, he is said to contradict Luke, who does. Since Luke does not mention the flight into Egypt, he is said to contradict Matthew, who does. And secondly, by a still more astounding method, which proceeds by first confounding two distinct transactions and then finding irreconcilable contradictions between them. Thus, Strauss calmly enumerates no less than five discrepancies between Matthew's account of the visit of the angel to Joseph and Luke's account of the visit of the angel to Mary. On the same principle, we might prove both Motley's Dutch Republic and Kingslake's Crimean War to be unbelievable histories by gravely setting ourselves to find discrepancies between the account in the one of the brilliant charges of Egmont at St. Quentin and the account in the other of the great charge of the 600 at Balaclava. This is not an unfair example of the way in which the New Testament is dealt with in order to exhibit its internal disharmony. We are content, however, that it should pass for an extreme case. For it will suffice for our present purpose to be able to say that if the New Testament books are to be proved unauthentic by their internal contradictions, by parity of reasoning the world has never yet seen an authentic writing. In fact, so marvellously are our books at one that, leaving the defensive, the harmonist may take the offensive and claim this unwanted harmony as one of the chief evidences of Christianity. Paley has done this for the Acts and Epistles, and it can be done also for the Gospels. Perhaps we ought to content ourselves with merely repeating this same remark in reference to the charge that the New Testament writers are at variance with contemporary history. So far is this from being true that one of the strongest evidences for Christianity is the utter accord with the minute details of contemporary history which is exhibited in its records. There has been no lack indeed of instances of disaccord confidently put forth, but in every case the charge has recoiled on the head of its maker. Thus the mention of Lysanias in Luke 3.2 was long held the test case of such inaccuracy and sceptics were never weary of dwelling upon it, until it was pointed out that the whole error was not Luke's but the sceptics. Josephus mentions this Lysanias and in such a way that he should not have been confounded with his older namesake, and inscriptions have been brought to light, which explicitly assign him to just Luke's date. And so this stock example vanishes into the air from which it was made. The others have met a like fate. The detailed accuracy of the New Testament writers in historical matters is indeed wonderful, and is more and more evinced by every fresh investigation. Every now and then a monument is dug up, touching on some point adverted to in the New Testament, and in every case only to corroborate the New Testament. Thus, not only has Luke long ago been proved accurate in calling the ruler of Cyprus a proconsul, but Mr. Cessnola has lately brought to light a Cyprian inscription which mentions the same proconsul, Paulus, whom Luke represents Paul as finding on the island. Let us but consider the unspeakable complication of the political history of those times, the frequent changes of provinces from senatorial to imperial and vice versa, the many alterations of boundaries and vacillations of relation to the central power at Rome, which made it the most complicated period the world has ever seen, and renders it the most dangerous ground possible for a forger to enter upon. And how impossible is it to suppose that a book whose every most incidental notice of historical circumstances is found after most searching criticism to be minutely correct, which has threaded all this labyrinth with firm and unfaltering step, was the work of unlearned forgers, writing some hundred years after the facts they record. Confessedly accurate Roman historians have not escaped error here, even Tacitus himself has slipped. 
to think that a second-century forger could have walked scatheless among all the pitfalls that gaped around him is like believing a blind man could thread a row of a hundred cambric needles at a thrust. If we merely apply the doctrine of probabilities to the accuracy of these New Testament writers, they are proved to be the work of eyewitnesses and wholly authentic. We can then, at the end, but repeat the statement with which we began, modern negative criticism, neither on internal nor on external grounds, has been able to throw any doubt on the authenticity of a single book of our New Testament. Their authenticity, accuracy, and honesty are super vindicated by every new investigation. They are thus proved to be the productions of sober, honest, accurate men. They claim verbal inspiration. Their claim was allowed by the contemporary church. So far, modern criticism has gone step by step with traditional faith. There remains but one critical ground on which the doctrine we are considering can be disputed. Do these books in their internal character negative their claim? Are the phenomena of the writings in conflict with the claim they put forth? We must then, in conclusion, consider this last refuge of objection. 2. Much has been already said, incidentally, which bears on this point, but something more is needed. An amount of accuracy, which will triumphantly prove a book to be genuine and surely authentic, careful and honest, may fall short of proving it to be the very word of God. The question now before us is, granting the books to be in the main accurate, are they found on the application of a searching criticism to bear such a character as will throw destructive objection in the way of the dogma that they are verbally from God? This inquiry opens a broad, almost illimitable field, utterly impossible to fully treat here. It may be narrowed somewhat, however, by a few natural observations. First, it is to be remembered that we are not defending a mechanical theory of inspiration. Every word of the Bible is the word of God according to the doctrine we are discussing, but also, and just as truly, every word is the word of a man. This at once sets aside as irrelevant a large number of the objections usually brought from the phenomena of the New Testament against its verbal inspiration. No finding of traces of human influence in the style, wording or forms of statement or argumentation touches the question. The book is throughout the work of human writers and is filled with the signs of their handiwork. This we admit on the threshold and we ask what is found inconsistent with its absolute accuracy and truth. Second, it is to be remembered, again, that no objection touches the question that is obtained by pressing the primary sense of phrases or idioms. These are often false, but they are a necessary part of human speech, and the Holy Ghost, in using human speech, used it as he found it. It cannot be argued, then, that the Holy Spirit could not speak of the sun setting or call the Roman world the whole world. The current sense of a phrase is alone to be considered, and if men so spoke and were understood correctly in so speaking, the Holy Ghost, speaking their speech, would also so speak. No objection, then, is in point which turns on a pressure of language. Inspiration is a means to an end, and not an end in itself. If the truth is conveyed accurately to the ear that listens to it, its full end is obtained. Third, and we must remember again that no objection is valid which is gained by overlooking the prime question of the intentions and professions of the writer. Inspiration, securing absolute truth, secures that the writer shall do what he professes to do, not what he does not profess. If the author does not profess to be quoting the Old Testament verbatim, unless it can be proved that he professes to give the ipsima verba, then no objection arises against his verbal inspiration from the fact that he does not give the exact words. If an author does not profess to report the exact words of a discourse or a document, if he professes to give, or it is enough for his purposes to give, an abstract or general account of the sense or the wording, as the case may be, then it is not opposed to his claim to inspiration that he does not give the exact words. This remark sets aside a vast number of objections brought against verbal inspiration by men who seem to fancy that the doctrine supposes men to be false instead of true to their professed or implied intention. It sets aside, for instance, all objections against the verbal inspiration of the Gospels drawn from the diversity of their accounts of words spoken by Christ or others, written over the cross, etc. 
It sets aside also all objection raised from the freedom with which the Old Testament is quoted, so long as it cannot be proved that the New Testament writers quote the Old Testament in a different sense from that in which it was written, in cases where the use of the quotation turns on this change of sense. This cannot be proved in a single case. The great majority of the usual objections brought against the verbal inspiration of the sacred scriptures from their phenomena, thus being set aside, the way is open to remarking further that no single argument can be brought from this source against the church doctrine which does not begin by proving an error in statement or contradiction in doctrine or fact to exist in these sacred pages. I say that does not begin by proving this. For if the inaccuracies are apparent only, if they are not indubitably inaccuracies, they do not raise the slightest presumption against the full verbal inspiration of the book. Have such errors been pointed out? That seems the sole question before us now, and sober criticism must answer categorically to it, no. It is not enough to point to passages difficult to harmonise. They cannot militate against verbal inspiration unless it is not only impossible for us to harmonise them, but also unless they are of such a character that they are clearly contradictory, so that if one be true, the other cannot by any possibility be true. No such case has as yet been pointed out. Why should the New Testament harmonies be dealt with on other principles than those which govern men in dealing with like cases among profane writers? There, it is a first principle of historical science that any solution which affords a possible method of harmonizing any two statements is preferable to the assumption of inaccuracy or error, whether those statements are found in the same or different writers. To act on any other basis, it is clearly acknowledged, is to assume, not prove, error. We ask only that this recognized principle be applied to the New Testament. Who believes that the historians who record the date of Alexander's death, some giving it the 28th, some the 30th of the month, are in contradiction? And if means can be found to harmonize them, why should not like cases in the New Testament be dealt with on like principles? If the New Testament writers are held to be independent and accurate writers, as they are by both parties in this part of our argument, this is the only rational rule to apply to their writings, and the application of it removes every argument against verbal inspiration drawn from assumed disharmony. Not a single case of disharmony can be proved. The same principle, and with the same results, may be applied to the cases wherein it is claimed that the New Testament is in disharmony with the profane writers of the times, or other contemporary historical sources. But it is hardly necessary to do so. At the most, only three cases of even possible errors in this sphere can be now even plausibly claimed. The statements regarding the taxing under Quirinius, the revolt under Thoidus, and the lordship of Aretas over Damascus. But Zumt's proof that Quirinius was twice governor of Syria, the first time just after our Lord's birth, sets the first of these aside, whereas the other two, while not corroborated by distinct statements from other sources, yet are not excluded either. Room is found for the insignificant revolt of this Thoidus, who is not to be confounded with his later and more important namesake, in Josephus' statement that at this time there were 10,000 revolts not mentioned by him. And the lordship of Aretas over Damascus is rendered very probable by what we know from other sources of the posture of affairs in that region, as well as by the significant absence of Roman Damascene coinage for just this period. Even were the New Testament writers in direct conflict in these, or in other statements, with profane sources, it would still not be proven that the New Testament was in error. There would still be an equal chance, to say the least, much too little as it is, that the other sources were in error. But it is never in such conflict, and therefore cannot be charged with having fallen into historical error, unless we are prepared to hold that the New Testament writers are not to be believed in any statement which cannot be independently of it proved true. In other words, unless it be assumed beforehand to be untrustworthy. This, again, is to assume, not prove, error. Not a single case of error can be proved. We cannot stop to even mention the fact that no doctrinal contradictions or scientific errors can be proved. The case stands or falls confessedly on the one question. Are the New Testament writers contradictory to each other, or to other sources of information in their record of historical or geographical facts? This settled, indubitably, all is settled. 
we repeat then that all the fierce light of criticism, which has so long been beating upon their open pages, has not yet been able to settle one indubitable error on the New Testament writers. This being so, no argument against their claim to write under a verbal inspiration from God can be drawn from the phenomena of their writings. No phenomena can be pled against verbal inspiration except errors. No error can be proved to exist within the sacred pages. That is the argument in a nutshell. Such being the result of the strife which has raged all along the line for decades of years, it cannot be presumptuous to formulate our conclusion here as boldly as the former heads of discourse. Modern criticism has absolutely no valid argument to bring against the church doctrine of verbal inspiration drawn from the phenomena of scripture. This seems indubitably so. It is indeed well for Christianity that it is, for if the phenomena of the writings were such as to negative their distinct claim to full inspiration, we cannot conceal from ourselves that much more than their verbal inspiration would have to be given up. If the sacred writers were not trustworthy in such a witness-bearing, where would they be trustworthy? If they, by their performance, disproved their own assertions, it is plain that not only would these assertions be thus proven false, but also by the same stroke the makers of the assertions convicted of either fanaticism or dishonesty. It seems very evident, then, that there is no standing ground between the two theories of full verbal inspiration and no inspiration at all. Gaulsen is consistent, Strauss is consistent, but those who try to stand between. It is by a divinely permitted inconsistency that they can stand at all. Let us know our position if the New Testament, claiming full inspiration, did exhibit such internal characteristics as should set aside this claim, it would not be a trustworthy guide to salvation. But on the contrary, since all the efforts of the enemies of Christianity, eager to discover error by which they might convict the precious word of life of falsehood, have proved utterly vain, the scriptures stand before us authenticated as from God. They are then just what they profess to be, and criticism only secures to them the more firmly the position they claim. Claiming to be verbally inspired, that claim was allowed by the church which received them. Their writers approve themselves sober and honest men, and evince the truth of their claim, by the wonder of their performance. So then, gathering all that we have attempted to say into one point, we may say that modern biblical criticism has nothing valid to urge against the church doctrine of verbal inspiration, but that, on the contrary, it puts that doctrine on a new and firmer basis and secures to the church scriptures which are truly divine. Thus, although nothing has been urged formally as a proof of the doctrine, we have arrived at such results as amount to a proof of it. If the sacred writers clearly claim verbal inspiration, every phenomenon supports that claim, and all critical objections break down by their own weight. How can we escape admitting its truth? What further proof do we need? With this conclusion I may fitly close, but how can I close without expression of thanks to him who has so loved us as to give us so pure a record of his will, God given in all its parts, even though cast in the forms of human speech, infallible in all its statements, divine even to its smallest particle? I am far from contending that without such an inspiration there could be no Christianity. Without any inspiration we could have had Christianity, yea, and men could still have heard the truth and through it being awakened and justified and sanctified and glorified. The verities of our faith would remain historically proven true to us, so bountiful has God been in his fostering care, even had we no Bible, and through those verities salvation. But to what uncertainties and doubts would we be the prey? To what errors, constantly begetting worse errors, exposed? To what refuges, all of them refuges of lies, driven? Look but at those who have lost the knowledge of this infallible guide. See them evincing man's most pressing need by inventing for themselves an infallible church, or even an infallible pope. Revelation is but half revelation unless it be infallibly communicated. It is but half communicated unless it be infallibly recorded. The heathen, in their blindness, are our witness of what becomes of an unrecorded revelation. Let us bless God, then, for his inspired word. And may he grant that we may always cherish, love, and venerate it, and conform all our life and thinking to it. So may we find safety for our feet, and peaceful security for our souls. End of Inaugural Address by B.B. B. Warfield
Spiritual Culture in the Theological Seminary, Part 1, by B.B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It is natural that at the opening of a new session, the minds of both professors and students, especially of those students who are with us for the first time, should be bent somewhat anxiously upon the matter which has brought us together. How are we who teach best to fulfil the trust committed to us of guiding others in the preparation for the high office of Minister of Grace? How are you who are here to make this preparation so to employ your time and opportunities as to become in the highest sense true stewards of the mysteries of Christ? Standing as you do at the close of your university work and at the beginning of three years more of mental labour, looking back at the conquests you have already made and forward at unconquered realms still lying before you, it would not be strange if your thoughts as they busy themselves with the preparation you require for your ministerial work should be predominantly occupied with intellectual training. It is the more important that we should pause to remind ourselves that intellectual training alone will never make a true minister, that the heart has rights which the head must respect, and that it behooves us above everything to remember that the ministry is a spiritual office. I should be sorry to leave the impression that it is questionable whether the church may not have laid too strong an emphasis on the intellectual outfit that is needed for her ministry. I must profess, indeed, that I am incapable of understanding the standpoint of those, for such there seem to be, who talk of the over-intellectualization of the ministry. The late Dr. Joseph T. Duria spoke rather strongly, but with substantial justice, when he declared it to be high time that the question whether culture and learning do not unfit preachers for the preaching of the gospel to ordinary men and women were referred back without response to the stupidity that inspires it. It is not to be denied, of course, that there are learned men who are perfectly useless in the ministry, and even, what is more surprising, that there are men of broad and varied, and, one would have thought, humanizing culture, who seem to be unable to turn their culture to any practical use. But it is yet to be shown that these same men without knowledge and destitute of the culture which might have been expected to humanize them would have been any more useful. Are there no ignorant men, no men innocent of all culture who are unpractical and of no possible use in the ministry? The fact is that when our Lord decreed that the religion he founded should be propagated by preaching, or to put it more broadly, when he placed it in the world with the commission to reason its way to the hearts of men, he put a premium on intellectual endowments and laid at the basis of ministerial equipment a demand for intellectual training, which no sophistry can cloud. The minister must have good tools with which to work and must keep these tools in good condition. You will find nothing in the curriculum which will be offered to you in this seminary, the mastery of which is not essential to your highest efficiency in your ministry. The intellectual training at present provided for candidates for the ministry is not above either their prospective needs or the easy possibilities of their present powers. You will be wise to give yourselves diligently to making full account of it. It would not be easy to exaggerate the intimacy of the relation between sound knowledge and sound religious feeling, and the connection between sound knowledge and success in ministerial work is equally close. Without study says an experienced bishop of the Church of England with his eye on the daily life of the minister, it is true, but no less applicably to his preparation. Without study, we shall not only fail to bring to our people all the blessings which God intends for them, but we shall gradually become feeble and perfunctory in our ministrations. Our life may apparently be a busy one and our time incessantly occupied, but our work will be comparatively fruitless. We shall be fighting as one that beateth the air." So intimate is the connection between the head and the heart and hand, indeed, that it is not unfair to say broadly that if undue intellectualism exhibits itself in those preparing for the ministry, the fault is relative, not absolute, that in a word there is not a too muchness in the case at all, but a too littleness somewhere else. The trouble with those whom a certain part of the world persists in speaking of as over-educated for an effective ministry 
is not that they are too highly trained intellectually, but that they are sadly undertrained spiritually. Not that their head has received too much attention, but that their heart has received too little. Of course, I shall not deny that it is possible to find men who are naturally lacking in sufficient mental power to pursue a seminary course profitably. And I am far from saying that there are none of these unlearned and ignorant men who have been so baptized with the Holy Spirit that the Church may profitably induct them into the ministry to which God has obviously called them. But these are rare exceptions, and I do not think it characteristic of this humble but honorable class that they refuse to make the best possible use of the mental powers that have been vouchsafed to them. Certainly, it would be perilous for us to make the existence of such a class the excuse for neglecting to stir up the gift that is in us. Rather, I think it may be fairly inferred that when students for the ministry fail to take full advantage of the opportunities for intellectual culture offered them, the fault is usually to be found in the heart itself. When too much blood seems to have gone to the head, we may ordinarily justly presume that this is only because too little has gone to the heart. And similarly, when little or none is thrown to the head, we may quite generally suspect it is because the heart has too little within it to supply the needs of any organ. I have missed my mark in what I have been saying if, while insisting on the need of a strenuous intellectual preparation for the ministry, I have not also suggested that the deepest need is a profound spiritual preparation. An adequate preparation for the gospel ministry certainly embraces much more than merely the study of certain branches of learning. When Bishop Wilberforce opened Cuddeston College in 1854, he wrote, Threefold object of residence here. One, devotion. Two, parochial work. Three, theological reading. The special circumstances of candidates for holy orders in the Church of England suggested, as we shall subsequently see, the order in which these three elements in their preparation are mentioned. In our special circumstances, a different order might be suggested, but it does not, even on first sight, commend itself to you with clear convincingness that any proper preparation for the ministry must include these three chief parts, a training of the heart, a training of the hand, a training of the head, a devotional, a practical, and an intellectual training. Such a training, in a word, as that we may learn first to know Jesus, then to grasp the message he would have us deliver to men, and then how he would have us work for him in his vineyard. We are told by the evangelist Mark, 314, that when Jesus appointed his twelve apostles, it was first that they might be with him, and then that he might send them forth to preach. And surely we may believe that we who are the successors of the apostles as the evangelizers of the world have been called like them, first of all to be with Jesus, and only then to go forth to preach. It may not be without significance that out of the 14 or 15 qualifications which, according to the Apostle Paul, must unite in order to fit a man to be a bishop, only one requires an intellectual preparation. The bishop must be apt to teach, but aptness to teach is only the beginning of his fitting. All the other requirements are rooted in his moral or spiritual fitness. I am not going to lose myself in a vain, perhaps worse than vain, inquiry as to which of the three lines of preparation I have hinted at is the most essential. Why raise a question between three lines of training, each of which is essential both in itself and to the proper prosecution of the others? If intellectual acuteness will not of itself make a man an acceptable minister of Christ, neither will facility and energy in practical affairs by themselves nor yet piety and devotion alone. The three must be twisted together into a single three-ply cord. We are not to ask whether we will cultivate the one or the other, or whether we will give our chief attention to the one or the other. We must simultaneously push our forces over all three lines of approach, if we are to capture the stronghold of a successful ministry at all. Doing so, they will interact, as we have suggested, each to secure the others. Do we wish to grow in grace? It is the knowledge of God's truth that sanctifies the heart. Do we desire a key to the depths of God's truth? It is a spirit-led man who discerns all things. Are our hearts in travail for the dying thousands about us? How eager, then, will be our search in the fountain of life for the waters of healing? Is the way weary? Do we not know whence alone can be derived our strength for the journey of life? 
there is no way so surely to stimulate the appetite for knowledge as to quicken the sense of the need of it in the wants of our own spiritual life or in the calls of practical work for others. There is no way so potent for awakening a craving for personal holiness or for arousing a love of souls in our hearts as to fill the mind with a knowledge of God's love to man as revealed in his holy book. The reciprocal relation in which the several lines of preparation for the ministry stand to one another supplies me with my first remark as I address myself to the task immediately before me of attempting to outline in a practical way some account of how your spiritual training may be advanced during your stay in the seminary. This remark takes a negative form and amounts to saying with some emphasis that your spiritual growth will not be advanced by the neglect of the very work for which you resort to the seminary. Such a remark may seem to some of you out of place. It is perhaps not so entirely unnecessary as it may appear. There is a valuable bit from his own personal experience given us by the late Philip Brooks in his Yale lectures, which I shall repeat here for our admonition also. He is impressing on his readers the important truth that the first and most evident element in a true preparation for the ministry consists in a mastery of the professional studies leading up to it. He writes as follows. Most men begin really to study when they enter on the preparation for their professions. Men whose college life with its general culture has been very idle begin to work when the door of the professional school, the work of their life, comes into sight before them. It is the way in which a bird who has been wheeling vaguely hither and thither sees at last its home in the distance and flies toward it like an arrow. But shall I say to you how often I have thought that the very transcendent motives of the young minister's study have a certain tendency to bewilder him and make his study less faithful than that of men seeking other professions from lower motives. The highest motive often dazzles before it illuminates. It is one of the ways in which the light within us becomes darkness. I never shall forget my first experience of a divinity school. I had come from a college where men studied hard but said nothing about faith. I had never been at a prayer meeting in my life. The first place I was taken to at the seminary was the prayer meeting, and never shall I lose the impression of the devoutness with which those men prayed and exhorted one another. Their whole souls seemed exalted and their natures were on fire. I sat bewildered and ashamed and went away depressed. On the next day I met some of these same men at a Greek recitation. It would be little to say of some of the devoutest of them, that they had not learnt their lesson. Their whole way showed that they had never learnt their lessons, that they had not got hold of the first principles of hard, faithful, conscientious study. The boiler had no connection with the engine. The devotion did not touch the work, which then and there was the work and the only work for them to do. By and by I found something of where the steam did escape to. A sort of amateur, premature preaching was much in vogue among us, we were in haste to be at what we called our work, a feeble twilight of the coming ministry we lived in. The people in the neighbourhood dubbed us parsonettes. Oh, my fellow students, the special study of theology and all that appertains to it, that is what the preacher must be doing always, but he can never do it afterward as he can in the blessed days of quiet in Arabia after Christ has called him and before the apostles lay their hands upon him. In many respects, an ignorant clergy, however pious it may be, is worse than none at all. The more the empty head glows and burns, the more hollow and thin and dry it grows. The knowledge of the priest, said St. Francis de Sales, is the eighth sacrament of the church. Well, it was not at Princeton Seminary that Dr. Brooks saw these evils. Perhaps they do not exist here. Let us hope that they do not, at least in the measure in which he portrays them. Nevertheless, his experience may fitly be laid to heart by us for our warning. The religious training which a minister needs to get in his days of preparation, assuredly, cannot be had by neglecting the very work he is set to do in favour of any show of devoutness which does not affect the roots of his conduct, or of any show of zeal in another work which it is not yet his to do. Of course, there is another side to it. This religious training is not already obtained by the mere refusal to be led away from our primary work at the seminary by practical calls upon our energies. Our primary business at the seminary is, no doubt, to obtain the intellectual fitting for our ministerial work, and nothing must be allowed to supersede that in our efforts. 
but neither must the collateral prosecution of the requisite training of the heart and hand be neglected as opportunity offers nor will a properly guarded attention to these injure the discharge of our scholastic duties. It will, on the contrary, powerfully advance their successful performance. The student cannot too sedulously cultivate devoutness of spirit. The maxim has been often verified in the experience of us all. Bene orasse est bene studuisse. When the heart is thoroughly aroused, the slowest mind starts into motion and an impulse is given it which carries it triumphantly over intellectual difficulties before which it quailed afraid. And equally, a proper taste of the practical work of the ministry is a great quickener of the mind for the intellectual preparation. We cannot do without these things, and the student must be very careful, therefore, even on this somewhat low ground, while not permitting any distractions to divert him from his primary task as a student, yet to take full advantage of all proper opportunities that may arise to train his heart and hand also. Preparation for ministerial service is very much like building a machine, say a locomotive. The intellectual work may have been accomplished and the machine may stand perfect before us, but it will not go unless the vital force of devotion is throbbing through it. Knowledge is a powerful thing and practical tact is a powerful thing, and so is a locomotive a powerful thing, provided it has steam in it. Though I know all mysteries and all knowledge and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, if I have not the love of God and man welling up in invincible power beneath it all, and lifting it all and transmuting it all into effective working force, it profits me nothing. But the question comes back to us, how are we to obtain this spiritual culture in the seminary? Well, theological students in becoming theological students have not ceased to be men, and there is no other way for them to become devout men than that which is common to man. There is but one way, brethren, to become strong in the Lord, that way is to feed on the bread of life. This is the way other men, who would fain be devout, take, and it is the way we, if we would fain be devout, must take. We are simply asking ourselves then, as theological students, what opportunities are offered us by our residence in the seminary for the cultivation of faith in Jesus Christ and obedience to Him. What we are eager to know is how we can not merely keep alive, but fan into a brighter flame the fires of our love for our Lord and Saviour. I desire to be perfectly plain and simple in attempting to suggest an answer to this question. I shall therefore only enumerate in the barest manner some of the ways in which the devout life may be assisted in the conditions in which we live in the seminary. First of all, I must point you to the importance of a diligent use of the public means of grace. Public means of grace abound in the seminary. There is the stated Sabbath morning service in the chapel, and no student who is not prevented from attending it by some imperative duty should fail to be in his seat at that service, adding whatever his presence and his prayers can bring to the spiritual forces at work there. Then there is our weekly conference on Sabbath afternoon, in which we talk over together the blessed promises of our God and seek to learn better his will for the ordering of our lives. There have been those in times past whose hearts have been stirred within them at these conferences, and they may be made by the seeking spirit very precious seasons of social meditation and prayer. Then faculty and students meet daily at the close of the day's work to listen to a fragment of God's word, mingle their voices in praise to God, and ask his blessing on the labor of the day. Indeed, we proceed to no one of our classroom exercises without pausing a moment to lift up our hearts to God in prayer. And every effort is made by all of us who teach, I know, in all our teaching, however it may appear from moment to moment to be concerned with mere parts of speech, or the signification of words, or the details of history, or the syllogisms of formal logic, to preserve a devout spirit and a reverent heart, as becomes those who are dealing even with the outer coverings that protect the mysteries of God. I need not stay to speak with particularity of the more rarely occurring stated services, such as the monthly concert of prayer for missions and the like. Enough has been said to suggest the richness of provision made in the seminary for public worship, and assuredly, amid such abounding opportunities for the quickening of the religious life, it ought to be a comparatively easy thing to cultivate devoutness of spirit. You will doubtless observe that I have said nothing, so far, of additional opportunities for social worship afforded by public services open to the attendance of the students outside the boundaries of the seminary, or by voluntary associations for religious culture among the students themselves. 
These also are abundant and have their parts to play in your edification. They may be justly accounted supplementary means of grace, useful to you, each in its own place and order. But what I am insisting on now is something which no such services, whether without or within the seminary walls, can supply. Something which, by the grace of God, can go much deeper into the bases of your religious nature and lay much broader foundations for the building up of a firm and consistent and abiding Christian character. I am exhorting you to give great diligence to the cultivation of the stated means of grace provided by the seminary, to live in them and make them the full and rich expression of the organic religious life of the institution. I am touching on something here that seems to me to be of the utmost importance and which does not seem to me to have received the attention from the students which it deserves. Every body of men bound together in as close and intimate association as we are must have an organic life and if the bonds that bind them together are fundamentally of a religious character, this organic life must be fundamentally a religious one. We do not live on the top of our privileges in such circumstances unless we succeed in giving this organic religious life full power in our own lives and full expression in the stated means provided for its expression. No richness of private religious life, no abundance of voluntary religious services on the part of members of the organism can take the place of or supersede the necessity for the fullest, richest and most fervent expression of this organic religious life through its appropriate channels. I exhort you, therefore, brethren, with the utmost seriousness, to utilize the public means of grace afforded by the seminary and to make them instruments for the cultivation and expression of the organic religious life of the institution. We shall not have done our duty by our own souls until we find in these public services the joy of our hearts and the inspiration of our conduct. Let me go a step further and put into plain words a thought that is floating in my mind. The entire work of the seminary deserves to be classed in the category of means of grace, and the whole routine of work done here may be made a very powerful means of grace if we will only prosecute it in a right spirit and with due regard to its religious value. For what are we engaging ourselves with in our daily studies but just the word of God, the history of God's dealings with his people, the great truths that he has revealed to us for the salvation of our souls? And what are we doing when we engage ourselves day after day with these topics of study and meditation, but just what every Christian man strives to do when he is seeking nutriment for his soul? The only difference is that what he does sporadically, at intervals, and somewhat primarily, it is your privilege to give yourself to unbrokenly for a space of three whole years. Precious years these ought to be to you, brethren, in the culture of the spiritual life. If such contact as we in the seminary have the privilege of enjoying with divine truth does not sanctify our souls, should we not infer either that it is a mistake to pray in Christ's own words, sanctify us in the truth, thy word is truth, or else that our hearts are so indurated as no longer to be capable of reaction even to so powerful a reagent as the very truth of God? I beseech you, brethren, take every item of your seminary work as a religious duty. I am emphasizing the adjective in this. I mean, do all your work religiously, that is, with a religious end in view, in a religious spirit, and with the religious side of it dominant in your mind. Do not lose such an opportunity as this to enlighten, deepen, and strengthen your devotion. Let nothing pass by you without sucking the honey from it. If you learn a Hebrew word, let not the merely philological interest absorb your attention. Remember that it is a word which occurs in God's holy book. Recall the passages in which it stands. Remind yourself what great religious truths it has been given to it to have a part in recording for the saving health of men. Every biblical text whose meaning you investigate treat as a biblical text, a part of God's holy word, before which you should stand in awe. It is wonderful how even the strictest grammatical study can be informed with reverence. You cannot read six lines of Bishop Ellicott's commentaries, critical and grammatical, on Paul's epistles without feeling through and through that here is a man studying the word of God. O si sic omnes, let us make such commentators our models in our study of the word and learn like them to keep in mind whose word it is we are dealing with, even when we are merely analysing its grammatical expression. And when, done with grammar, we begin to weigh the meaning, oh, let us remember what meaning it has to us. Apply every word to your own souls as you go on, and never rest satisfied until you feel as well as understand. 
Every item of God's dealing with his church, to which your attention is directed, contemplate reverently as an act of God, and search out the revelation it carries of God and his ways with man. And the doctrines, need I beg you to consider these doctrines, not as so many propositions to be analysed by your logical understanding, but as rather so many precious truths revealing to you God and God's modes of dealing with sinful man. John Owen, in his great work on justification, insists and insists again that no man can ever penetrate the significance of this great doctrine unless he persistently studies it, not in the abstract light of the question, how can man be just with God, but in the searching light of the great personal question, how can I, sinner as I am, be accepted of God? It is wonderful how inadequacies in conceiving what is involved in justification fall away under the illumination of this personal attitude towards it. And is it conceivable that it can be so studied and the heart remain cold and unmoved? Treat, I beg you, the whole work of the seminary as a unique opportunity offered you to learn about God, or rather, to put it at the height of its significance, to learn God, to come to know Him whom to know is life everlasting. If the work of the seminary shall be so prosecuted, it will prove itself to be the chief means of grace in all your lives." I have heard it said that some men love theology more than they love God. Do not let it be possible to say that of you. Love theology, of course, but love theology for no other reason than it is theology, the knowledge of God, because it is your meat and drink to know God, to know Him truly, and as far as it is given to mortals, to know Him whole. End of Spiritual Culture in the Theological Seminary, Part 1, by B.B. B. Warfield. Spiritual Culture in the Theological Seminary, Part 2, by B.B. B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There is yet another aspect of the seminary life, the value of which as a means of spiritual development cannot easily be overestimated. I do not know how better to express what I mean than by calling the seminary a three years retreat. The word retreat may strike somewhat strangely upon our Protestant ears, though even our Presbyterian ministry has been learning of late what a retreat is. Well, that is what a seminary life very largely is, a period of three years' duration, during which the prospective minister withdraws from the world and gives his time exclusively to study and meditation on God's word, in company with a select body of godly companions. Here man more purely lives, less oft doth fall, more promptly rises, walks with stricter heed. Possibly, with our natural Protestant objection to all that in the remotest way savours of the monastery, we may be prone to take little account of this feature of seminary life, much to our hurt. Much to our hurt, I say, for a retreat is what a seminary life is, and it will have its effect on us as such, one way or another, according as we do or do not prepare for it, and are or are not receptive of it. Our brethren in the Church of England, who have only comparatively lately taken to multiplying distinctively theological colleges because they look to the universities as the places where their candidates are to be educated for the holy office, consider this element in the life at a theological college one of its most characteristic and helpful features. It was because he viewed it thus that Bishop Wilberforce declared the three objects of residence at Cuddeston to be one devotion, two parochial work, and three theological reading. It is, as a matter of fact, inevitable that the practical withdrawal from the world and the congregation together of a hundred or two young men, all consecrated to the work of the Lord, and living in that closeness of intimacy which only community life can induce, should have a very powerful effect on their religious development. What, brethren, can you draw coals together without creating a blaze? I beseech you, esteem very highly and cultivate with jealous eagerness this unique privilege of long and intimate association with so many of God's children. No such opportunities of interaction, of devout lives upon one another, can ever come to you again in all your life. If no fire of Christian love breaks out among you, look well to yourselves, you may justly suspect there is something wrong with your souls." In the daily intercourse of scores of Christian men, there must arise innumerable opportunities of giving and receiving spiritual impressions. See to it 
that all you give shall conduce to the quickening of the religious life, and that all you receive shall be food on which your own hearts feed and grow strong in the Lord. When you leave the seminary you will miss this intercourse sorely, but by God's help you may so use it while here, that in the strength derived from it you may go many days. But we must penetrate beneath even such means of grace as those I have enumerated before we reach the centre of our subject. It is not to the public ordinances, not to your professors, and not even to your companions that you can look for the sources of your growth in religious power. As no one can give you intellectual training except at the cost of your own strenuous effort, so no one can communicate to you spiritual advancement apart from the activities of your own eager souls. True devoutness is a plant that grows best in seclusion and the darkness of the closet and we cannot reach the springs of our devout life until we penetrate into the sanctuary where the soul meets habitually with its god if association with god's children powerfully quickens our spiritual life how much more intimate communion with god himself let us then make it our chief concern in our preparation for the ministry to institute between our hearts and god our maker redeemer and sanctifier such an intimacy of communion that we may realize in our lives the command of paul to pray without ceasing and in everything to give thanks and that we may see fulfilled in our own experience our lord's promise not only to enter into our hearts but unbrokenly to abide in them and to unite them to himself in an intimacy comparable to the union of the father and the son Lectio, meditatio, oratio, the old doctors used to say, jaciunt theologum. They were right. Take the terms in the highest senses they will bear, and we shall have an admirable prescription of what we must do would we cultivate to its height the Christian life that is in us. Above all else that you strive after, cultivate the grace of private prayer. It is a grace that is capable of cultivation and that responds kindly to cultivation, as it can be, on the other hand, atrophied by neglect be not of those that neglect it but in constant prayer be a follower of paul or rather of our lord himself for god as he was our blessed lord was a man of prayer and found prayer his ceaseless joy and his constant need of course the spirit of prayer is the main thing here and the habit of praying without ceasing of living in a prayerful frame is above all what is to be striven for but let us not fall into the grave error of supposing this prayerful habit of mind enough or that we can safely intermit the custom of setting apart seasons for formal prayer. Let me read you a few appropriate words here from one of Dr. H. C. G. Mole's delightful devotional treatises. To speak in terms of the simplest practicality, he says, the living Christian will do anything rather than make his life an excuse for indolence and for want of method and self-discipline in secret devotion, or for want of adoring reverence in the matter of it, or for neglect of the written word as a vital element in it, or as the one sure guide and guard of it all along. He will most specially take care that Christ is thus in his life in respect of morning intercourse with him. His morning watch will be a time of sacred necessity and blessed benefit. He will not merely confess the duty of meeting God before he meets man. He will understand that he cannot do without it, if indeed he would deal with the unfolding day as it should be dealt with by one whose life is hid with Christ in God, one who possesses the priceless treasure of the blessed union joined to the Lord, one spirit, and who has his treasure at hand, in hand for use. And he will be not less watchful over his evening interview with him who is at once his master and his life, coming with punctual reverence to him, who meanwhile liveth in him, to report the day's bond service, to confess the day's sins in contrite simplicity, to look again deliberately upon his master's face mirrored in his word, to feel again the bond of the union, tested and handled through the promises, and then to lie down in the peace of God. And will he not see whether some midday interval, if but for a few brief minutes, cannot be found and kept sacred for a special prayer and watch halfway? Such stated times are not substitutes for the spiritual attitude in which the eyes are ever toward the Lord, but they are, I believe, quite necessary in order to the proper preparedness of the soul for that attitude and for the right use, too, of all public and social ordinances. Nothing can annul the vital need of secret and deliberate communion with him in whom we live, by whom we move. Next to the prayerful spirit, the habit of reverent meditation on God's truth is useful in cultivating devoutness of life. It is commonly said around us that the old gift of meditation has perished out of the earth. 
and certainly there is much in our nervous fussy times which does not take kindly to it. Those who read nowadays like to do it running. It is assuredly worth our while, however, to bring back the gracious habit of devout meditation, says Jeremy Taylor in the opening pages of his Holy Living in his quaint old world words. The counsels of religion are not to be applied to the distempers of the soul as men used to take hellebore, but they must dwell together with the spirit of a man and be twisted about his understanding for ever. They must be used like nourishment, that is, by a daily care and meditation, not like a single medicine and upon the actual pressure of a present necessity. It is the same lesson that Mr. Spurgeon expounds in his illuminating way in a passage like the following. We ought to muse upon the things of God because we thus get the real nutriment out of them. Truth is something like the cluster of a vine. If we would have wine from it, we must bruise it. We must press and squeeze it many times. The bruiser's feet must come down joyfully upon the bunches, or else the juice will not flow. And they must well tread the grapes, or else much of the precious liquid will be wasted. So we must, by meditation, tread the clusters of truth, if we would get the wine of consolation therefrom. Our bodies are not supported merely by taking food into the mouth, but the process which really supplies the muscles and the nerve and the sinew and the bone is the process of digestion. It is by digestion that the outer food becomes assimilated with the inner life. Our souls are not nourished merely by listening a while to this and then to that and then to the other part of divine truth. Hearing, reading, marking and learning all require inwardly digesting to complete their usefulness and the inward digesting of the truth lies, for the most part, in meditating upon it. Why is it that some Christians, although they hear many sermons, make but slow advances in the divine life? Because they neglect their closets and do not thoughtfully meditate on God's word. They love the wheat, but they do not grind it. They would have the corn, but they will not go forth into the fields to gather it. The fruit hangs upon the tree, but they will not pluck it. The water flows at their feet, but they will not stoop to drink it. From such folly deliver us, O Lord, and be this our resolve this day, I will meditate on thy precepts. Meditation is an exercise which stands somewhere between thought and prayer. It must not be confounded with mere reasoning, it is reasoning transfigured by devout feeling, and it proceeds by broodingly dissolving rather than by logically analysing the thought. But it must be guarded from degenerating into mere daydreaming on sacred themes, and it will be wise in order to secure ourselves from this fault to meditate chiefly with the Bible in our hands and always on its truths. As meditation, then, on the one side takes hold upon prayer, so on the other it shades off into devotional Bible reading, the highest exercise of which indeed it is. Life close to God's word is life close to God. When I urge you to make very much while you are in the seminary of this kind of devotional Bible study, running up into meditation, pure and simple, I am but repeating what the General Assembly specifically requires of you. It is expected, says the plan of the seminary, framed by the Assembly as our organic law, that every student will spend a portion of time every morning and evening in devout meditation and self-recollection and examination, in reading the Holy Scriptures, solely with a view to a personal and practical application of the passage read to his own heart, character and circumstances, and in humble, fervent prayer and praise to God in secret. And do we not find in the practice here recommended the remedy for that lamentable lack of familiarity with the English Bible, as it is fashionable now to speak of it, which is distressing us all in candidates for the ministry? Brethren, you deceive yourselves if you fancy anyone can teach you the English Bible in the sense in which knowledge of it is deserated. As well expect someone to digest your food for you. You must taste its preciousness for yourselves before you can apply its preciousness to others' needs. You must assimilate the Bible and make it your own in that intimate sense which will fix its words fast in your hearts if you would have those words rise spontaneously to your lips in your times of need or in the times of the need of others. Read, study, meditate on your Bible. Take time to it, much time, spend effort, strength, yourselves on it, until the Bible is in you. Then the Bible will well up in you and come out from you in every season of need. It is idle to seek aids for such reading and meditation. The devout and prayerful spirit is the only key to it. Nevertheless, there are helps which may be temporarily used as crutches if the legs halt too much to go. 
Dean Olford has a couple of little books on how to study the scriptures, and Dean Goulburn has a little volume on the practical study of the Bible, which may be profitably consulted for general direction. Our fathers used to read their Bibles with Thomas Scott's Family Bible with Notes, or Matthew Henry's Expositions of the Old and New Testaments, or William Burkett's Expository Notes on the New Testament, which turns every passage into a prayer on their knee, and a worse practice can be conceived. The pungent quaintness of Henry especially remains until today without a rival, and no one can read his comments with his heart set on learning of God without deriving from them perennial profit. Direction for your thoughts in meditating on divine truth may be sought also in the numerous books now in such general use for morning and evening religious reading. Bogatsky's Golden Treasury is the book of this sort our grandfathers used. William Jay's Morning and Evening Exercises is still one of the most useful of them. By its side may be fairly placed at least Mr. Spurgeon's checkbook on the Bank of Faith, and the little books of Francis Ridley Havigal have won for themselves a good report. In the use of such aids it is wise to be constantly on guard, lest, on the one side, we permit the aid to supplant the direct use of the Word of God as the basis of our meditation, and on the other we grow so accustomed to the crutch that we never learn to walk alone. Let neither Matthew Henry nor Charles Spurgeon supplant either the Word of God or the Spirit of God as the teacher of your soul. In speaking of such aids to the devotional study of Scripture and prayerful meditation, we are already making the transition to a further class of helps to which I must advert before closing. Every student, says the plan of the seminary, at the close of his course, must, I beg you observe that must, have read a considerable number of the best practical writers on the subject of religion. Even without such admonition, we certainly could not have failed to recognize this source of quickening for the religious life. The question that is pressing is, which are the best practical writers on the subject of religion? In the multitude clamoring for our attention, some good, many bad, and not a few indifferent, the need of guidance in the choice of our practical reading becomes very acute. Four great movements have been especially prolific in books of edification, each, of course, after its own fashion and with peculiarities of its own. These are the great mystical movement, which runs through all ages of the Church, the Puritan movement of the 17th century, the Evangelical movement in the latter part of the 18th and early 19th centuries, and more lately, and to a less extent, the Anglican revival of the 19th century. The characteristic mark of the works which have emanated from the mystical writers is a certain aloofness combined with a clear and piercing note of adoration. The Puritan literature is marked by intense devotion to duty and strong insistence on personal holiness. Its message is apt to be couched in a somewhat unadorned literary style, but when the graces of style happen to be added to its clear good sense and profound piety, nothing could be more charming. I can never forget my discovery of John Arrowsmith, for example, when, reading a mass of Puritan literature for another purpose, I suddenly passed from the plain goodness of Anthony Burgess to his delightful pages. The evangelical fervour of the writers of the Great Awakening and the churchly flavour of the Anglican writers are naturally their most marked characteristics. Our task is to select from this varied literature just the books which will most feed our souls. Thinking that in the multitude of counsellors there was likely to be strength, I made bold a few years ago to write to a number of religious teachers, each of them justly famous as a writer of books of devotional character, and asked their aid in making out a short list of the best practical writers on the subject of religion, for the use of the students of the seminary. I will give you one or two of the answers I received, and these may serve as preliminary guides to your practical reading. Dr. James Stalker, now a professor in the United Free Church College, Aberdeen, thought the following, on the whole, the five most helpful books on practical religion. Thomas Akempis's Imitation of Christ, Richard Baxter's Reformed Pastor, Jeremy Taylor's Life of Christ, John Owen's Holy Spirit, Adolf Monod's St. Paul. The late Reverend Dr. William M. Taylor of New York gave the preference to the following five. Dean Goulburn's Thoughts on Personal Religion, Phelps's Still Hour, Tholuck's Hours of Christian Devotion, Alexander's Thoughts on Religious Experience, Faber's Hymns. Our own Dr. William M. Paxton recommends especially Hodge's Way of Life, Bishop Ryle's Holiness, Doddridge's Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul, Owen's Spiritual Mindedness, and Faber's Thoughts on Great Mysteries. These are all good books and would richly repay your loving study. A hundred others could be added just as good. 
It would be useless, however, to draw out a long list of books to be especially recommended. I shall venture to set down the titles of just a round dozen, which I look upon as indispensable. Each must be read for what it can give us, and in none of them shall we seek inspiration and instruction in vain. They come from every part of the church and from every age. They include representatives of every type of Christian thought, from the Mariolatrous Romanism of Thomas Akempis, or the bald Pelagianism of Sir Thomas Brown, to the penetrating mysticism of the Theologia Germanica and the plain evangelicalism of John Newton. But they are all veritable devotional classics, and each of them has power in it to move and instruct the heart of whoever would live in the spirit. Get at least these dozen booklets, keep them at your elbow, and sink yourselves in them with constant assiduity. They are Augustine's Confessions, The Imitation of Christ, The Theologia Germanica, Bishop Andrew's Private Devotions, Jeremy Taylor's Life of Christ, Richard Baxter's The Saint's Everlasting Rest, Samuel Rutherford's Letters, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, Sir Thomas Brown's Religio Medici, William Law's Serious Call, John Newton's Cardiphonia, Bishop Thomas Wilson's Sacra Privata. To these twelve, I should add two or three others that have peculiar interest to us as Princetonians, and which I am sure are worthy of association with them. Jonathan Edwards's Treatise Concerning Religious Affections, Archibald Alexander's Thoughts on Religious Experience, and Charles Hodges' Way of Life. I have purposely omitted from this list collections of hymns and, in general, of prayers, in order that I might recommend the use of both to you in a separate category. I strongly advise you to make yourselves familiar with the best religious verse and occasionally to support your devotions with the best prayers to which saintly men have given permanent form. Faber's hymns have a quality of intense adoration in them, which recommends them to many as the best for such a purpose. Miss Rossetti's devotional poems are quite unsurpassed for elevation of feeling. Many prefer the quieter note of Keeble's Christian Year. Others still love best the evangelical sobriety of the Olney hymns, or the exotic flavour of Miss Winkworth's Lyra Sacra Germanica. Others find more attractive the variety afforded by such a book as Dr. Schaff's Christ in Song. On the whole, I fancy most of you will find that Palgrave's Treasury of Sacred Song will meet your needs as well as any other single volume. It is a veritable treasure house of the best of English religious poetry. As to collections of prayers, nothing is more inspiring than Lancelot Andrews' Private Devotions, which I have already named in the general list of recommended devotional books, unless it be Anselm's Meditations and Prayers, which, despite the deforming hagiolatry which sometimes invades them, remain an example for all ages of how a great heart lifts itself up greatly to God. There is yet another branch of religious reading which I think you will scarcely be able to neglect if you would build yourself up into a full stature of manhood in Christ by the example of his saints. I refer to religious biography. Only let us remember that in selecting religious biographies to read with a view to our spiritual improvement, we must bear in mind that the adjective must be understood as qualifying the life as well as the life. It must be the biographies themselves that are religious. It must be confessed that many of the greatest saints have been unfortunate in their biographers. Not only are their lives often written without a particle of literary skill, but equally often much of the religious impression of their holy walk has evaporated in the telling. Nevertheless, from at least the time when the great Athanasius himself edified the church with a life of Anthony, written, we fear, not without some imitation in form and content alike of the popular romances of the time, the church has never lacked a series of religious biographies which have in them the promise and potency of religious life for their readers. Dr. Stalker thinks the best of these for your use are Augustine's Confessions, Baxter's Relics, Hannah's Life of Chalmers, Blakey's Life of Livingston, Whit's Life of Tholuck, and Brown's Life of Rabbi Duncan. The late Dr. William M. Taylor recommended Bonar's Memoirs of McChain, Hannah's Life of Chalmers, Arnott's Memoir of James Hamilton, Guthrie's Memoirs, Blakey's Life of Livingston, J.G. Patton's Autobiography, and Dr. Prentice's Life and Letters of Mrs. Prentice. You will not fail to observe how Scotch Dr. Taylor's list is. Tastes will differ. The late Dean Goulburn wrote me simply that there were no religious biographies equal to Isaac Walton's. I shall not undertake to add a list of my own, which doubtless would have its peculiarities also. I shall content myself with a bare hint that you must not miss reading the great books, such, for example, is Bunyan's Grace Abounding, the 17th century replica of Augustine's Confessions. 
Such also is John Newton's authentic narrative. Such also is Boston's memoirs, which can now be had in a worthy form. Such also is probably Doddridge's account of James Gardner's remarkable life, and such certainly is Edwards's life of David Brainerd. And if I am to judge by my own experience of its religious impression, such also is the life of Adolf Monod by one of his daughters. Along with religious biography, may I venture to mention also religious fiction, the portrayal of the religious life under the cover of imagined actors. Take the chronicles of the schoenberg Cotter family, take the heir of Redcliffe, who, in the face of the experience of a generation, can doubt the quickening influence of such books, a book that has played a part such as that played by the heir of Redcliffe in the lives of men like Dr. A. Kuyper and Mr. William Morris, is surely worthy of our serious attention as a religious force in the world. And speaking of these books, brings to my lips the exclamation, What women the Church of Victorian England gave the world, Elizabeth Rundell Charles, Charlotte Mary Young, Frances Ridley Havergal, Dora Greenwell, Dora Patterson. The lives of all of these are accessible to you, as well as their writings, though some of them, I am sorry to say, are rather dully written. Put them by the side of the life of Mrs. Prentice, recommended to us by Dr. Taylor, and learn from them what women Christianity is still making all around us. Of sermons I shall say nothing, they form a department of religious literature by themselves, but I have reserved for the last mention a class of religious literature which for my own part I esteem the very highest of all for spiritual impressions. I refer to the great creeds of the church. He who wishes to grow strong in his religious life, let him, I say, next to the Bible, feed himself on the great creeds of the church. There is a force of religious inspiration in them which you will seek in vain elsewhere and this for good reasons. First, because it is ever true that it is by truth that sanctification is wrought. And next, because the truth is set forth in these creeds with a clearness and richness with which it is set forth nowhere else. For these creeds are not the products of metaphysical speculation, as many who know infinitesimally little about them are prone to assert, but are the compressed and weighted utterances of the Christian heart. I am not alone, of course, in so esteeming them, you will remember with what insistence Cardinal Newman warns us against an untheological devotion, and with what force he expounds in his grammar of assent the spiritual import of the creeds and catechisms of the Church. For himself, he tells us, the Athanasian Creed has always seemed the most devotional formulary that Christianity has ever given birth to, and certainly readers of Dr. Gore's beautiful exposition of it as the battle hymn of Christians will not be slow to feel the truth of Dr. Newman's estimate. Dr. Alexander White, in commenting on Andrews's private devotions, takes up the theme afresh and remarks on the exemplification it receives in Andrews's treatment of the Apostles and Nicene creeds. When Andrews takes up any of these things, he observes, into his intellect, imagination and heart, he has already provided himself and his readers with another great prayer and another great psalm. So true is it that all true theology is directly and richly and evangelically devotional. I do not think I go astray, therefore, when I say to you in all seriousness that the second and third volumes of Dr. Schaff's Creeds of Christendom have in them more food for your spiritual life, are more directly, richly, and evangelically devotional than any other book apart from the Bible in existence. Nor can I think myself wrong in directing you specifically to the Reformed Creeds as, above all others, charged with blessing to those who will read and meditate on their rich deposit of religious truth. Our Scotch forefathers turned for spiritual nourishment especially to the sum of saving knowledge and the practical use thereof, which had come to be a stated portion of the current editions of the Confession of Faith, just because that volume circulated at first chiefly as a devotional book and a directory for practical religion. This treatise has never been a part of our church book, but in the Westminster Confession we have something even better. Read what Dr. Thornwell tells us of what the study of the confession did for his soul, and then ask yourselves whether it may not do the same for you too. By the side of the Westminster Confession put the Heidelberg Catechism. Where will you find more faithful, more probing Christian teaching than this? I beg you, brethren, feed your souls on the Christian truth set forth with so much combined clearness of apprehension and depth of feeling in these great formularies. And so we come around, at the end, to the point from which we took our start. Religious knowledge and religious living go hand in hand. It might be instructive to inquire, writes good Dr. Andrew H. Bernard, why it is that whenever godliness is healthy and progressive, we almost invariably find learning in the church attendant on it. 
while, on the other hand, an illiterate state is attended sooner or later by decay of vital godliness. We deceive ourselves if we think we can give a portion of our being only to God. If we withhold the effort requisite to learn to know the truth, we cannot hope to succeed in any effort to do his will. Unknown truth cannot sanctify the soul, and it is by the truth that we are to be sanctified. Mind, heart, and hand, true religious cultivation must embrace them all and carry on their training altogether. We must indeed rebuke the lordly understanding if it essays to supersede the necessity of holy living. Our heart thrills responsively when the monk of Deventer, at the opening of his pungent book, asks us pointedly, How will it advantage you to know all things if you have no love? What is the profit, he demands, of high argument on the Trinity if you lack humility and are offensive to the Trinity? Great words assuredly make no man holy and righteous, but by virtuous living he becomes dear to God. Far better feel compunction than have skill in defining it. Though you know the whole Bible and all the sayings of the philosophers, what would it all advantage you without God's love and grace? It is natural to man to desire knowledge, but knowledge without the fear of God, of what avail is it? Yes, yes, our hearts reply, it is all true, greatly true. But beneath our assent does there not lurk an underlying sense as we read on deeper into the exhortation that there is something of the narrowness of mysticism in the sharp either-or that is thrust upon us? If we must choose between knowledge and life, why, of course, give us life? But why put the alternative so sharply? Must it be knowledge or life? Must it not rather be knowledge and life? Non comprehendetur Deus per investigationem sed per imitationum says Hugh of St. Chur. Ah, uh, but investigation is the first step in imitation, for how shall I strive to be like God except by first discovering what God is like? An imitation itself, is it, after all, the key word of Christianity? It is, no doubt, a great word, but it is not the greatest. Trust is greater, and by the side of trust there stand but two others. But now abideth, says Paul, faith, hope, and love, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Happily, we have not been left to ourselves to make the correction. The church has had greater teachers than even Thomas a Kempis, and a greater than he begins a greater book than his with greater words than he could give us. Great art thou, O God, and highly to be praised, great is thy power, and thy understanding is infinite. Yet thee would man praise, though but a little particle of thy creation, even man who bears about with him his mortality, bears about with him the proof of his sin, even the proof that thou resistest the proud. Yea, thee still would man praise, this little particle of thy creation. Tis thou that dost excite us to delight in thy praise, for thou didst make us for thyself, and our heart is restless till it find its rest in thee. Grant me, Lord, to know whether I should first call upon thee or praise thee, whether I should first know thee or call upon thee. Alas, alas, tell me for thy mercy's sake, O Lord, my God, what thou art unto me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation, so speak that I may hear. Behold, the ears of my heart are before thee, O Lord. Open thou them, and say to my soul, I am thy salvation." Make me to run after thy voice and lay hold on thee. Hide not thy face from me. Let me die that I die not. Only let me see thy face. Narrow is my soul's house. Enlarge it that thou mayest enter in. It is fallen into ruins. Repair thou it. There is that within it which must offend thine eyes. I confess I know it. But who shall cleanse it? Or to whom but to thee shall I cry? Here, I venture to say, is the essence of all true religion. Humility of spirit is here rather than depreciation of intellect, trust in the mercy of God to sinners rather than dependence on deeds of man. There is no such note struck here as this, even though I knew everything in all the world and were not in charity, what would it advantage me in the sight of God, who will judge me ex facto? Ex facto indeed. Who that is judged by his works shall stand? It is not an antithesis of knowledge and works that Augustine draws. It is an antithesis of man and God, and its note is, In thee only do I put my trust, O Lord, for in thee only is there salvation. Dic habeo, says he tersely, sed abeo. It is an execrable wordplay but excellent theology, and the very quintessence of religion. And when we have learnt this well, learnt it so that it sounds in all the chambers of our hearts and echoes down through all the aisles of our lives, 
we shall have learnt the great lesson of practical religion. End of Spiritual Culture in the Theological Seminary, Part 2, by B.B. B. Warfield.